in the woods with Boy Scout troop, backpacking along a trail near base of Mount Bachelor. Gonna camp near a lake and do Boy Scout stuff. Fuck yeah. Me and my best friend Jay are super hyped and excited to put up our tent. My dad bought it for us. It's a special one that's made for two people. Has a cool skylight so we can see the stars. Scoutmaster keeps having to tell us to shut up and pay attention. Get to camp. Scoutmaster tells everyone to set up around the site. It's one of those ones that's definitely a campsite, but it doesn't have buildings or showers. Forest is behind us. Camp is sort of just inside the tree line. In front is a stretch of meadow and then a big pond. To the sides are more forest. In the middle of camp, there are big logs set up in a circle and a fire pit in the center. Jay and I decide we don't want to camp near the other friends, so we pick a spot way out on the edge of camp, away from the trees and closer to the pond. Scoutmasters don't want to let us, but they're too busy with the others that they just decide, fuck it, and they let us set up. It's me, Jay, and about 10 other friends, by the way. Three Scoutmasters. They're all pretty cool. One is an older guy. The other two are probably in their 30s. Anyway, we all get set up and the other Scoutmasters tell us we're going to go swim in the lake. Oh, hell yes, Dodge Jay Jay and I engage hyperspeed and fly into our suits and we're in the water before the scoutmasters even have a chance to say anything about it. Splashing and fucking round. Water is nice and warm because it's summer and the pond is small. Everyone else gets in. We start a game of Marco Polo. Guy who's it is about 10 feet from me. Get that weird hyperactive mania paranoia and the closer he gets, the more I'm flailing around and splashing to get away. Dude is about to touch me so I sink to try and touch the bottom to kick off. Something stabs into the bottom of my foot. Jesus, it hurts. Fly up out of the water, screaming. Everyone knows something is up, so they help me get out of the water fast. Old Scoutmaster looks at my foot. Looks like a stick or something punctured it, really cleanly. Not that deep, but it's bleeding pretty bad. Scoutmasters take me back to camp and try to figure out what to do. It's too late in the day to pack out. It was basically sunset. Try to decide if they need to send me and the old Scoutmaster down alone. Luckily, the bleeding is slowing down, and we can see that it's not as bad as we thought. They ask me if I want to leave. Fuck no, Dodge Bag. Already, it's not hurting as much, and I just want to get back in the water. Scoutmaster banges it up after cleaning it, but says I can't get back in the water because amoebas have to sit and watch everyone else fuck around. Eventually, they all get out, and we split into groups of two and get stuff to make a fire. Sun is almost down. Scoutmasters make dinner for us. When it's dark, one of the scoutmasters gets out stuff for s'mores. Jay and I are fucking stoked. We offer to pass the stuff out to make it all go faster. Give everyone enough to make three s'mores each. Get the last guy. There's not enough. Ask scoutmasters for more. They say there isn't any. We tell them there's not enough and show them that we all got three except the last guy. Scoutmasters are super pissed. Start asking which of us is stealing more. None of us are. They decide they must have just miscalculated, and they each give one of theirs to the last kid. Everything's cool now. Scoutmasters just kind of laugh it off. Tell each other ghost stories until everyone is scared shitless. Right then, counselors douse the fire and tell us it's time for bed. Oh my god, fuck you, Dot X. Get into our tents. Jay and I don't want to admit it, but... We're both really regretting setting up so far from everyone else. Way too late to move camp. We decide to leave his lantern on outside, facing toward the trees. Both of us lay awake and look up through the skylight. Hey, Jay whispers. What? I have a ghost story. A ghost story? Yeah, I didn't tell it because it's too scary. Immediately call bullshit. He starts telling me the story. When he was little... His granddad told him about how something lived out in the high desert and mountains. He called it the Wendigo, but as far as I know, he wasn't Indian or anything. He told Jay that it was a monster made of flesh that could look like anything it wanted, and that nothing could make it stop being hungry. Nothing could make it full or happy. He said it was all that was left of someone from a long time ago who did something very bad. Told Jay that if he ever felt the thing near him, or if stuff didn't seem right, that he needed to listen to his instinct and get out of there. Jay asked how he knew about it, and his granddad told him he'd met it. Once. He had gotten lost and was starving to death because the berries were all inedible, and he couldn't catch anything else. He said he collapsed and watched as something impossible 
came out from behind a large boulder. It was like something was wearing his image. It looked like him, but it wasn't him, and he felt that acutely. He watched it walk up to him slowly and kneel down in front of his face. Granddad was scared shitless and didn't know if he was dying or dead or if this was hell. The thing that looks like him sounds exactly like him, and it says that if he doesn't make a deal with somebody soon, he's gonna die. Grandad starts praying loudly, but the thing just waves it off. The thing tells him that he's starving, and it goes into detail about what that means. How his fat is melting away, how his muscles are being sucked dry and are turning to mush. How even now the calcium from his bones is being stripped like a coal mine for anything valuable. It tells Grandad that it will only get worse, and that if he doesn't do something quick, the pain is going to continue until he dies. Tells Grandad that he absolutely needs to eat something. Keep saying that. You need to eat. You need to eat. Grandad screams that there is nothing, and the thing that looks like him just laughs. Of course there is, it says, and it points at his legs. Grandad is absolutely flipping shit now. Tries to pull out his rifle and shoot the thing. He's too weak, and the thing seems really upset. It's frowning, and it looks like the skin it's wearing is loosening. Granddad says it looked like a loose dress. Suddenly, the skin sloughs off in this awful paper-tearing noise and falls to the ground where it turns into dirt. What's left is this shapeless, dry thing made of ancient flesh and bloody dirt. Embedded in its gut is a disgusting ancient deer skull. It's held in there by bloody, wet dirt. Blood is fresh. Arms are gangly and end in three long fingers. Head is almost cylindrical, like a can. It is clearly not a human head. It has two very small black eyes in the center of the quote-unquote face. It looks down at him. From somewhere in the thing, a horrible high-pitched noise rings out. Granddad said it sounded like an insect. Thing crumbles into a cloud of dirt and bone fragments, and it's gone. Running on pure adrenaline, Grandpa picks himself up and sprints at least a mile or two, until, by sheer luck, he stumbles upon a hunting camp. Survives, but refuses to go into the woods again. Says the thing is still looking for him, and that it'll come for Jay too. So, he needs to be careful. Jay finishes with that, and we're both quiet for a minute. Don't want to admit it, but I'm freaked the fuck out. Tell him that it's the most bullshit story I've ever heard, but he knows I'm lying and asks me if I think it's weird about the s'mores. I tell him to knock it off and just let me sleep. In reality, I'm shitting in my sleeping bag and I'm too afraid to talk or move anymore. Jay somehow falls asleep after a while. I can hear him snoring. Eventually get myself to calm down enough to pass out. Have really weird dreams. Keep waking up, but not sure if I'm actually awake. Seems like the night has been going on forever. Jay is snoring and that keeps messing with my dreams. At one point, have a dream that there's something out in the pond and it's making this really weird heavy breathing noise, like it's having to rip each breath inside of it. My eyes fly open and I can still hear the sound. Looking up at the skylight, it's so dark I can't even see the sky. I can move, but I'm absolutely petrified, frozen in place, eyes wide open. Jay is snoring, but there's something underneath it. It's that same fucking breathing, and that's when I realize it. The lantern is off. I should be able to see the stars. The fabric of the tent rustles. Something is looking down into the tent. I can barely make it out, but it's huge. It covers the entire skylight with just its head. I move slightly, and something catches just enough light from the moon to spark in its tiny, beady black eyes. It's looking at me, but it doesn't have a face. It feels like my heart is frozen in place. I have no idea if I'm awake or dreaming. I'm shaking and slowly inching my hand toward the edge of my sleeping bag. The thing and I are locked in this stare down for at least 15 seconds. Finally get my hand around the bag and yank it over my head. Curl into a ball at the foot of the bag. Realize I've pissed myself. I don't even care. I can hear the thing rustling around outside the tent. It's making this kind of rubbing noise. 
can only describe it as insect legs rubbing together. It brushes the tent near where I'm curled. I try to scream, but it won't come out. Thing fiddles with the zipper for a second. My heart can't take much more. I feel like I'm going to pass out. The thing moves on. It's quiet. I pass out from sheer exhaustion. Wake up the next morning, groggy and stiff. Remember last night, and it all feels like a dream. Still really freaked out, but I'm not going to tell Jay about it. It was probably just a really bad dream. Scout masters make us breakfast. Jay's in a good mood and cheers me up pretty quick. Forget about everything and have an awesome day in the woods earning badges. Jay is in a really good mood. Makes me laugh like a motherfucker. We keep sneaking off to fuck around by ourselves. Scoutmasters just kind of let us do our thing as long as we stay close. Night comes around and we do another campfire. This time we just roast marshmallows since we're out of s'more stuff. Telling stories and Jay says he'll be right back. He has to pee. Scoutmasters tell him to not go farther than the tree line. He walks a ways past camp toward the pond, and I lose sight of him in the dark. He comes back a minute or two later and sits down. Scoutmaster is telling a really good ghost story, so I don't really pay attention to what he's doing. Hear him crunching on something and look over. He's eating a s'more. What? That jaybag. You jerk. You're the one that stole? I said. He doesn't say anything. He just keeps eating. What the hell? I ask him again. He still doesn't say anything. One of the young scoutmasters notices and gives Jay a really angry look. Gets up and comes over. You need to give me that right now, he says to Jay. Jay doesn't even look at him. He just makes this kind of crying noise. What the hell is going on? Jay is acting completely weird, and I'm getting a bad feeling in my stomach. The scoutmaster tells him to get up, and he takes his shoulder. Here's something crunch. Sounds like a dead leaf. Scoutmaster yanks his hand back. There's a, a fucking dent in Jay's shoulder. Jay stops eating his s'more and looks at me. It looks like something wearing Jay's skin, and it doesn't fit quite right. His eyes are saggy, and the mouth is too low. Suddenly, impossibly, Jay's voice comes from behind the group, which is now quietly watching the Scoutmaster and Jay. Sorry, I was coming right back, but something knocked me into the pond. I don't know what it was, but it... Jay jogs back into the circle and sees something is really wrong. Looks at the thing, wearing his skin. He goes completely white. The thing looks back at him, and the skin kind of bunches up in the center of the face. Fake Jay walks back toward the pond slowly, keeping its eyes on real Jay. No matter how far away it gets, its head turns to keep Jay in view. The skin on its face is doing something, but it's too dark to see what exactly. It gets to the water with its head basically turned totally backwards. Old Scoutmaster turns his huge flashlight on it without saying anything. All of us are dead quiet and shitting ourselves. No one moves. Fake Jay's face pulls tight, so tight that the eyelids turn inside out. Skin rips and crumbles into dirt. The thing wiggles free like a caterpillar from a cocoon. It's ancient and withered and bony in all the wrong places. Looking at it hurts my brain. Nothing about it makes sense. The lumpy, tube-like head tilts sideways and then rotates back to the front as it turns to face us again. There's a, a fucking deer skull embedded in its stomach. Even from here, I can smell the thing. It's both dry and dusty, and also festering and damp and sour, like the mud from the bottom of a deep river. The thing lets out an ear-splitting screech. Everyone shuts their eyes and claps their hands over their ears, manage to open one eye enough to see it slip back into the water. The sound cuts off as it goes under. All of us sit there, stunned. No one says anything. Then, basically as one, we all get up and sprint to our tents. Scoutmasters holler at us to stay inside until morning, and not to come out for any reason. Jay and I cram ourselves into one bag. He's shaking badly, and he keeps saying, that, that was it. That was it. It came back. He said it would. It came back. Tell him to shut up and be quiet. All night, we can hear something swimming quietly in the water. The next morning, we all throw our shit together, and we get the fuck out. Jay and I stop talking to each other. 
didn't really mean to. He just withdrew to the point that I couldn't reach out to him. I haven't spoken to him or anyone else from that trip since. And that, Anans, is the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. There was something really fucking wrong with the house that I grew up in. Live in the deep south in a house that used to be on a plantation. It is 100% haunted. Know for a fact that less than 200 feet from the back porch are a couple of unmarked graves. 99% of the shit is normal ghost stuff. Doors closing, weird smells and sounds, animals going ape shit, but no apparitions or anything though. I fucking loved it. I wasn't afraid of any of it. Sometimes I brought friends over just to scare the shit out of them. That all changed when I was in high school. Totally normal day. Less activity than normal, if anything. Go to bed. Everything's fine. Middle of the night. Wake up because something is tapping loudly on the wall under my bed. Tell whatever it is to shut up and let me sleep. Tapping doesn't stop. Wonder if maybe an animal got in. Look under bed. Nothing. Turn on bedside light. Look toward the middle of the room. There's a fucking guy floating upside down, about a foot off the ground. There's a rope around his neck that goes to the floor. Neck is grotesquely stretched out, and the skin is torn. Eyes are closed. Tongue is all swollen and black. I go cold and freeze. I can't look away. I can't move. Not gonna lie, I pissed myself. It just floats there for a minute, and then it starts coming toward me, fast. I try to scream, but I can't. Thing is so close that I can see the exploded veins in his face. Finally managed to scream. It's gone so fast, I don't even register it for a second. Parents come running in. Tell them what happened. Uh, it's just a bad dream, dot X. After that, I was freaked out constantly, and it got to the point that I couldn't even go there anymore. I moved in with a friend down the street until I graduated, and I left for college. 15. Paranoid. Always try to keep my windows and curtains closed. Tape the fabric so I know nothing can see in. My whole life, I felt like I'm being watched, and it gets worse at night. Mom and dad just think I'm a big baby. They refuse to humor me. One night, my dad gets drunk and decides I'm just being a huge pussy, tears open my curtains, and tells me to be a man and face my fears. Says if he comes in tomorrow and the curtains are closed, he'll beat my ass. Slams my door, tells mom to go to bed. She tells me that she loves me through the door and to not be afraid. For hours, I lie on my back too afraid to move. Can't speak, can't call for help. I can't even blink. Eyes are burning. I can feel it staring at me. At some point, I wet the bed. As the sun starts to come up, I manage to get the courage to look at it. Turn my head just enough to see it. It's right at the window. Neck is so long, I can't see its shoulders. Only the neck and head. Its skin is bloated and pale, like something that's been dead too long. It has no face. Head is smooth and round with no features at all. The head sways a little on the neck. It presses the front of its head against the glass and sways. The sound of its slippery skin against the cold glass was the sound of death. Dad beats me for wetting the bed, tears curtains down, and every night, the thing comes. Learn to sleep with my back to it. One day, it disappears. Every time I hear that noise in my dreams, I wake up and look at the window. I wait for the day that I wake up and I hear that sound again. Be in the Georgian military. Watch duty with a buddy in the middle of a semi-wooded area, near the Russian border, an Abkhazian state that is also a mountain. I have the high ground. Have shitty AK-74. Middle of the night, just chatting with the buddy. Hear a sound coming, like buzzing and gargling. Look down from the hill. Nothing there, or whatever that thing was, is hiding behind a tree. Ask the buddy what it might be. He thinks it is an animal, but we don't care. We have guns. See something moving. It is a bush. Bush is moving towards us. Not a ghillie suit. A big bush, like four meters. We warn it. 
We shoot a warning shot in the ground and air. We are screaming at this point. We start to shoot the bush. Nothing happens. When it got closer, I saw these sticks under it, like it was using its branches to walk towards us. I had 57 bullets on me after the first mag was gone. I ran back. So did my buddy. We are running to the base on a hilly area. Reach base. Tell Sergeant what happened. After giving us a disappointed look, goes outside with both of us. The bush is still moving. Towards the fucking base. I saw it. My buddy saw it. Fucking Sergeant saw it. He thinks it's a ghillie suit. Shoots it with better aim. Nothing. It still comes towards us slowly. Goes closer to the bush. He sees it. Confirms it is a moving bush. Tells us to go back to the base and get the others. Two more people come out. Five people now, watching a fucking bush move. One guy says it's a new thing made by the Russians to fuck with us. Go back to base, unlock every building up. Two guys are on guard. Sergeant is making a call and not getting believed. The bush fucking stops outside the base. Go to inspect it. It has stopped moving. It is a normal bush now. It is now six. The sun is rising. Sergeant goes to look at the bush. Sees, it is a normal bush. Fucking cuts the bush with a hatchet. Pours motor oil to its stomp. Burns the bush. Get home. Make this post. I am scared of bushes now. It was a berry bush, if it makes a difference. I have a cabin in buttfuck nowhere, Colorado, that I decided to go up to for a couple of weeks. No internet, a single landline phone, and state of the art for the 1980s. On Wednesday, April 10th, Colorado had a blizzard. It wasn't too bad in cities, but where I was, it was horrible. And that's all the background you need to know. Be sitting in my cabin stoking the fire during buttfuck blizzard, hanging out and watching some DVDs on a CRT older than father time himself, since I can't go outside. Constant howling of the wind, turn up volume. Eventually get up to piss, so I pause movie. Wind is no longer howling. Didn't notice since TV was blasting. Find it strange since it's been doing it for four hours now. Thank fuck it's over. Take a few steps until I hear it. Click. Look around. Literally have never heard this clicking noise. And I've been up there for five months now. Click. Realize it's coming from outside. A branch probably snapped and hit my cabin. And is rocking back and forth or some shit. Fuck me. I'm not going outside. I can deal with the noise. Standing in bathroom. Begin to piss. Click. Annoyed. Finish up. Walk outside bathroom. Click. Realize there's no consistency to the clicking sound. I can't even expect it. It happens whenever. Sit back down and continue to watch movie. Turn volume down since the wind isn't howling. Clicking speeds up. Multiple times a minute. Fuck it. I'll go take a nap or something on the other side of the cabin so I can't hear it. Walk into bedroom. Clicking begins. My bedroom is like 50 feet from where the TV is, but the click is just as loud. Like, it's fucking following me. Try to ignore it and go to sleep. The inconsistency of the clicking breaks me. Throw on snow gear. Time to fuck up this branch for making me go outside. Walk to door and brace myself. Open it swiftly and feel old man winter fuck me up the ass. Quickly walk out and shut the door. Walk around cabin in blinding snow, looking for a branch like an idiot. Make multiple laps and I can't find the asshole. Assume it finally got loose and flew away. Go back inside. No clicking. Feels good, man, that jaybag. Go to take that nap in peace. Fall into a deep slumber. Wake up at about 2 p.m. Click, 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 click. Start to feel uneasy. Don't give it a second thought, and I throw on snow gear. Go outside. No branches. No howling. No nothing. Go back inside, and go from mad to upset because I can't figure out what the fuck the sound is. Click, 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 click. Walk to different rooms to try and escape it. Click, 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 click. How the fuck is it following me throughout the cabin? Moment of realization. It's not coming from the sides of the cabin. It's coming from the roof. All rational thought has gone out the window from the sound of this fucking clicking. Snow gear and walk outside. Storm has calmed for now, but it's still foggy. Can only see like 20 feet ahead of you. Walk around back and grab my ladder. Prop that shit up. This ends now. Begin to climb up ladder and stop. I could only hear the clicking inside, even over the howl of the wind. Defcon 2X warned me about this. Climb up high enough to be able to see the top of the roof. At the top, I see a pale figure. Heart stops. Defcon 1. The figure is hunched over. It's sickly thin, and I can see its spine. 
It's angled where it can't see me, but I can see it. See it moving slightly, look slightly down, and see it has, on hand, a fingernail that's probably six inches long. Literally, just tapping the roof, it stops. It slowly turns its head to me, black eyes, and small slit for mouth. No facial features beside that, almost like a crude drawing of a fucking alien, begins to stand up. By the way, it's true. Your life does flash before your eyes when you think you're about to die. It stands up staring at me, probably five feet tall, give or take. Walks the edge of roof, of cabin, never taking its eyes off of me. Hops down on the ground. I can see it land, and it slowly backs away into the fog, towards the trees. Never stops locking eyes with me. Petrified. Probably didn't move for five minutes, or at least felt like it, in the blistering cold, gripping a ladder. Snap out of it. Climb down ladder carefully. Don't even bother to take it down. Realize I'm in shock. Calmly walk around cabin and go inside. Walk around house and turn off lights and put out fire. Grab keys and walk out. Don't bother grabbing anything else besides my wallet next to my keys. Storm has picked back up, but I literally am in some kind of trance. I don't even notice. Close door and don't bother locking it. Slowly walk to car. Open the door. Get in. Start it and swing around. Still in shock, I drive for hours until I reach a motel. Shock is wearing off, and I can feel myself ready to go fucking crazy. Quickly get a room, and now I start feeling adrenaline, and rush up to my room. Open it, and close it, and start freaking the fuck out over what I saw. For a few hours, I was freaking out in the hotel room. I calmed down and slept for about 16 hours. I drove back up to the cabin, fucking bolted inside, and grabbed my phone. I ran out and locked the door and got in the truck and sped off. After reading all of the stories on X, I was more surprised than anything that I didn't immediately flip out, but just went in the shock for hours. I got home a few hours ago after driving for a while and stopping multiple times to breathe and not flip out again. I think one thing people forget to mention is that fear comes in waves. I'd be driving and be totally okay, then suddenly it would hit me and I'd have to pull over and just sit in my car while I calmed the fuck down and didn't drive like a paranoid schizo or something. Came home and made myself a drink and typed all of this out. Don't know what I'm going to do with the cabin. Don't care right now. Night assholes. Thanks for listening. Oh, and no. I didn't smell blood or copper. Grab some guns and friends and go cryptid hunting. I guess I'll respond to this one since I went to brush my teeth and just came back to turn off my computer. Fuck that, man. These people who say they try and hunt these creatures after seeing them are LARPing. I have zero desire to try and fuck with that abomination. I'm not about to risk my life or people I love on some fucking meme hunt for a creature I believe is intelligent. This isn't hunting a deer. It's not like a deer will come attack you while you're walking through the forest. It's like hunting another hunter who knows the woods better than you can, and obviously can climb since he was on my cabin. Don't believe these fuckers on here who say they stayed and tried to kill it or whatever. No man would ever see something like that and think to stick around. Post your own creepy experiences. I'll post a few of my personal stories, starting with my most recent. Be me, about a year ago, living alone in a small apartment that used to be at the attic of an old house. In my bedroom slash living room, there was a window. Pick related, not the one I'm talking about. Was barely getting by and usually only ate once a day. Started having trouble sleeping. For some reason, my attention was always directed at the window whenever I lay in bed. There was no curtain, so it was just a view into the darkness of the night. I started having weird dreams and nightmares every night about nonsensical things. One night, I am suddenly awoken by the sound of tapping on my window. I nearly shit myself and turned to look for whatever it was. There was nothing there. The tapping was way too deliberate and loud to simply be rain or anything like that. This happens every night for about two weeks. At the end of the second week, I am sleep deprived and paranoid. I tried to record the window, but my phone would always run out of disk space before anything happened. Always happened between 1 and 3 a.m., give or take 30 minutes. The last night that it happened, I suddenly woke up to find myself sitting on my bed, but the bed was placed in the middle of the forest at night. Obviously, it was a dream, but... It felt real at the moment. The only source of light is a small oil lamp placed to the right of the bed. Feel a chill run down my spine as I notice something else. Something is sitting next to the oil lamp and staring directly at me. 
It was only a few feet tall, but it radiated a numbingly terrifying presence. The flame started flickering as if it was about to go out. The thing starts talking. Your flame is dying. What will you do when you are alone in the darkness with me? Getting goosebumps just thinking about it. About a second goes by, and then the flame dies out. I'm immediately woken by violent banging on my window. I turn to see a dark shape move swiftly away from the window. Moved back in with my parents after that. Hasn't happened since. Ozark friend here. Got trapped in a fucked up cave once. Story follows. Be me, Tanish. Mom, sister, and I used to go hiking a lot. There's a relatively accessible cave network a few miles south of us. Lots of different caves, from big open ones to what are essentially crawl spaces, or quote unquote wormholes, where you have to army crawl and exhale to make yourself smaller. As a brief aside, if you're the kind of insane fucker that goes through wormholes and squeezes, you should thank God every single time you step out of a cave. I'd never even go near that shit, let alone any cave after what we went through. Anyways, I can't remember the name of this specific cave. The entrance has a rock propped up against the wall nearby. I guess to keep black bears and snakes and shit out overnight. We have our Shih Tzu, Lucy, with us. Mom doesn't want to carry her ass, so tie her leash to a stand outside the cave. A couple spelunkers are leaving the cave as we go in and chat with my mom. This isn't really a beginner cave. You and your kids will have an easier time just hiking. Mom says, fuck that. We came to a cave network to go in caves. Suit yourself, bitch. JPEG. We get into the cave and turn our lights on. Wow, it's made of rock and it's wet. I spend the whole time looking for cave paintings and dinosaur bones because I am retarded. Sister is always fucking with me, trying to convince me that there's a bear in there who hasn't eaten. Shit like that. Shut the fuck up, dude. Bears are cool. Maybe 10 minutes go by and we're a few chambers in. The only way to go further in is a squeeze, like nine inches tall. Pretty wide. The sheet of rock above it has a crack separating it from the main cave. But there are some metal supports or some shit. It's hard to remember. Looks like it was designed to crush people. Fuck that. Sister starts freaking out, saying she heard something. Pretty sure I heard it too, but I just assumed it was her trying to fuck with me again. You're stupid, I'm not falling for it. Mom tells us both to shut up. Silence for a little bit. Hear something coming from deeper in the cave. Can't make it out, but my sister and I flip our shit. Mom says it's probably just wind at the other end of the cave. We decide it's time to leave, cause we can't go any further. Start heading back out. Pretty easy. There's a couple spots you have to climb up and drop down, but nothing that requires any real athleticism. Get to where the entrance should be. The rock fell over it, or it was pushed. Either way, we're sealed in. Mom tries pushing the rock, but she's too short to have any real leverage. We try yelling, but not even Lucy is barking at the noise, and she's pretty close to the entrance. Batteries on flashlights pretty low, but Mom packed spares. She says we shouldn't use them yet, unless we need them. Wait around for a while, yelling sometimes, trying different ways of pushing the rock. Mom decides it's time to try heading for the other end of the cave. We make our way there, trying to use a flashlight only when necessary. Mom ends up falling down a three or four foot drop. I fall with her. Not too bad, but scary. We make it back to the squeeze. Mom's kind of overweight, and she can't fit. I'm too young to be trusted to find my way through, I guess. Tells my sister to get to the other end of the cave and find someone who can lift the rock. Sister is 13, and she's freaking the fuck out, but she's a champ. She takes the flashlight and makes her way in. Mom and sister are talking to each other through the squeeze, figuring the whole thing out, I guess. Sister stops replying after a little while. Mom hysterical, trying to call out to sister, but trying not to be too loud and cause a collapse or something. Eventually, she's quiet listening for a response. I think she's crying too. We hear rocks moving from the other end of the chamber. People calling. Anyone in here? See flashlights. Fuck yes. The same cavers who we met on the way in were leaving for the day and noticed our dog still tied up and the rock over the entrance and put two and two together. Mom explains that sister is looking for the other end of the cave. Dude pushes past us immediately and climbs to the squeeze. We watch his feet disappear and his buddy explains that the cave doesn't have another end. It's about a mile and a half long, and there are a lot of really tight interconnected tunnels. It's basically a maze past a squeeze, and most of it hasn't been fully explored. Mom loses her shit and starts yelling to the guy who went in after sister. Guy with us grabs her and tells her to stop, that she's gonna cause a collapse, 
and we just have to wait. I don't remember a lot of the waiting. Mom and this guy talk for a while, and he tells us stories about the other caves, and all the crazy shit he and his buddy would do. Seems like a really cool guy, honestly. Eventually, we hear voices from the other side. Sister is crawling towards us. Dude is crawling behind her, telling her, it's gonna be okay, we're almost there. She meets us, and my mom rips her out of the crack and squeezes her, all the while saying, I'm here, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Dude comes out shortly after and says my sister was unconscious. She must have hit her head. Sister isn't talking. She's just staring at the flashlight. We make our way out of the cave. Dog is happy to see us. Mom makes a joke about Enchino Man, which I'm way too young to get at the time. Sister is covered in scratches and has a gnarly bruise on her arm. On the drive to the urgent care, my sister whispers that she didn't hit her head. She leans in really close and says, It grabbed me. I try to get her to explain, and she won't. Nurse says there aren't any obvious signs of a concussion, and she can't find any bumps on sister's head. Just treat it like a concussion and keep an eye on her. For anyone pissed that it's a long story and not much happens, I'm sorry. I figure this is much better than family of three found dead in local cave system. At least for me it is. It took my sister three months to really start talking all that much again, even with therapy, which I don't really think made a difference. And to this day, she still won't talk to me or anybody else about it. I've tried talking to my mom about it, and she just acts like it was that crazy time we got trapped in a cave. She even talks about wanting to go splunking again someday. Just her and my stepdad. Fuck that. Not me. Be me. Grandpa owns over 3.8 billion acre dense forest that no human has ever set foot in since the Cambrian explosion. Decide to go camping. <clears throat> in a woods. Sort of in decay shit, nothing special. Bring some light stuff, didn't go too crazy on it. Brought my dad's M119 howitzer, with bayonet just in case. Go out in my three-story tent. Pretty normal, until nightfall, where it gets really crazy. There was no sunset. It went immediately from high noon to the dead of night in a literal second. Like real life had just become some kind of shitty and obviously fake horror story with over 3,000 cliches. Suddenly, I smell something like rusty blood and old metal, or salty coins and milk. It's hard to describe and or remember. I see a humanoid figure in the tree line, about six inches away from my face. Holy shit, it's a walk skinner. I can barely hear it, and it shouts from the tree line. Give me twenty dollars. Fire my howitzer at it. It misses, explodes, pisses off the walk skinner. Start to run away, can barely make it the distance from my campsite back to civilization. My house was like ten feet away, but... My feet were really sore. Start to write this story. Do the captcha. Post it. Did you die? <clears throat> this is Anand's dad posting from his smart fridge. He didn't die, but one year later, I have a time machine so I know, he had an encounter with the skin skinner, which didn't go so well, and he ended up dying. To heart failure. Not to the skin skinner, but it's kind of a crazy coincidence. Royal friend from Gasconade County, Missouri. That's Mazora for you fellers out in the sticks. I have a story that's not spooky, but involves some dumb shit that my grandpa, aka Papa, used to do. Nine years old. Parents were shitty alcoholics, so they used to drop me off with my grandparents pretty much every week. They got a little too drunk one weekend and tried to drive. And that was the end of them. My grandparents were way too old to really watch over me at that point. So, Grandpa had this trick to keep me in line. Next to this chair, he used to keep this cardboard cylinder, one of those from a used up paper towel roll. Before I ever went outside to play, he would say, don't go anywhere you're not supposed to because my truth telling stick will find you out. I would look at that stupid roll of cardboard with wonder in my eyes, thinking it was magic or something. Yes, Papa, I'd say. And then I would go play, being extra careful not to do anything bad. Every time I returned home, Grandpa would pull out his truth telling stick again. He'd look at me through it, like a pirate with a telescope. Where you been today, Sonny? The woods, Papa. Good boy. Now go get your bath. This became my ritual. Even after I stopped believing in it, Grandpa just used a truth-telling stick to mess with me. Here's a stupid example just to give you an idea. One time we're eating supper, and Grandma asked me how I liked the stew she made. I told her I liked it fine, and Grandpa pulled out the truth-telling stick from out of nowhere and said, He thinks it's salty. Just dumb shit like that. Also, when I was 14, I developed this huge crush on a girl from school. 
One time she came to our house for a get-together or something. I was too much of a pussy to make a move, but Grandpa knew I liked her, so he offered to quote-unquote read our fortunes with that damn cardboard roll. Grinch department, please hold. After sizing us up for a moment, Grandpa said, You two are destined to get married. Super embarrassing, but it broke the ice, and she and I ended up laughing about it and talking. Afterwards, while everyone was inside, we ended up making out behind the house. Uh, base department. Anyway, Papa did all sorts of shit like that. Like he used to say that his truth-telling stick could predict the weather. I'd ask him to make a prediction, and he would be right every fucking time. Obviously, he had some trick, but it was still impressive. Anyways, he died a few years back. It was a very dark time for me. A few months before he died, he and I had some really serious talks. Stuff I never talked about with anyone, like my parents, and how angry I was with them. Those talks were the first time I really confronted the fact that, one day, Grandpa would die too, and I would be left alone all over again. I don't know if that sounds cheesy, but I got kind of scared. And then, he fell ill. On his deathbed, he made me promise to keep my inheritance safe. I was confused till I realized he meant the truth telling stick, and I laughed. I thought it was another one of his jokes, but he got really serious, and told me to promise him that I would use it sometime. So I promised. Anyway, after he died, I was really grief-stricken, and I wound up picking up that stupid roll of cardboard and looking through it, and I saw there was a paper rolled up inside. Before I even opened it, I realized why the old man had promised me that I wouldn't throw it away. It was a simple letter. This is the truth. I love you, son. You crazy old dodger. I miss you, Papa. I never knew my grandpa that much, but he grew up in East Germany, and he passed away recently. He told me a shitload of stories about life under the DDR, and most of them were steeped in spooks and happenings, so I'm going to post a few. Be Grandpa named Otto, nine at the time of the story. Parents lived in Dresden. Place is a shithole from Allied bombing in World War II. Moved to the countryside after inheriting grandparents' farm. Place is in a pretty pleasant and cozy section of hills and lowlands. Dense with forestry. Playing near the woods. Accidentally kick ball into the forest. Completely lose sight of it. Scared of the woods, cause little kid. Go get Papa to help me get it. Dad seems nervous too. We both go back to the farmhouse. Dad leaves me there. He takes his old hunting rifle. Technically illegal for him to own this time of year, but he didn't care. Sit inside playing with a train set. Hear a gunshot from the woods. Run outside to investigate. Dad is walking back with a ball under one arm. No rifle. Looks shaken. Gramps wouldn't learn what his dad did in the woods until he was 19. So, I'll share that part of the story. Be Gramps, 19. Talking with Dad over a beer about childhood memories. Asks him about the time he lost his ball. Dad sighs. Shrugs. Witch took it. Laugh. Dad is deadly serious. Feel my stomach churn. I didn't want to leave that rifle there, but it was cursed. Any tool that draws a witch's blood is. Suddenly, don't want to drink anymore. Be Grandpa, 21. Working parent's farm. Twilling the fields, planting wheat. Stop to have a drink and cool off. Sitting on the porch with a clear view of the tree line. See the branches rustle. The fuck? Stare intently as the treetops rustle like something was moving between them. Incredibly tall figure emerges. Easily was eye level with the treetops. Towered over me and even the farmhouse. Wearing animal pelts and carrying two dead bulls like they were potatoes. It notices me. Grunts. Says something that sounds like absolute gibberish. In this voice so deep and booming I could feel it in my bones. Walks back into the woods. Next day, dad who was in his 70s and still living with Gramps at the time, forces me to leave a dead cow at the tree line. It's completely gone by noon. Never see anything take it. Last one for now. Be Grandpa, 13. Visiting a friend's house. Friend is a Polak. Speaks German, but in a Pole accent. Laugh at his voice a few times. Start playing football with him in the backyard. Easily passed most of the day doing this. It's getting very late. Sun's beginning to set. Go inside and eat dinner with friend and his family before going to walk home. On the walk home, notice that there's a new dirt path through the woods that wasn't there before. New dad was going to chew my ass out for being late. Decided to explore it anyways. It's pretty short, but leads to a little grove that is absolutely surrounded in a dense wall of trees. There's a very shabby looking cabin in the middle. Looks abandoned, but the lights are still on. Distinctly smell a stew being cooked from the cabin. 
You see the lights quickly turn off and just barely make out this little old lady emerging from the cabin holding a huge stick and a lantern. She shouts at me, Hello, dearie. Do you want to join me for dinner? Shout back, No thanks, miss. She shouts back one last time before I walk off. But you look so plump and delectable. Runs off back to home. Dad chews me out for being late. Don't bother telling him about the weird witch lady. I don't know why people make up skinwalker stories. The shit animals do in the wild is often way fucking scarier. I work primarily as a hiking guide in northern West Virginia. It's very beautiful and there's a wide variety of trails that people love to walk on. And it's a job that I love to do myself. This story happened a few years ago in the spring of 2019. I was leading a group of four. Two of them were veterans, apparently on some type of PTSD therapy retreat. And the other two were a middle-aged dad and his kid, who I think was about 13 or 12. I only work from 8am to 4pm, but due to a scheduling error, this hike was a lot earlier than I'm used to at 6am. I was wide awake and it wasn't pitch black out, so I knew this story isn't the result of sleep deprivation or seeing the shadows move. We had gotten halfway through the trail, it was quite a short one, and we were taking a break because the kid tripped and got his knee hurt. One of the veterans was looking over it, making sure he was fine, and I was looking out into the woods waiting for them to wrap up. It was about 7.30, if I remember right, and it was a bit hard to see into the denser part of the woods, but I saw a coyote very slowly approach out of the woods and near the trail. Coyotes are usually spooked off by groups larger than three, and I was expecting it to scamper off. I noticed pretty quickly, though, that it seemed to be very injured. One of its hind legs had been gnawed down to the bone. I didn't get a clear look, but it was like it had been degloved, aside from a few bits of sinew clinging to it. The coyote looked very haggard too, like it was tired and probably sick. I kind of felt bad for it and went to grab my phone and report to one of the local rangers that there was a sick slash wounded coyote out here that didn't look like it was caused by anything natural. And that's when this massive fucking buck bounded out from the woods. Now I was at a distance from all of this, but from my estimation, this thing would have easily towered over me and even one of the veterans who was this six foot six brick shithouse. I instinctively backed up knowing not to fuck with this thing, as I watched it just start to rip into the poor coyote. It stomped it into the dirt and mutilated its corpse. It kept ramming its antlers into the coyote's corpse and rending backwards until the poor thing was ripped to sinew. I legitimately found a group of leprechaun. No joke, and I don't give a fuck if you don't believe me. I was walking in Rathwood Forest, hiking alone. I was visiting family up in Ireland. This happened on the 27th of March. It was around 11 p.m. when this happened. Be me, be walking in Rathwood. Started at dusk, now night. I had a flashlight, a phone, keys, and a wallet on me. Flashlight was a big circular one, like construction workers use. It was very bright. Just usual trees and foliage for hours. See tree near a little crevice. Its root forms a sort of a bridge to the other side of the ledge, over the crevice. I follow the little crevice, going under the root bridge, and I hear some shuffling. I get really freaked out and panicked. In my mind, I really thought my life was over, and you may be wondering why such an exaggerated feeling. I have no idea. I of course thought of wolves, and that got me going, but something really pushed that feeling. I am frozen in place by fear. Finally, look towards some bushes about ten feet away. See three little people. Two are naked, and one is wearing green makeshift clothings. Like, dyed sheep wool or something. Fucking pot of gold there, too. Looks like they're guarding it. I hear them say, Hey, Peter. Bopo. <laughs> I hear them say, Bopo, a few times. And I pass out. I wake up 20 feet away from that place, and I can hardly move. It's daytime, and all the muscles in my upper body are completely strained. My calf muscles are as well. No bruising or anything. I can breathe, but I feel like every muscle affected is completely depleted. Like, I exercised for days, and this is the aftermath. I hike back to my car and drive to my gramps' place. I, of course, tell him and my grandma what happened. He tells me, Those damned leprechauns. They did that to you. Don't go back there, and if you see them again, cover your eyes and turn around and shout to them in a calm but stern voice. Say, I don't want to take away your gold. Just let me leave. I'm not bothering you. These woods belong to you. He nearly cried. Wake up on hard ground. I'm a Russian soldier in the Battle of Stalingrad. 
get told by Captain to retake a building on a hill with my squad. Grab Mosin, running up. Mortar fire all around us. See other soldiers burst from the explosions. Make it through, thanking God. Suddenly, whiz, chunk. I look down and realize that there is blood pooling on my shirt. I have been shot in the stomach. I fall onto my back, shivering uncontrollably, thinking, why me? And start feeling myself fade away. Sort of like I'm sinking in all directions. Everything becomes hazy and I realize that this is when I find out what happens after death. I wake up. The odd thing is that I wasn't a non in that dream. I had the memories of this Russian kid. Maybe that's what our lives are. Just a dream had by another who, in turn, is also but a dream. Okay, two of my dad's experiences. Background. Dad was an LDS missionary on the Navajo reservation in the Four Corners area. At least twice, he had close encounters with persons or beings that he believed to have been skinwalkers. The first event occurred with both my dad and his missionary friend present. They were studying scriptures in a rented trailer. They'd rented it from a Navajo man who later wound up in jail for drugs, I think. I'll refer to this Navajo man as Bob for simplicity's sake. So, Dad and his friend are in the rented trailer studying the scriptures, sitting just a couple of yards from each other, when Dad suddenly notices a strange older Navajo man standing right in front of him. Dad hadn't seen him enter and had no idea how the man had gotten in there. So, the old man asks, in Navajo, Where is my son, Bob? Dad, completely surprised, simply replied, He's not here. He was too afraid to upset the old man, so Dad conveniently left out, that Bob was in jail. Anyway, Dad looked over at his friend, who was also staring in shock at the old Navajo. When Dad looked back, the old man was gone. He was there one moment, and gone the next, in the blink of an eye. Dad and his friend jumped to their feet and searched a trailer. The door was locked, and the window shut. There was simply no way to get in and out without being noticed. They both asked around afterwards, and the locals claimed that Bob's dad had been involved in black magic. But... They wouldn't say anything more about it. This next story occurred a few months later. Dad and his friend were headed home in their Jeep at night between 9 and 10 p.m. This is southeast Utah slash northeast Arizona, and they were driving through a little valley on their way home. The valley was actually known for having some ceremonial significance to the Navajo. So, Dad's driving, and his friend is napping in the passenger seat. As they get to the middle of the valley, the Jeep suddenly dies and rolls to a stop. No lights, no electricity, no power at all just completely dead. Dad steps out and opens the hood, and as he's working on getting the Jeep to start, he notices several dark shapes approaching and encircling the car at a small distance. They're swaying and moaning something that Dad can't understand. Scared, Dad reaches over and shakes his friend to wake him, but no matter how hard Dad shakes him, his friend won't wake up. The encircling dark shapes are now getting closer. Completely terrified now, Dad does the only thing he can, pray and pray hard. Suddenly, the electricity and lights of the Jeep come back on. The moment the headlights came back on, the dark shapes were gone without a trace. Dad then jumps inside, starts the engine, and floors it out of the valley. Only then does his friend wake up. He wants to know why they're speeding, and Dad explains the whole thing to him. My dad has always been an honest religious man, so I believe him to be telling the truth. I work with a Navajo co-worker, and one time I told her about my dad's experiences. She said that they're totally consistent with what she knows about skinwalkers. I asked her if she could tell me any more about them, and she outright refused. In fact, I got the impression that if I pushed a topic, I would be on thin ice with her. All she would tell me was, there are very real evil things in the world. Long time lurker, first time poster on X. I'm generally a K friend. I feel like every story starts like that. A few years ago, we had decoration day up at the old family land, and I think I had a Bigfoot encounter, maybe. Old Appalachian thing where it's kind of a family reunion, but we clean slash decorate the graves, have a church service, and cook out all in the cemetery. Family cemetery in the mountains of North Carolina, close to the Tennessee border. On very old, American-wise, family land, and there are people from my family dating back to the early 1800s there, along with, apparently, a number of Cherokee somehow related to us. So, here's the short and easy of it. Me and a couple of distant cousins decide to go camping up on a ridge, overlooking the farm and cemetery one night, something we do every few years after decoration. Beautiful view with minimal light pollution, all armed because bears are common, and panthers aren't too uncommon to be seen. 
Everyone falls asleep except me and a cousin. I'll call him Dale, because we're night shift friends. In the middle of a conversation, he stops, does a double take, and stares deadpan down the ridge at the cemetery. Dale squints and mutters, What the fuck? I can't see shit, Captain. That JPEG. Anon, there's people in the fucking graveyard. Jesus Christ, they're huge. Wake up the other three and decide to go investigate. It's a three-quarter mile hike down through the woods, through the forest to get to the cemetery. And about ten minutes into it, my hackles raise up. There's no cicadas, no owls, no anything. I feel like I'm being watched. Start to smell something the closer we get to the graveyard. And for any med friends, the closest I can compare it to is finding a dead fat guy composed in his trailer in mid-July. And a basement mothballish mildewy smell. It's fucking horrible. Everyone's on edge, but nothing happens the rest of the way down. Dale starts hyperventilating and pointing his SKS to the clearing, way across the field behind the house. Something fucking huge sprints fast as shit from behind one of the barns to the wood line, about 130-ish yards in seconds. Dale takes a few pot shots at the thing, and we hear this squalling, kind of like a giant bobcat with his nuts and a vice. Another call similar sounds from behind us in the woods, adjacent to the cemetery. Fuck this, that JPEG. I'm so rattled at this point, I just start running to the jeep that we rode down the holler in, and we all pile in. The dirt road into the land is about two miles of dirt roads, hugging the edge of a drop-off and takes you to the main road at the top of the mountain. We're all armed and scared shitless all the way up the driveway, and we make it out on the main road and spend the rest of the night at Waffle House. It's anticlimactic, but it was fucking terrifying. I have something. The clap. Happened back when I was still a kid, when I was still living in the rural part of the Philippines. Stories with ghosts and dwarves that live inside trees are pretty common, and is usually told by older people, so, yeah. I apologize in advance if I leave a few things out. Be me, four or five-ish, watching cartoons in the living room with my mom. Suddenly, see Curtin dancing. Curtin moves towards me while it was still dancing. Remember Curtin grabbing me by the foot. Mom bolts towards me while telling the Curtin to stay away. Mom picks me up and shoves me into the car while she fumbles with the keys. Remember her crying and telling me not to fall asleep. We arrive at my grandma's place. Mom tells her what happened, but I was too confused to understand what she was saying. Grandma tells my mom to call her neighbors. Grandma hugs me and tells me to stay awake, rubs a leaf on my forehead. Old neighbors along with my mom arrive carrying leaves. They then proceed to shake the leaves around me for five to ten minutes, probably even longer. Start to feel drowsy. Grandma shouts at me to stay awake. She lights a candle in front of me and tells me to stare at it. I begin to get scared and I ask her what's going on. Just tells me to stare at it. So, I did. Don't know what happened, but I wake up in my grandma's bedroom. Everyone's staring at me and sighing in relief. Grandma puts an amulet around me and I hear something wail in the distance. They hear it too and my grandma shouts and tells it to go away and never come near us again. Makes me drink coconut water mixed with something. They shake leaves around me again and they tell me that everything is going to be okay. Here's one from the perspective of a visitor at work. Be 30-ish year old man, going to a mausoleum to visit granny on her birthday. Decide to go around 2 or 3 a.m. There's a lockbox on the door with a mouse key for family members of the deceased who work odd hours or whatever. Nighttime and everything is spooky. Light from the chandeliers is dim, reflects a sickly green color off the granite walls. Go and talk to granny, telling her stories about life and my new girlfriend. Start hearing something weird, like faint walking, almost like a dog on tile. Very erratic. After a while, I decide to check out the other parts of the building for the noise. Creep through dark hallway where they keep the offices. As I creep, I hear more scrabbling and a few bangs. Just poke my head around the corner into the main area. All the lights are off, except emergency lights. I look around, and I don't see anything. Hear the scrabbling from higher up. Slowly tilt my head up. One of the crypts is open. There's some thing hanging from it. It's all black. It's making strange guttural noises. I tactically shit myself and scream. This thing jumps 30 feet straight to the ground. And that's when I got a better look at it. It was all black, save for its hands and face. They were pale as a corpse. Thing is making pain noises on the ground and crawling on all fours. I run to the nearest door and try to get the fuck out. Door is locked. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. I'm locked in a mausoleum with some freaky creature. I bang on the door for a few seconds, and then I hear it speak in human words, English. 
Door's locked, fuckwit. I turn around and see this creature is now on two legs. It looks like it's trying to imitate me, but when it walks, it's all stuttery, like its legs weren't on right. I scream slash pray to God, Allah, Satan, Odin, and any other deity that I can think of. Creature lumbers and lumps over towards me as I curl up in a ball against the locked door. It looks at me and says, Jesus Christ my ass. First the roof leaks, then the power goes out while I'm fixing it, then the damn ladder falls over. Now I've got you scaring almost literally to death. The hell are you even doing creeping around here in the dark? V visiting my granny. Well, just a helpful tip here, man. Don't go creeping around places in the middle of the night while the power's out. Who are you? I'm the fucking angel of death. You're dead because you stepped on a live wire in a blocked off maintenance zone. What? I'm the maintenance man, you don't. Now help me to the break room so I can find a damn ice pack for my leg. This kind of shit happens all the time. Even in the middle of the fucking day. People are way too damn jumpy. I had to scold the guy for going into an area that had like four signs saying, under construction, enter at own risk. Here, I'll leave you one before I go. Be me, walking around ship, be night out. It's absolutely amazing to be outside in the middle of nowhere with just the light of the moon. Look off in the distance, see something, can't quite make it out. Ask Cap if Radar sees it, says nope, but he sees something too. We both concluded that it looked like a ship. Try to spotlight. Too far. Try to air horn slash speaker. Hello? Anyone there? You guys having trouble? Loud clanks echo. It's not Morse, just banging. Ask for Morse. More banging, but still no Morse code though. We try to keep distance in case it's a trap. The banging stops, and now we hear what sounds like a full crew going into battle stations. Which is weird because it's a 100 to 200 foot boat at most. But we are at a distance, and this could have just been echoes. We finally get close enough to shine light. Just a lost boat. Probably found its way there because a rope snapped. Upon closer inspection, it looks ages old. Paint is basically stripped. Holes everywhere. I dated it maybe to the 1900s. What's crazy is the anchor was down, but it could have been because of rust. We try air horn again. No answer. We try to radio nearest port. Fuzz on the radio. We got through. They said they would come check it out. By the time we got back, ship was gone. Hi, X. I'm a casual lurker. I am Venezuelan, and I come to share and ask about experiences with trickster beings and shapeshifters, and spirits who can disguise themselves. I know the Japanese culture is full of these fucks, and plenty of animal spirits can transform with ease, but I really wonder how much entities mimic us, and what categories of beings can and can't do so. Have you had similar experiences with things pretending to be you or your family? Here's my story below. Be me, 12 years old at the time. My brother was 15. Family owned a big but rundown colonial style house in a town in the province. Probably belonged to a low tier landowner of the Latifundia area. Grandpa wanted to have it become an inn but the area never got developed and we simply used it to vacation ourselves. Me and bro were always so freaked out at night that we started sleeping in the same room. You have to walk across a scary as hell colonial hallway and across the patio to get to the bathroom of this house. Bro and I hated to go to the bathroom alone at night. I always annoyed the crap out of him so he would come with me and he was cool about it. One night, my brother is woken up by quote unquote me shaking him and pulling out his blanket. He squints and sees me hanging by the open door waiting for him. He's sleepy as fuck and is so used to this happening that he just plays along. He gets up and he follows me. He never really stared too closely. He saw my figure getting kind of lost in the shadows of the hallway. He heard my exact voice telling him to come, come, and when I vanished, he simply thought I went ahead and had a bad rush to pee or something. When he got to the middle of the patio, he realized there was no one in the bathroom to the other side. The door was open and the lights were out. The other rooms were closed. He kinda looked around for me and thought I was pulling a prank, trying to scare him. What the fuck, Anon? Where did you go? He then heard me whisper loudly, Come Anon's brother, come, let's enter the garden. Again, he saw quote unquote me, heavily shaded, but still perfectly silhouetted, making hand gestures for him to enter the garden area with him. This was a separate area leaving the house, not actually a garden, but some backwoods of the property outside of the house, and joined with the hill. My grandpa planted some mango trees and shit, there was nothing there other than that. My brother was having none of this. 
Are you crazy or what, Anon? Get the fuck over here, or I'll wake up our parents so they kick your ass. You're gonna fall into that stupid pit, or get bitten by a snake, asshole. You'll get us both into serious shit. The figure that looked like me kept calling him and making gestures, so he got pretty pissed. Turned back the way to our room and figured I'd get scared of being left alone in the patio, so I would rush back behind him. He didn't hear me following, though. Imagine the face on my brother when he saw me dead asleep in our room when he returned. It was not me the whole time. He screamed like a bitch, woke everyone up, and was close to tears. My father and grandpa went into the backwoods with lanterns, and they found no one. You can't even access the property from there. We would have to jump from, like, a helicopter or something to enter the house from the back. It was not the only time that me and other family members heard and saw each other calling us. We always had this shit happen every time we vacationed there. We found out the next owner killed himself after the government expropriated all of his investments. There's nothing there now but squatters, and the town is ran by a criminal gang and Santeros. What the hell was that? Alright, this happened this most recent August. Second weirdest thing I've ever seen in this state. Easily the most unsettling. Get three days free after doing 24-7 grandpa care for two months. Get two friends to go in the mountains with me. Leave Friday night in a truck, pulling a trailer with two four-wheelers. Light finally fades about 10 p.m. mid-August in Alaska. Take it easy on speed because big old diesel. Get to the target highway at about midnight. Pavement ends at mile 21-ish. Everything to now has been pretty normal. Couple miles in, road turns left with a small pull-off on the right side. Little Subaru parked there, facing into the road. LED light bar at face level PNG. There's someone leaning on the hood watching us as we drive by. Tired by this point, not real concerned. Figure it's someone waiting for their hunting buddy. It is caribou season. Keep going. This highway is real rough in the fall. It's gravel, and the heavy fall rains combined with all the fall time hunting and camping traffic tears it up. Going 30 miles per hour if I'm lucky. Truck, trailer, and teeth all going daka 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 from washboards. <laughs> nice bright full moon. Can miss the worst spots. Hit real long straight stretch before trailhead pull off. Get half mile down straight stretch, about halfway. Lights in rear view mirror. Fucking bright as fuck light bar again. This friend is hauling ass. 50 to 60 miles per hour or more. One friend is zonked in the back. The other one is spaced out. Point the light bar car out to him. He watches them in the side mirror. Doesn't seem too unsettled. Car is maybe 200 feet back when I finally pull into the trailhead. Car catches up 10 seconds later. Slows down to five miles per hour going by. Obviously checking us out. Hackles raised at TIF. Park the truck. Watched him drive down the highway for a bit. Let out a deep breath. Look to the left at the other corner of this parking area. There's an SUV parked there. No big deal. And this is where it gets way out of whack. Wake up the other friend. Kill the engine. Hop out. Instant gut assessment. Shit's fucked. We're being hunted. Time to go. My response to this novel sensation? Hey, there's something written on that SUV. Shine my flashlight on it. Moloch, written in the dust on back window, since it was parked. Oh, fuck, what? Friends are stretching legs. One has his AR out. They're both too quiet. Check out SUV. Engine is still warm. Parked within a few hours. Only front passenger door is locked. Shoes and sandals and shorts. Comfy driving wear on front seats. Full packs and compound bow in back. Full cooler, tent, and everything is untouched. Six months expired youth group sticker on hood. Empty coffee hood coffees. Looks like a young couple out to camp. Friends are checking out this SUV. We're all at independently reached 10 out of 10 maximum alert. Look around the whole area. Nobody's there. No fresh tracks except in parking area itself. Another pair of cars with LED light bars go by, hauling maximum ass. We keep rifles on them from cover as they go by. Give in to gut feeling. Leave. 
camp 30 miles away on a different highway, come back in the morning. SUV is still there, untouched. Still no sign of anybody around. Terrible gut feeling is gone. Take the four-wheelers and go eight miles back in the mountains. Have a good time camping. Get bullied by a caribou. Come back in the next day. Nobody was out there. Great lines of sight and nowhere to hide. SUV, untouched. Food in the back is starting to go off. Get back to town. Call SUV in to troopers. Dispatcher goes, yeah, that's sketchy as fuck. I'll send someone out. Call back two weeks later to see what came of it. No record of having ever called it in, but they have every other call that I've made. Sorry, Kay. Some stories don't have a good ending. I'm convinced we were getting checked out, and the only reason they let us be was because we had our ARs propped up on the seats and very visible. I never found any explanation for what I saw out there. All I know is that gut feeling I got when I got out of the truck was the spookiest thing I've ever felt. And all three of us felt it independently. There's some fucked up shit going on out there. I'm convinced. Someone started a thread the other day full of weird events from his youth. One of which involved UFOs. It made me want to share this personal story, but the thread was archived before I got a chance. So, I'm going to share it here. I've never green texted anything, so go easy on me. First things first, out in West Texas, there's a rundown shack off the side of the road. And I mean, way off the side. The only reason I found it is because I drove from Houston to Marfa to check out what all the hubbub was about. People in my social circle go gaga over Marfa, pick related. It's like a fucking mecca for art hoes and hipsters, apparently. But... It's also a gorgeous place. Clear open skies, night full of stars. We don't get this sort of thing in Houston. I spent most of my youth in the country, so it's a welcome experience to see all of the beautiful wilderness. I feel like a kid again. Stay there for a week, and towards the end I feel like, if anything, the city itself gets in the way of all that natural beauty. So, I shift gears. I buy a tent, and I pack some food. Then... I hit the highway. Somewhere between Marfa and Alpine, just before sunset, I pull my jeep off the road and drive into the Chihuahua Desert. Not gonna lie, I had scenes of Native American vision quests dancing through my mind. Maybe this trip could be an awakening of sorts. But with no map and no real cell service, it's a little like sailing out into the open sea, all alone, without a compass. Not to bore you, but most of my life back home revolved around work, bills, and family problems. Lonely nights at the bar, the occasional bad date, and blah 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 blah. This is all just to say that I guess I'd been searching for a reset button. And driving into that desert felt kinda cool. It's sunset, and I see something. A small hill. All jagged along the left side like someone had blown out a part of it. Maybe a mining operation. The jagged side is all lit up by the setting sun, so you couldn't exactly miss it, but you also couldn't quite make it out entirely. I speed towards it, feeling like Mad Max, cloud of dust behind me. Takes a while. By the time I actually make it around the hill and I'm facing the blown outside, the sun has set. Pitch black, just the headlights. My jeep rolls to a stop, and my headlights catch something about 50 feet away. An old rundown shack sitting in front of the rocky face of the hill. It looks like a spooky face gaping at me. Two front windows are busted open, and the front door is missing. The scream at JPEG. At this point, I'm actually a little spooked. This isn't too far from cartel territory. What if I find dead bodies piled inside? Nah, I'm just letting my imagination run away with me. Shut off the jeep and walk towards the shack. It's quiet. I'm talking about dead silence. Nothing but the crunching sound of my footsteps. No skittering of rabbits, no wind, just like the desert is holding its breath. I approach the shack and notice the front door isn't missing. It's just a few feet in front of the doorway, like it's been blown right off the hinges. Inside, the place is barren. 
A staircase to my right leads up to a second story, which seems odd. From outside the place, looks like a single story. From the base, I can't make out anything upstairs. Man, I should have left my headlights on, I think to myself. It wouldn't be so dark in here. Oh well, too late. I march up the creaky steps, and that's when things get weird. First of all, the whole upstairs is furnished completely. Nothing fancy, but it is decent. On a small table sits a round wooden box. Curious about what's inside. Just then, in the distance, I hear an engine rumbling. Sounds like a big truck speeding towards the shack. Like, this thing must be flying. Figure I ought to get out of there. But curiosity wins out. I walk over to open the box when I realize someone is in the room with me. It's dark, but I can make a figure out in the far corner. Feel paralyzed. Not even really scared, just like I can't move. Outside, I hear the engine rumbling loudly. Then, a weird sound. You ever heard a calf calling for its mother? This sounded similar, only it was quick, like it was almost barking. I hear a bunch of these outside, then downstairs, then coming up the steps. They sound slow and heavy. I begin to feel very weak, like I'm drunk, and the figure in the corner walks over to me. I feel him touch my neck, and then everything goes black. When I woke up, I was in my Jeep, but it wasn't where I parked it. No shack, and I didn't see the rocky face of a hill. I was just right up against a big-ass cactus, and I felt hungover. I managed to find my way to the highway, and figured out I was by Fort Davis, which is like 30 minutes from either Marfa or Alpine. Fucking weird shit. Just a bit of a weird one, to be honest. Work at a newsagent when I was 18. Same people come in every day. Rarely it's people you don't know. The thing about working in a shop is that you find out everyone's business and what's going on. It's like working in a bar. One day, cutie girl in her early 20s comes in, who I haven't seen before. Mentions someone has just been murdered, stabbed to death specifically, and near the arch. The arch is about 200 yards away from the newsagent. Yeah, no one has mentioned it, and I haven't seen any emergency vehicles pass by, which they would have to get to the arch because this is the only road that leads to it. She was probably some junkie that doesn't know what she's talking about. About half an hour later, see some emergency vehicles pass by. Maybe she was telling the truth. Took their fucking time getting there, though. Older woman comes in and can't wait to tell me the gossip says someone's been murdered at the arch and that there's blood everywhere. Yeah, I know, they got stabbed. Asks me how I know. Tell her a woman came in about half an hour early and told me. She couldn't have. Her neighbor had only just seen the body and rang the police. Presumably, the first one to find it. And she's been with her since then. I know her neighbor because she comes in the shop. She's an older woman too. Tell her I'm not talking about her, I'm talking about the cutie. Following day, police come in and ask me about it. What they really want to know is how I know she was stabbed. Tell them a cutie told me. Give them description of her. Both look at each other. Ask me to show them on the CCTV. Can't. It's broken. It's just there as a deterrent, really. Shows things in real time, but doesn't record. Say they might need to come back. They don't. Sit reading the paper. A girl in her 20s was the victim. No picture of her, so can't verify whether it was some kind of ghost telling me, or if she was just someone who witnessed it. But she never came back in, and when she came in the first time, she didn't buy anything. What would your next move be? Who was in the wrong? Go to party. See friend who is back in town with a quote-unquote new look. Shorter hair, no beard. Polar opposite clothes that he used to wear. Try to catch up with him. He introduces himself under a new name. Claims to be his younger brother. I laugh it off. 
My excrement tastes a bit off that night, so I leave early. He seems to have moved back here. Main issue is he continues this charade. When I bring it to him or others, they all look at me like I'm strange. Two days of not being able to go over this, but I seem to be convincing friends of this being weird. He decides to prove it with picture and videos of him and his brother by using photoshopped pictures as well as poorly edited videos. The thing that aggravates me more is the friends that were beginning siding with me now side with believe him more. I tried to confront him one final time, telling him as his friend that this joke has gone too far and that it's genuinely affecting me. He gives me the shittiest response that makes me want to beat the shit out of him. Maybe they all see me as a massive pushover now. Maybe he indoctrinated them at a party. I need to show them who can really pop your bonds, runs the corner, and guess who's gonna assuade Urga. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Reading this thread, I can't help but think my own personal whatever it is might be one of these. Quick rundown of what's going on. Tall, dark man wears a plague doctor's mask comes to me every night between the hours of 3 and 5 a.m. I can't speak or move and etc. I can only move my eyes. He stands right at the side of my bed, mostly. Sometimes he's hovering directly above me. Can't always see him perfectly. Fucking talks to me, usually about my activities or general thoughts throughout the day. For example, he's asked me about my writing, what I want to do this summer, how I'm going to live after I eventually move out, when I'll finally go camping, etc. He knows I can't answer and just prattles on for maybe about 10 minutes a day. He usually gives sound advice if I need it. He even knows when I've told people about him and has called me out on it before, but doesn't mind so much. This has been going on since August 2011, and only in the last six months has it become a nightly thing. Used to only be every couple of nights. I've also had some really fucked up paranormal encounters where he's come to me after the fact and told me about what it was that I saw, heard, or whatever. Sometimes, he'll even warn me before I go places or tell me about things that I didn't even know I was near. I don't think he's evil by any means, but I can't really say he's my guardian or some shit. He just seems like a friendly passerby that won't leave. Pick related. Closest thing Google Images had to him. Semenon, still bored enough to be on X, so bumping with a couple of stories. Condensing them as best as I can, but there are three of them and I have a deadline tomorrow, so I'm going to make this quick. If anybody gives half a fuck, feel free to say so and validate my existence. December 2011. A friend of my mother's is moving into a new house. Her husband is away on business. And she's pregnant. Asks me to help unload stuff, set up the house, and clean. The neighborhood isn't great, so she asks me to spend the night because she doesn't want to risk anything happening while she's alone. I get an air bed on first floor in the living room that has sliding glass doors leading to the backyard and no curtains to speak of. The house has been giving me the creeps all day. Lots of clunking and shit coming from the pipes. Can't sleep. End up laying there until about 1.30 a.m., there is literally no sound coming from anywhere. Suddenly, I hear the side door opening in the kitchen, 20 feet away. I'm frozen fucking solid and in a cold sweat. Can hear loud shuffling heading up the stairs. Pretty sure it was plastic grocery bags. Goes up and never comes down. Don't sleep. My doctor friend visits at his usual time. Says only one thing to me. Don't move. I can see him sort of glide off into the other room where the staircase is. A minute later, and there's this ungodly screeching coming from upstairs, followed up by the violent clunking of the pipes from earlier. Don't sleep all night after that. The next day, the pregnant chick wakes up. Her own air bed was on the other side of the living room in the corner, and tells me I look like shit. I explain to her what happened last night. Calls bullshit, but is still a little freaked. Sends me upstairs with a baseball bat. Shit's a fucking mess. Windows were broken. There's a hole punched in the wall. Some of the boxes were ripped up by what looked like a dog or a cat. 
the fucking toilet seat in the upstairs bathroom was snapped in half, and the back lid of the toilet was completely gone. Didn't find anybody or anything, though. Call the cops, finally. They tell us it was probably just some hobo looking for a place to crash. That day, the chick's husband comes home, and I go back to my own place. That night when the doc comes for his nightly checkup, he tells me I was lucky I didn't open the closet when I was up there. Don't even fucking go back to that place. July 2012, the couple moves out. Three weeks later, some dude is killed at the place, and it makes the local paper. Clawed to death by a bear in the backyard. There was no fence, and the place is near the woods. Once again, the doc comes and tells me it was no bear. My fucking face during the whole ordeal. And another. June 2012. Perfect weather to go in the woods. Decide, fuck it, and camp behind my house, since this is a fairly woodsy state, Washington. Gear up, go out, and set up camp about a mile out. All goes well until nightfall. Fucking shit, I forgot the flashlight. Why am I so autistic? Like an idiot, I go back to my house to get one. Easily make it back even in the dark because I've been out this way a million times. Grab flashlight and the lantern, then head back outside through the back door. Standing at the edge of the woods is this motherfucker. Like I don't even fucking know what it was. Certainly not an animal from around here. Long ass legs, down on all fours, skinny as shit, long neck, no hair anywhere. It's standing right at the start of the path I always use to go in the woods. And it's looking right at me. Jesus fucking Christ, that is a big mouth. Slowly back up to the door, not taking my eyes off of the thing. Open it up and go back inside. Lock the door, shove a chair in front of it, and turn on all the lights. That night, I don't even lay down to go to sleep. The doc comes anyway. I'm frozen in front of my computer. Don't go back. Don't go back in the woods for two days, leaving all my shit out there. I grab a couple of my buddies to come with me because I'm a pussy. We get to my campground, and there's nothing left but my torn up sleeping bag. No trace of anything else in the area. No footprints, no markings, nothing but the cotton from my gutted sleeping bag. I never went back to that spot, and there is no force on earth that can make me. Last story coming up. Last week, tried going urban exploring because I'm a dumb shit. Had this one place pegged for the last couple of months. Posted on X before about it, pick related. Wait until nighttime, grab gear. My camera is dead though. Picture is about two months old. Took it when I was out scouting for places. This is about half a mile away from my house, in the opposite direction of the campground, in my previous story. So, I figure there's no chance of running into... it. The night before, the doc comes to me and tells me to be quiet. Spend all day wondering what the fuck he meant. Shrug it off and set out for the warehouse. Get inside. Loads of old equipment laying around. All rusted to hell and back because the roof is shit and leaks like a horny bitch. Really deep inside, there's this makeshift skate park. Ramps and crap made out of wood and chunks of concrete. Really wishing I had my camera right now. Suddenly, footsteps. I duck behind a pile of crap in the corner by one of the doors. Two guys walk in from the other side of the room, dressed in black, talking about I don't know what. Another guy comes in from the door to my left, with a black plastic bag. He greets the other two coldly, then throws the bag at them. The two open it up, whisper something to each other, and throw it back. The guy with the bag says with a heavy Irish accent, All in place for the delivery. One of the two in black just nods. The other has his cell phone out and is typing something. Irish guy says, It's been a pleasure, gents. Then turns on his heels and leaves the way he came. The two guys in black just stand around for a few minutes, seemingly for no fucking reason whatsoever, before leaving. All this time, I'm scared out of my mind. No idea what the fuck just happened. I wait another half an hour before leaving just to be safe. When I get home, I call the cops, but they never follow up. 
Trying to sleep that night was a nightmare. Didn't stop Doc. You need to stop sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong. I know you aren't trying to, but you simply must put in some effort against it. Still haven't bought a new camera so I can go back and take more pictures. And I still don't know what the fuck the Doc is. I threw a rock down the well. It clattered against the wall as it bounced from one side to another. I waited, straining both ears. No indication that it had reached the bottom. Hello? I whispered tentatively, in a low, shaky voice as I peered down into the darkness, my eyes unable to penetrate its inky depth. My voice was reverberating against the sodden ancient walls, less into a discordant choir of echoes that was harassing the stillness of the enclosed darkness within. Something felt off. I was not supposed to be there, and I'd taken up most of the evening for me to gather up my courage to make my way across the barren land, alone, before entering the heathenberry forest. Jamie Colden's words had been echoing in my mind all the way to the clearing. If something answers you, just make sure you don't tell it your name, he had warned me the day before as we walked across the edge of the forest adjacent to an old dilapidated train tunnel due north. Why not? I had asked him, and what will answer me? He had been staring at the reddening summer sky, his pale blue eyes sparkling with mischief and amusement. You ask too many questions, Marcus Wellington. Stupid questions. Just don't do it, alright? Not too many people know where to find that stinking old well. They go there to be told if they are going to be successful or not in their lives. You toss a dime over for each question. Make it quick. Never ask questions whose answer you don't want to know. Most importantly, never tell it your name, or it will steal your soul away. I had gasped and cringed at him, because I had never heard any kid my age use that kind of harsh language before. But Jamie had always been one to act cool and older than his actual age for attention. Besides, he was much older than I was. You're kidding, right, Jamie? The only reason why I am here talking to you now is because I feel sorry for you. Your father was a good man. He helped my family a lot. I'm not doing this for you, Cretan. Kathy and I will leave for this city next week. Don't tell anybody I told you that. We've got everything figured out already. Her friend has a place for us somewhere. We're getting married as soon as we leave this stinking village. And we're not coming back. Her father will skin me alive if he ever sees me again after running away with his only daughter. His pale round face had been contorted into a mixture of determination, hope, but also anguish as he continued. If you're smart, you get out of this place as soon as you can before you lose your mind as well. These people are hopeless, or go to that well. Whatever that makes you happy, I don't care. Wait until the clock strikes midnight. Make sure nobody follows you or knows where you're going. You have to do it alone, or else it won't answer you. You see that hill over there? He pointed to the west at a dark bluish hill looming over the plain in the distance. There is a small trail on top of it. Follow it. It will lead you due south into the forest. As the bush grows thicker, that you can barely smash through it, you'll arrive at a small clearing in the middle of the forest, where you can weave easily through the trees. That's where the well is. Don't follow the trail west beyond the clearing. There's marshes. People have drowned and died trying to make their way across the godforsaken plain. And he had been right. The air had been chilly when I emerged from the tree line. I had found myself walking at a small, roughly circular clearing, which was devoid of anything taller than knee-high dandelions. And there in the middle of the mini savanna, almost hidden in the darkness from probing eyes, I had seen a small, dilapidated stone mound, its structure black and sunken. Hello? I called out again, louder but still as hesitant. My whole face tensed hard. This time a dreadful silence was filling up the well. There were no echoes, as if the well had just swallowed my voice whole. Confused, I bent down to pick another rock off the ground. Hello? A voice suddenly rose. I gasped in horror and cringed away, only to trip over my own feet. I fell backwards and landed hard on my buttocks, as I sat there in the cold hard ground and waited, 
feeling convinced that the devil himself was going to rear up from his subterranean tomb to get me. Something flashed across my mind. A cautionary tale Jamie had told me earlier today, before he left for the apple farm where he had been working for a few years. You dare to summon it? You have to finish your business there. Never forget to say thank you and goodbye when you're done. Otherwise, it would think you're not done and follow you around, watching you in the shadows everywhere you go. I struggled to rise to my feet and stood gazing intensely at the derelict stone mound, frowning at the ancient-looking symbols etched into its rough surface. My chest was heaving rapidly with fear and uncertainty. That voice had aroused something in me that I had never known I had. This primal fear of the unknown, of what awaited beyond the darkness. Hello? I chirped. Hello? It drawled, with a contemptuous voice that suggested disguised danger. It sounded warm, but also distant at the same time. There was an unnervingly familiar tone to it, I realized. It almost sounded like my own voice, only distorted, much deeper and feline-like. Don't be afraid. Come closer, it hissed almost inaudibly. Why, what are you? I stammered. Well, I'm a wood fairy. It let out a gleeful chuckle. An image of a tiny winged human with pointed ears and delicate features drafted through my head instantly, which did not match the malicious voice from below. Really? Yes, it hissed loudly as if blowing air through gritted teeth. You see those symbols? They are called Ogham inscriptions, an ancient magic spell to keep me here. I can neither hurt you nor touch you, even if I wanted to. I, 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 I need your help. Will you help me? I was afraid of engaging myself more with this disembodied being, but I knew it was the only way for me. Nothing else would work. What is it? I miss my father. I started to sob. My shoulders shook vigorously as I rested my face down on the cold, rugged stone surface, feeling hopeless and defeated. And very soon I was overwhelmed with a sense of indignation and outrage again. I was not paying attention to my surroundings. The forest around me had fallen silent. The citharism of the trees and the wind had ceased all of a sudden as if the whole land was holding its breath in anticipation. What is it? It asked again, colder and more demanding. I lifted my face off the stone and stared into the darkness below, feeling slightly confused, as I narrowed my eyes to concentrate on trying to catch a glimpse of the slightest movement. I felt like the forest was closing in on me, disintegrating into shadowy walls that were pushing me incrementally from all directions towards the inky depth to answer to the call of the void. Hello? I leaned over the mound and arched my body to peer down. Tell me, what is it? What, what would you like me to do? I opened my mouth but could not find the words to say. I retreated thinking maybe it was not a good idea. Maybe I should just go home immediately and never return to this blasted heath. You can tell me. What is it you want? I can help you, it said coyly. Can you bring him back to me? The words had escaped my lips before I could even stop myself. There were a few seconds of silence that almost made me turn on my heels and take off, not wanting to hear any more of what it had to say. It felt so wrong talking to something you could not see, because it was hiding in the dark, the embodiment of darkness itself. I toyed with the idea of what was real and what was not, but even then, I knew that I was trespassing the border of reality. Of course, it said. What, r really? I asked. Would you believe me if I told you that your father was down here with me, looking up at you, and all you had to do was jump over to be with him? Ah, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I took a step away from the well rubbing at my face. For one, I knew exactly where my father was, 
six feet underground at the Rocco Cherry Cemetery, a few miles due west from the outskirts of town, where we had had him interred a few weeks before, not in the bottom of an old dilapidated well. The concept of death was something I was still struggling to get a grasp on. For all I knew, he could be somewhere else as well, waiting. I was only a kid, and there was only a hint of skepticism flashing across my thoughts as I considered its words. Will I survive the fall when I can't even see the bottom? Is it telling me the truth? A cold high-pitched laugh rose from below, devoid of any emotion. It sounded hollow and insincere. You're one smart kid. So, can you really? I hesitated. Yes, I will bring your father back to you. Will it make you happy to see him again? Surely it will. What? What's the catch then? I asked him cautiously. What do you want from me? Very bold of you to assume I want anything at all from you. Then, what? What is your name, dear? I opened my mouth to answer, but then Jamie's words the day before flashed across my mind again. I'm not allowed to tell you my name. Why? Now that's a lie. Who told you that? My friend? Well, what do we know about this little friend of yours? Isn't he as huge and slow as a grazing bovine on a summer day? Everyone knows the rules. We can't tell you our names. Well, everyone doesn't want to bring their father back from the dead, now do they? But you do. You've been missing him a lot, haven't you? And it's killing you. This is a very huge favor you ask of me. Besides, I only want to be your friend. Our friends supposed to know one another's name? Or at least we can stay on a last name basis if that's more convenient for you. Isn't there any other way than- Oh yes, there is. What is it? Please, tell me. I need human sacrifice. Blood. What? What, what did you just say? Blood? Human blood? It burst into a mirthless laugh that sounded unpleasant and cold. Wouldn't it be much easier if you just told me your name, my dear boy? Then I decided that it would be worth it to just go with it. All I had to do was tell it my name and my father would return to me. It wasn't rocket science. I opened my mouth, but whatever instinct had kept me from doing so for the last twenty minutes or so suddenly caught up to me again. Yes, friend, your name. Tell me your name, it said reassuringly. And you and your dear father will be reunited. That's all it takes. It took a power of will to break my silence, but between heaving breaths and gritted teeth, I finally relented. It was the right thing to do. That night I stumbled onto the truth about Heathenberry Forest, as it spoke to me of things beyond my comprehension. Catherine Deanshaw's eyes were puffy and red when I saw her the following day in the village. She seemed troubled and unhinged. She was looking in my direction for the briefest moment in such a way as if wanting to ask me something, which, under different circumstances, if only things had been, I would have been more than happy to tend to. She had always been a nice girl. She waved at me and smiled confusedly, then walked away with John Clearwater, the son of the richest man in the village, with whom her father had always longed for her to be involved. It pained me not to be able to help her. It genuinely did. But I needed to disengage myself from any responsibility that was not my own. I had been looking forward to subsequently seeing things fall into place. My father's return. It was the only thing that mattered to me. I was only 14, after all. I'll post here because I can't really find a better place, and I need to get this off my chest. Bear with me as I'm on my phone. Be one year ago, to the day. 1800, meet friends in a church parking lot. All four of us are Eagle Scouts. Will, Evan, and Brian. My name is Rob. Super excited. First in a desert trip. I'm no guns. I'm also no 4x4. All four of us are crammed into Will's Ford Explorer. Plus a weekend's worth of camping supplies. Reach spot at 2300. It's a rock shelf that overlooks Giant Rock in California. 
I mentioned how it's kind of like The Hills Have Eyes. That movie scared the piss out of me for some reason. Will says that there are weird people out here. This is my nightmare.jpg. Pitch tent before it gets windy. Try to sleep. Can't. Stay up all night in sleeping bag with Evan's shotgun. Next day. After spending the early morning and mid-afternoon shooting, Will and I decide to go off-roading. His explorer is hardly street-worthy, but we go anyway. Bring water and a 22. Having fun on a trail. Car is stuck in sand. Fuck. Three miles directly to camp, over impassable terrain. Decide to start digging with butt of rifle. One digs, other looks out for help. Dig until 1530. Dude, if somebody doesn't drive by soon, we'll be here all night. I agree. Lock up car. Start walking to the giant rock itself. It's two miles away directly. Bring rifle and water. Start walking. It's 110. No shade. No one in sight. Will mentions how this really is like the hills have eyes. Tactical nope in my head. Chuckle and say, yeah, nervously. About a mile in now. Keep going. Pass an old rusted out jeep. Seriously fucking creeped out now. Start to think about the movie. What happened and why it did. Were those people looking for help? Start to look at everything for a tactical advantage over anyone or anything. There are so many large rocks, shadows and Joshua trees and rocks. Can't possibly find a tactical advantage. At this point, I'm freaking out. Ask Will if we can take a break. He says sure. I keep running things through my mind. See a person off in the distance. Tell Will we need to go now. He says not to worry about it. It's probably another camper. Maybe they can help. Figure gets closer and closer. It looks humanoid, but walks like slow monkey. I all we need to go. Turn around. Turn back. It's gone. All will. He says I must not be drinking enough water. Let's radio Brigand and Evan to let them know where we are. Attempt radio contact. Nothing but static. And a faint. I'm coming. Screech in the distance. Start to get really freaked out. Tell Will we can't stay here. We continue towards the rock. See that figure again. Radio comes on, and a faint, I'm coming, is heard. Something runs in front of us. About a hundred yards off. Humanoid shape. Can't tell what it is for sure. Another screech, but closer. Ask Will if he heard it. He says, Yes, it was nothing. Let's go. Will, that wasn't anything. Figure again appears to be closer. Tell Will to turn around. He does. He sees whatever it was. Actually yells, Nope, out loud. He takes off, full sprint, towards the figure. He doesn't even have the 22. Screech is heard again, and the figure appears to be within 20 yards. But the radiating heat made it impossible to tell. I take off, run past the figure. It tears my favorite maiden shirt right off of me. Keep running. Don't stop. Ran past a giant rock. Ran for probably another mile on adrenaline. See guy on quad. Wave him down. Try to tell him what happened. He has no idea what I'm talking about. Offers me a lift to Will. He calls his friend with a jeep to pull out the explorer. Still freaking out. Fetal position. Can't handle it. Guy with jeep shows up. Drive right by where the figure was standing when I ran past it. It's gone. No trace. Get Will's car out. Thank them for helping us. Head back towards camp. Ask Will to pull over. Right by where the thing took my shirt. It's gone. No shirt. No tracks. Nothing. We finally get back to camp. Brian says we look pale. Will and I just nod. We have no idea what just happened. Evan says we should eat something. That might help. Agree. After eating... Take spotting scope out. Set up on self to overlook dry lake bed. Nothing important happening. A few fires in the distance. Dust trails from other off-roaders. But about four miles out, see a figure. It's moving slowly. Not towards us, though. Away. Don't even bring it up. Day number two. 
could not sleep at all. Stayed up, shotgun and sleeping bag. Very windy overnight. Knocked most of our stuff down. Noticed footprints around camp. Freaked out. Keep shotgun drawn while checking camp. Evan and Brian think I'm batshit insane. Look around our fire pit. It's warm. We're missing some wood. I look into it. Scraps of my maiden shirt and what I assume were animal bones are in the pit. Nope. Tell Evan and Brian to look in it. They ask why I burned my favorite shirt. I didn't. Evan says it's time to go. Now. Pack everything up. Drive away with guns out the windows. Will and I are having a breakdown. He can barely drive. Brian takes the wheel, traveling down the climb. Notice two crosses on the side of the trail. They weren't there yesterday. See humanoid leaning on a Joshua tree. Brian step on it. Creature comes out from the tree, into the middle of trail, behind us. It just stands there. And one final screech. I don't know what it was or what I saw or what. I'm too pissed scared to talk about it with Will because I don't like to talk about it and neither does he. I suppressed it immediately afterwards and it never came up until I got a reminder on my phone for the trip. I set it up to do yearly reminders, I guess. But fuck me. This kept me up at night for three weeks. I no longer wear any of my maiden shirts and I refuse to go out there ever again. I'm scared, Kay. I never want to remember this, and maybe talking about it will help, but I think I'll be sleepless for a few more weeks. Antarctica defies the third dimension. A couple of days ago, I was on a road trip with a friend getting in some good time away from my home before winter came. My friend had gotten sick and stayed at the hotel, and being bored, I visited a local pub. An older man sat down next to me and ordered a drink. He was gray and reeked of cigarettes. After a short while, he nudged me quite sharply, not making eye contact, and passed me a note written on a napkin. It was barely legible, but I could discern its untidy scrawl. I don't remember the notes word for word, so bear with me. There is something I must share. I cannot speak about it nor make eye contact with you or look at what I'm writing. I have been bugged. I'm being watched. They have microphones implanted in me, and they may have my eyes too. Will you listen? Do not write back. Just tap your foot against the bar thrice for yes. I've always been interested in the stories of people that I've met on the road, and the older they are, the more exciting the tales are to me. It's information from bygone times, aging folk, stories that are unique and may only be uttered once. Of course, I was curious to why this man couldn't tell me aloud. I tapped my foot against the bar three times. He readjusted himself uncomfortably and sighed deeply. He made small talk with the bartender, watched athletes play ball on the television, but the whole time wrote hastily on a napkin off to the side, out of his line of sight. A couple moments later, he passed me another note. Put these napkins tightly in your pocket and burn every note I hand to you when you leave. This is absolutely necessary for the safety of you, me, and my family. But the world has to know. I beg of you. I was a pilot for 40 years. I drove private planes and commercial airliners, air cargo. The sky was freedom. So many flights were a new perspective of that tiny earth we live on. Curiosity always made me wonder what I would find over the edge of every horizon. I saved up enough money over my career to start my own expedition. I was barely finished when he slid another note over the bar. You know of Antarctica, a source of conspiracy and mystery over the ages. Atlantis, Flat Earth, Nazis, you name it. I loved adventure stories, and a child grew in my heart. I wanted to explore and see for myself. Three years ago, I set off with a small crew of three, myself included. We wanted to learn the truth of the great continent below. Truth be told, I was astonished and immediately skeptical of the fellow. Hearing about Flat Earth and Nazis in the same sentence anywhere outside of 4chan, 
I must be an outlet of amusement for some bored old man. He slid me another note, a cigarette, and a lighter. Bear with me. I'm old, and my hand hurts from writing. Go out and burn the notes you have. You don't have to smoke, but don't look suspicious. The cigarette was clearly rolled by the man with his own papers and tobacco. I was nervous to take a strange cigarette from a strange man, but complied to his instructions. I went out into the alley and quickly burned the napkins, stamping out the embers and flicking the cigarette into the dumpster. When I returned, the old man wasn't there. A pang of irritation and suspicion hit me at once. He had most likely gotten bored of his prank and left. I sat down and ordered another drink, numbing myself for the long walk in the cold back to the hotel. I was almost done and preparing to leave when the old man returned, chuckling. He spoke his first words to me. His eyes were watery and a stark sharp brown and seemed distant. Your guts sure don't work the same when you're older, pal. Doesn't help that every bar you go to, the toilet paper is almost as thin as the shit friends make their houses out of. He focused on the television and sat down, while simultaneously taking another napkin from his pocket and handing it to me. It was somewhat disgusting taking a piece of paper from somebody who had just gotten done taking a shit and still reeked of it, but curiosity still got the better of me. So, our crew had circumnavigated Antarctica. We had been questioned by people on the ground for the purpose of our flight. We got off as sightseers, aerial photographers, and there were zones we were told to avoid due to military sites. I personally was curious if it really was an ice wall that encircled the globe, but the math was all there, even concerning the massive no-fly zones set by various governments. It was no different than flying around the northern ice cap, and thank God it was so because we didn't have the fuel for anything more. It wasn't another year until we could plan a flight to pierce the interior, avoiding civilization, bases, and military outposts. It required that one of the crew would deposit a fuel cache weeks in advance. It was tedious. We went out for our final flight in the middle of the Antarctic summer. Conditions were ideal, clear, it couldn't be better. Most of our cargo was fuel, we ate just enough to keep ourselves thinking straight. Our friend had backed out, the one who had made the fuel stash. He said the interior frightened him. It was too barren and remote. It felt like he wasn't supposed to be there, he said. It was just me and my brother. The fuel stash was 300 miles inland. More than enough to make it out, deposit, and fly back in a small plane. He gave us the coordinates and cut contact. When I looked up, the old man had buried his face in his hands. He ordered another drink. It was nearly 20 minutes before he handed another message. Due to our friend's endeavor, it gave us enough to top off our tank after 300 miles and supply another 200 miles of fuel, giving us a range of over 1,500 miles, more than enough to cross the continent, with the South Pole only 850 miles inland. The flight in was eerie. It was deathly still. Rock and ice. As the miles clicked on, a sense of dread grew upon us. It was like purgatory, the icy sky above and white earth below. He was scrawling furiously at this point and slid me another quickly. As we approached the pole, our instruments started going haywire. The compass went berserk. The GPS was completely useless and we had to guess our altitude roughly with my 40 years of flying. We only knew our position due to mathematics. We were past the South Pole, but what lay before our eyes was not what was depicted on any map of the Antarctic continent. We did not plan for a safe return, it occurred to me then. We had planned if we could indeed cross the continent it would still require an unfueled landing and rescue, but we did not compensate for this. The Central Antarctican geography marks for the highest plateau on Earth, higher than the Himalayas, 
but after we met this mountain ridge, the land ascended steadily. There was no longer snow, but the land was still choked with ice and had the appearance of a glacier more than an ice sheet. At this time, the man stared into his drink. He wasn't done, I knew this, but I could see him shake. My heart hammered in excitement I could barely contain. I wanted to grab him and have him spout his truths onto me, for I couldn't bear the suspense much longer. It was nerve-wracking and exciting. The ground just kept going down and down. The elevation didn't make sense. We had been hailed on the radio for about 50 miles from the South Pole, but I had switched it off. I didn't want to be interrupted. This was my fate. 250 miles after the supposed South Pole, the ground was below sea level according to my calculations. The ice was turning a murky reddish brown, like an old scab that had been picked and bled. I could see his hand struggling with pain and tightness, but he continued to write, almost mechanically. It was nearly 300 miles past the South Pole when the planes showed up. They fired their guns and strafed close in warning. They were stealth fighters, and our slow-moving civilian plane was nothing for them. I turned the radio back on. Turn back immediately. You will be detained upon landing. If you cannot land safely, you will be shot down. We complied. They forced us to land after about 100 miles of retreat, where the ice was relatively normal. When the planes had cut us off, I could see on the horizon the ice was so dark, it had become black, and glossy, jagged shapes rose from the ice. They reminded me of teeth. His notes had become highly illegible at this point, but I could infer what he had written. We waited in the plane for over an hour after we had landed, while one of the jets circled overhead. A large cargo plane descended from the sky, and we were forced out of the cockpit by gunpoint and made to kneel in the ice. It was cold in the plane, but on the ground, it was far below freezing. My eyes became fogged and irritated, and my breath froze on my beard. I did not close my eyes, for I feared they would be frozen shut. Men in thick, heavy suits with covered faces dragged me and my brother out under open sky. They shot my brother without question and beat me. Then, they questioned me. They sounded like Americans. They cut my coat open with a knife, opened my skin and face and fingers. They gained it was personal curiosity and not a mission from some foreign government. I begged them to not kill me. They detained me for over a year, in complete isolation. He was crying silently at this point. He struggled to write, but quickly handed me another. This is the last one I can write. I was told to never speak of this to anyone, that they would monitor me and follow me. They told me nothing. They made me think that what I saw was a dream, that it wasn't real. They told me we landed on the ice and became stranded, that I killed my brother who asked for help on the radio. But I know it was all real. I still remember the black teeth, the red ice, the blood and my brother, the beating and torture. I don't know why they let me go. They should have killed me. Burn these, please. I love my family, but I cannot bear to be silent. I burned the notes as he asked, in the bathroom this time. I was shaking. I couldn't help but believe what he had told me. He was gone when I returned, his drink still half empty. I have been refraining from posting this for some time, even back in the older days of Antarctica on X and Pole several years ago. I figure now is a good time as any. I stopped myself from posting because I feared gang stalking or being traced, if there was any truth to what I'm about to post. Now, I just think fuck it. This post will most likely go unnoticed anyways, and gang stalking is just an irrational fear for myself. My knowledge of Antarctica comes from my best friend of 50 years now. Though we grew up together, 
we grew up in very different conditions. He was part of the rich family who owned one of the largest factories in my hometown. I was the opposite, just a naive kid playing around town when we first met. We were best friends then, and I still consider him my best friend now, despite him traveling around the world and going to Princeton and doing whatever he wanted. The point is, he is a 31st Mason and has lived a life way beyond I can imagine. Despite all of this, he always comes to visit, sometimes several times a year, sometimes not for years. But when he does, we usually get smashed and trashed, hookers, blow, even he brought me DMT and other crazy shit. Okay, enough backstory. Time for the goods. This comes from him. His story hasn't changed, though he only told me this roughly five years ago, and told me shit would be happening in less than a decade. This starts with a religion. And at first, I rolled my eyes. But as he talked more, it sent shivers up and down my spine. So the Masons have been in charge of controlling and releasing information to the public at reasonable levels. That is what he told me the majority of his Masonic duty entails. And the first piece of media they altered was the Bible. A major part of the Bible was cut out from the revelations, revealing where the Antichrist and the beast would emerge from. He said the section they cut out was the most important. So the revelations stated that the last Antichrist would be the total opposite of Jesus, spreading disease from an old age which turned most humans into zombies, or some weird shit he'd said. Anyways, he said this Antichrist was trapped in a frozen wasteland with magnificent buildings and was being held by kilometers of ice. He doesn't know exactly if this is an individual. Even the Masons think it is a virus of some sort. The Bible didn't specifically state, but he said this is where the saying comes from, when hell freezes over. Hell it is already frozen over. Once hell is defrozen, then real hell will be unleashed. He told me these temples in Antarctica have been explored by a group of people in control in the government. The same group is doing crowd control methods all around the world, have been digging, hoping to find this antichrist buried in Antarctica because some believe it is the key to immortality. For another small section of the Bible did refer to the everlasting life or Garden of Eden being hidden right beside this Antichrist. And in order to bring about the last days, it had to happen anyways. So, teams have been digging, blowing up shit, covering up and stopping visits. Though he said you can visit the outside portions of Antarctica, only those who know will ever get to see those temples. And constantly destroying any information leaked from this expedition. He told me, Several years ago, some Russian thought he found a portion of the immortality and injected himself with an ancient virus they discovered in a vial in one of the temples. He even cringed when telling this story and said the guy instantly turned blue and froze over. Everyone ran out, and when they returned, his body was gone. Now, they only work in those giant radioactive suits. He said they had to replace him with a body double to avoid drawing notice or some shit in his real life. He went into great detail about how big and complicated those temples expand across the entire continent, and he calls it a big giant city. He said from one temple where you enter, there are hundreds of rooms, hallways, traps, all types of symbols and shit on the walls, large books of ancient texts no one can read, vials upon vials of random liquids, which they can't even remotely identify but he said most contain living organisms in these vials, and they're protected behind large traps, shit from Indiana Jones. He said they've already lost over 500 people exploring, and now they're using robots, but shit is so complicated you have to move blocks to open doors, solve riddles. I don't know, he said it's truly a giant mousetrap. There are keys and legends on the walls, and a single room can contain up to 100 different keys for solving to open up a trap. It's crazy shit, and they have the smartest people working on it. And they send in third world people to go open the doors when they think they solved it. It's shit that I still don't know what to make of. So some other stuff he told me. Most movies and books are representing what they think will happen when it's discovered. 
like Transformers with a frozen bot, forget his name. All these zombie movies and all the other shit in the media. I'm not sure if you guys care. Essentially, I have crazy stories from them all of these years. A lot of examples I forget because of our drunken binges. But this is the gist of it. Don't know if it confirms anything for you guys, but it's my two cents. And just for you, Anon, I will type out everything I know. He said Game of Thrones, one of the only shows I watched, so I can relate to what he said, shows what they think will happen when they discover this Antichrist. They aren't sure it is, but the White Walkers are meant to get normies ready to fight against a possible zombie outbreak. And why they think it is soon, a quote he kept repeating from the Bible was, After the War of Wars, and after the Winter of Winters, is when everything would happen. He thinks the War of Wars was from World War II up until now. Non-stop fighting across the Earth. And the Winter of Winter refers to the ice of Antarctica decreasing and opening up parts of island still frozen. Another crazy fact he said they know is there will be Jesus or Christ right beside the Antichrist. And you will get to choose when it's first discovered. He thinks it'll be two vials beside each other, and you'll have to drink one. After the Russian, they put in a ban from ingesting any shit from these temples to prevent anything from happening. It's truly a clusterfuck of arguments because everyone wants to be the first to keep discovering. But they are in disagreement of what to do with all these random vials they keep finding. He said each other has random living organisms inside of it, and it's bacteria and viruses we have never seen before. Shit which makes apples rot in minutes, and monkeys explode diarrhea and shaking to death, but the coolest thing, the coolest thing he said, was there is a frozen giant skeleton in golden armor in one of the temples. It's holding the skull of a giant reptile. The giant looks to be over 30 feet tall, and the reptile's head is roughly the size of a van. It's incredible to see, and unbelievable. He mentioned some Jewish show on TV called The 100. I haven't seen it. But he said the leader takes a chip or drinks something which gives them the recollection of all the knowledge previously and lets them control the others with their minds. That is what they think is in the immortality vial. So the media and shit they keep releasing is just them theorizing everything and making entertainment of it. It's funny because it's the truth in a way he said and the public just eats it up. On a long binge, he did tell me everything that found so far. It must have been hours he was talking, and lots of shit just went through me because it was so unbelievable. Aside from the traps, the walls are covered in symbols and images, shit which has supposedly happened, shit which hasn't happened, and shit just no one knows what to think about. He said these images, though drawn in some ink, which looks like it's printed on a piece of paper, has predicted many events recently and the Illuminati card game, but this piece of 4chan I do enjoy threads about, were actually pictures on the walls of these temples. He said they looked so lifelike. Even though being drawn, they had to release them in a game because these events were coming true over time. And they keep coming true, which is scary and crazy. For them, it's just another piece of media which flies over the heads of the population. But for them, it's a giant timeline. He said there's tons of shit hidden in media, which they can find and subtly hide. But it doesn't matter to anyone because we just keep consuming shit and not caring. Nor would we care unless we saw it in real life. I was amazed when he mentioned this game because I actually own it and took it out and we played for hours. He explained a shit ton of cards which happened and cards which they think will be happening soon. He said each and every card is a picture from the wall, and nothing's made up. So, which are the ones that he thinks are going to happen next? They aren't sure, but they constantly hide these hints in TV. Even for them, it's like a giant mess of information they are constantly working on. He said the pictures are one thing, but there are hundreds of books and scripts which contain shit no one understands. He educated me on the Voynich Manuscript. It's one of the books which they found and made its way into the public. No one knows what it means or anything, but they think it was ancient methods for making medicine or other stuff no one actually knows. He mentioned like 9-11 was in a temple several times, 
and they did attempt to prevent it, but somehow, there was a group in the government which made it happen because of interests. They even hinted on The Simpsons and several other shows. It was coming. But the public can't make connections or believe anything. He says the more shit they release, the less likely the majority of the population believes. Instead, they focus on working, shitting, eating, and making money. It's nothing but entertainment. This is what he said. He said there is a connection between how much shit from the temples they put into the media, the more likely it is to be successful. Even the symbols, which are littered across all media, Illuminati symbols, comes from these temples and other temples from the world. But in these temples, they appear hundreds of times in random order, like a language. So they just throw it out into the media and we buy it up. Not even they know what they truly mean, but they just keep filling our media with it, and we just keep consuming it. They have no idea whether these stories happened or will be happening either. There is no order in how they appear in the temples. It's all scattered, so they're scared that there are beasts hidden deep down in the temples. Another interesting thing he said was, you cannot look through the walls. So normally they could use imaging and radar and other technologies to map out temples. These ones just appear as one giant black blimp with all technology that they attempt to use. They are literally mice in a mousetrap, making their way through this maze, piecing together lots of info, and hoping to get lucky. The amazing part, he said, of the temple is how complicated it is constructed. From the 500 people who died, 400 are still missing. So the puzzles and shit you do to open doors actually open up traps where you fall into or something. And those 400 have disappeared into the temple somewhere, and not a single one has been found yet. They fear they have become infected with a zombie virus. For there are symbols showing death all over the temple. But they fear once they reach a certain level, they will find all of those lost in a weird state, dead or infected or something. Also, there is no noise in the temple. When you talk, it's a very flat tone, and there is no outside noises. It's like a dead silence which makes it really fucking scary to work in. Most of those who are deciphering will not enter the temples under any circumstances. That's why they send the third worlders to go in and try to open shit up. He said all the most important stuff has been removed. They kept the fluff which keeps people calm and going to church. Everything in the Bible is true, with many parts missing. He actually mentioned that Noah's Ark was based on Antarctica, and they expect to find some evidence of it once the snow melts. A part he mentioned was that the Antichrist was at war with God, and that is why he got frozen. But he said God isn't what he think he is. He's not a man, but a living organism, capable of hive mind-like thoughts, which can see the future. So, God... The spirit mind hive warned Noah of the flood ice age coming, but didn't warn the Antichrist. I don't know because it went over my head as he was talking, but he said these two have been at war for a long time, and humans are just the vessels which they use. That is why Christ and the Antichrist will be located near each other. He said the Matrix told the story as the blue pill and the red pill. One will be the Antichrist and bring about the death the other will be life, though he admitted they have zero clues as to which is which and where they are in the temples. There is a giant power struggle in those working on the temples because many are offering to be test dummies, thinking they will get immortality, but many are scared of what will come about. OP, I am the foremost expert on the subject. My father was stationed in Antarctica at McMurdo Station. He's told me things. Y'all want to hear some fucked up shit? I'm using a name because it's easier for me to keep track of this shit. Some background. My dad is a doctor, was stationed at McMurdo for 11 months in the 90s. Not saying what year because he was the only doc there, and y'all could track me down. Frequently went out on scientific expeditions. First and foremost, there were some areas people just didn't go to, 
they weren't environmentally hazardous. They were just avoided for one reason or another. When my dad asked one of the researchers who had been there for 10 years, he went pale and told him to shut up. It was about 30 miles south, 10 east, of McMurdo. They took a five mile detour around whatever the hell was there. So already, things are adding up. There were little outposts here and there. Think a metal tube sticking out of the ground with a hatch in the side. They were supposedly emergency and climate weather shelters. But the walls were to the thing, and they were always locked. Secondly, was a weird structure. My dad said one time they were crusting a hill near the spot they avoided, and a gray building with a white roof was in the distance, and that it didn't look like the normal shelters they used, but almost like an office building. Also, sorry about spelling and shit. Think faster than I can type, and I want to get this out there. Thirdly, there were the Striders. Big fucking five-legged things that crawled across the continent at night or in snowstorms. There were sightings from the military personnel there. Most of McMurdo is US Navy. My dad had a Polaroid of one of the footsteps in a track from one of the Dakers they had, and it was easily a foot deep into the snow that was already packed down from a 10-ton truck. Also, here's what the normal shelters look like. Big fucking five-legged things. How big? Does the thing from the pick resemble it? Like, Strider from Half-Life big, as far as they know. Footsteps at least 30 to 40 feet apart. And now, if you have ever played Pathways into Darkness, one of the enemies resembles it. But only just think pick related, but white slash gray. Seven to eight stories tall and five legs instead of two. Agreed, it sounds stupid, but what? A fast-growing, possibly supernatural apex cryptid with a white spindly body that only moves in low visibility. I'm only parroting what I heard. I would say it is maybe 20 to 30 feet tall, but I wasn't there. My dad's theory is that while taking boar ice samples, we found something. Dug it up and one or more escaped. They grew into what roams Antarctica, and we shut down the continent because of it. Seven stories. Fucking hell they're big guys. How come no one has made it public about them, or any photo? Also, be careful with your wishes, Anon. Might be the Striders are there to watch after worse things. Do continue. KK, my guy. So, as I said, my dad was a doctor, got yelled at by a superior officer, who said they didn't need none of you unwanted smart types around here. Guy was a prick and hated anyone who wasn't a grunt or a researcher. Let leak to my dad that he was replacement for a doc who had snooped around. Tried to scare my dad and shit. Guy was a total douche. One day, a guy who my dad knows for a fact isn't at McMurdo or any of the nearby bases comes in, escorted, with severe lacerations. He is told that the guy fell. My dad calls bullshit. The cuts were too clean to be ice or rocks. Plus, no debris left in wound. Guy's delirious and while he's under anesthesia, starts talking about things he probably shouldn't be saying. Something about, we let them loose. And, they were frozen. We thought they were dead. He starts to say something else, but the guards yell at him to shut the fuck up and gag him. That's right. They gagged a guy who is only getting oxygen from a mask. My dad flips and rips it off, yelling at them and asking what the fuck they were doing. The guard sticks his M16 in my dad's face, forces him back to his quarters, and doesn't let him out till the dude is patched up and waiting on the next plane from South America. Oh yeah, but after that, he started taking notes of stuff. He had an Apple IIe he used for flight sims, and he started keeping track of information he gathered. Said he hasn't looked at it in years. I'm going to try and get it out and running and see what I can find on it. Till then, not much else I know about what went on. He said he saw the Striders a few times in the winter, but kinda hard to prove. Says he's forgotten a lot about those days. If I can find the computer 
I can get more stories. Other than that, not much else. One time, they hit something with the dagger, which was a pretty big deal since there aren't many penguins in the Antarctic. And when they got out, the researcher who told my dad to shut up forced him back into the car. Dad said it looked like one of the things from the Cloverfield movie, but, you know, all fucking crushed to bits. So spindly little legs and the like. Says he thinks it was buried under the surface level of snow, which is why they didn't see it. Snowstorms are a hell of a lot worse than people make them out to be. As I said, that's when people see the Striders. But there is banging on the doors, windows, walls, everything. Dad said he thought he saw one of those small things hit his window and bounce off once while he was playing an FA slash 18 sim. My bad. It was an 11SI, not 11E. I would say that with both the fact that they ran one over in summer and that they are most active in winter, it's very likely that these things like extreme, extreme cold. I have a hell of a lot more documents with my dad's name I could take photos of, but a quick Google reverse image will show that it is original in many ways. I'm going to see if I can get the 2SI to run. Give me a few guys. I'm going to take a picture and censor the name of the plaque my dad got from being stationed at McMurdo. We'll have the whole X and the date thing in it to prove I ain't lying. As promised. And proof he was at McMurdo. I can't get it running tonight. I'm honestly really tired and I have work tomorrow morning. But my dad literally just woke up and I asked him and he told me something he didn't already tell me. So, people die in Antarctica. It happens. It's cold and accidents happen. Every time someone died during the winter snowstorms though, he had to wait for them to thaw and sew them back together. Similar wounds from the person who dipped in the summer. Except one man, another he didn't know, who was missing his lower half. This guy was carted in by similar guards, but not the same. His intestines had spilled out, and my dad had to sew on fake clothes on the lower half after sealing up this guy's torso. They then dressed him up in battle dress. The official cause of death is hypothermia, but we both know that's bullshit. His lower abdomen from the end of the ribcage down had been ripped off violently. There's shit out there, Anans. You better fucking believe it. So I asked him a few more questions about injuries and he said a lot of lost limbs from frostbite. A few cuts here or there. Those two were the only two that stuck out to him. There were a lot of lacerations on people who did stuff outside in the winter, and the only ones allowed out were a certain group of Arctic warfare soldiers and the researchers. He said talking about all of this has gotten his memory going. Said he grabbed one of the researchers' journals one time and it had all kinds of diagrams of shit that didn't look anything like any animal there that was supposed to be out there. This is where he got his descriptions for the striders and the spiders. He cornered one of the researchers once and questioned her. She got really stiff and refused to tell him anything, and he later got a talking to from a CO about how useless he was and shit, and how if there was another incident, they were sending him back stateside. He ignored this though, and when his CO was away, he looked through his files. This guy patrolled the whole base at the time, found documents regarding certain operations during the winter months, and that there were requisitions for ammo. He got caught though, and this is what led him to being kicked back to the States. He got court-martialed, but because he never signed an NDA, and he never found anything bad, they just docked his pay and sent him on his way. Other people's stories. Once they told my dad he was being shipped out, despite the fact that it was a day he was supposed to leave, he stopped caring what people thought and started gathering stories from everyone he could. Most of it was, I saw this or I saw that, but nothing he could really work with. Then came in Jones, not real name. Jones was one of the Arctic warfare specialists. Green Beret. The guy was autistic, strong as fuck, and smart as hell. 
only got through all the training because he could hide himself. And while being regarded, could do a lot other members of his team couldn't do. But the one thing Jones had that the others didn't was a conscience. Jones felt bad for what he did, and my dad had an undergrad degree in psychology. They had an agreement. Jones hurts himself to get sent to my dad. My dad helps Jones get stuff off his chest. Everyone is happy. His buddies don't know he's going to a shrink. He gets to feel good, and the CEO gets to have a functioning soldier. One time, Jones wakes my dad up about three days before my dad is supposed to ship out. It's two in the morning. Jones just came back from some mission. Says he needs to talk to my dad. My dad tells him to fuck off, not this early. And Jones puts something on my dad's chest. It's the leg of one of these small things. My dad freaks and Jones puts a hand over his mouth and tells my dad a story. This is where it all comes together. Anans, clench your ass. No bathroom breaks until the ride has stopped. Some of you may say this story sounds like a story with supporting information leading to a climax. Fuck you. Gotta make it sound good for YouTube, eh? Jones proceeds to tell my father the most fucking incredible story I have ever heard. It confirms many theories on 4chan and IRL. And it proves American collision with China's human trafficking. And it confirms the reason for tunnel warfare training U.S. Marines recently undertook. Y'all ready? Jones gets woken up at 5 in the morning the previous day by a squad leader. Let's call him Jack. Jack tells him to get his ass up. To clarify, these are SFOAD with a total of 12 men in the squad. And that they're going somewhere. Jones expects an expedition with some researchers, but they don't go to the military Dakar. With a hole up top for a gun turret, they have an M134 minigun inside the truck because it's technically demilitarized, but not really, and load up their gear. They leave and make a beeline for the area everyone avoids. My dad figured this out when he said the heading was southeast. They get to this office building and it looks sort of like pick related according to father's recollection. And they drove up to it. They park out front, operate their way inside, and it's fucking carnage. Think government lab in season two of Stranger Things. It's just fucking nuts. They clear a few rooms when one of their guys gets murked by one of these tiny fuckers. They light it up and keep going. There are offices with names on them. Some American, some Chinese, some Chilean. There are bodies everywhere. It's crazy, right? So, two more guys get injured and they're moved outside to the truck. The rest of them move downstairs to the tunnels. It's a secret lab. And it is gigantic. They have a strider and a cage. It's that fucking big. Or, at least, they used to. Many of the cages are broken open and there are dead bodies everywhere. Jones doesn't say much about this stuff other than that there are tunnels with bullet trains in them, with destinations like Hong Kong, New York, and Melbourne, a city for every major country out there. They find a cage that has been ripped into with two spiders in it. They are eating children. In Antarctica, there are children, shouldn't be fucking possible. It's been known for a while that China plays a part in its huge amount of human trafficking. Now we know where the bodies go. They found a few scientists and moved them to a different base. Exterminate most of the fuckers in there and move out. It took them almost 18 hours of pure fighting to clear that place out. So guys, I guess we know what's really going on. And I'm very, very grateful to get all of this out here. Honestly, my dad would kill me if he knew I have shared this information, but honestly, I'm sick and fucking tired. I remember a time where I didn't know, where I grasped at straws for an answer to questions I could barely understand. Here it is, X. Here are your answers. I'm back, friends, and I got news. As I said, this Anana always delivers. 
Yesterday, I said 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern, and on my clock, it's 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern. I can't find the last thread I was in. It was sometime around midnight last night that I joined it. Ready to get up to date. So, the hard drive died a while ago, and my dad replaced it with a micro SD. Had to lie to get him to open the case, so no paper with name, but compare the desk, and it's the same. Apple II SI hard drives didn't last long enough to be able to get the information off of them. They are a 30-year-old computer. Apparently, my dad replaced a hard drive with a Scootsy to micro SD card, and the drive is long gone. Convenient? Yes. Disappointing? Also yes. But I'd rather come back and tell you than ghost and be regarded as a shill. It's entirely possible he held onto it. He holds onto everything. So, I would have to go through boxes and boxes of old electronics to find that 40 megabyte hard drive that came with it. I'll go look and send a pic of what I would have to work with. Gentlemen, I found two Apple hard drives from the 90s. Here they are. Wanted to update before I got the upload off my phone. Photo of the backs off. Copyright 1988 on the chip for both of them. I'm going to take the one with the Apple sticker on it apart and see if I can find why it broke. Yeah, guys, I can't get info out of the drive without professional help. I'll go to a data recovery guy and get it out for you. I'm in too deep for this now. Why are you taking apart hard drives? Holy shit, stop. What the fuck are you doing? I was debating if I should post this story, but after a few weeks of nothing happening, I decided to say fuck it and post it. So first, some context. I work as a ranger in the Barganzinski State Natural Reservoir, near the Lake Baikal. Over the past years, I've come to find out that Lake Baikal is a very fucked place. So, here's a few of my experiences. I'll start off with a few oddities. Aside from the usual ice rings, bike hauls in, vehicles, animals, people stuck in ice, there are oddities like unknown ships appearing on foggy days. I remember spotting a few unidentified ships in my time, and I've heard stories of really old looking ships appearing in the fog. Another creepy thing that happens is dead animals washing up. Now that's nothing out of the ordinary, but some of the animals wash up completely hollow. Anything from fish, to birds, to even seals. Speaking of washed up animals, sometimes people stumble across the corpse of a golem yonka. Pick is what the fish looks like, so you can't blame people for being scared shitless when they see one. So, onto the interesting green text worthy stuff. Be me. Be around 9 or 10. Me and friends go hang out. It's the winter. During the winter, Lake Baikal freezes up completely, so me and my friends are walking on the ice. We're hanging out and some of my friends call us to him. He's crouched and is staring at the ice. He points and tells us to look. Two prints are pushing against the ice. They look like suckers, but with fingers. They start moving, so we follow. Part 2. We keep following until we hear a crack. Most late by call is pretty safe to walk on, but it's better to be safe than sorry, so we stop. The prints keep going. Then, the ice cracks open. Two massive limbs come out of the ice. They suck onto the ice, and a creature rises up from the water. This thing looked like a cross between a lobster and a mosquito. Thing only walked on two legs. It was like three or four fucking meters tall. As soon as we see it, we run like hell. Slip on ice like a retard. Friends abandon me. Thanks. Think I'm dead. Thing just walks by and keeps going. I come back home bawling my eyes out. Try to explain, but can't. Parents slap me and tell me not to go on a frozen lake without supervision. People commonly report seeing something similar in the north of the Baikal. Dark color, two legs, straw mouth station. I think I've gotten around seven similar reports. On watch duty, I might have seen it on a few occasions, but it was always too far to really make out. 
first creepy thing that happened on the job. Boat goes missing. It shows up like a week later. We go to investigate. The boat is completely empty. So we dock it while the search party looks for survivors. So, I'm hanging out. Guy watching over the boat calls out through the radio. Uh, there's an intruder on the boat. We go check on it. There's a dude with a hat just hanging out on the boat. Guy's really weird, though. It's like he isn't even fully solid. Coworker tries to get near the guy. The dude fucking splits apart into a few pieces, and they all jump into the water. Big what-the-fuck moment. Part 3. In the past 20 years, there have been these two strange cases. In 2001 and 2013, bodies were found washed up with very strange markings. Their blood vessels were very dark, their eyes were grayed out, and their muscles were very tensed up. In the first case, forensics came back telling us it was just drowning and exposure. Second time, we struggled to even contact them. Eventually, they came back with the same result, drowning and exposure. Thing is though, these people were incredibly experienced in their field. Another thing was that the second guy was reported missing two weeks before we found him, yet his body was in prime condition. So about two months ago, we get a report of a washed up body. We came to check on him. It was an old person who hit his head somehow and drowned. His skin was pale and his vessels stood out. I could tell he didn't die like the other two, but the look of him reminded me of those two. Just a preface. He did not die the same way as those two. Clear differences were signs of decomposition, his body being relaxed, and his eyes having color. I brought up the similarity to my coworker. He didn't know about it, so I promised to tell him later. We met up at a local cafe afterwards. We were talking about the cases. Then, we got interrupted by this old dude. We'll call him Steig. For the longest time, I assumed he was just some schizo. Dude is very dirty, mutters to himself, has no friends or family, spends most of his time on the shore taking notes. He's not violent, but most people consider him a nuisance. So he intervenes and instantly asks if their eyes were gray. I tell him, yes. Saik jumps in excitement. This gets awkward, so we get ready to leave. Saik chases after us and asks if they were decomposing. Now... I'm intrigued, so I give him the benefit of the doubt and tell him to go off. Steik then starts to lay it out. Part 4. I relay his words and bullet points. The thing that is responsible for these two deaths is called a crawling jellyfish. It can filter oxygen both from air and water. Its tentacles produce an adhesive which let it crawl on land. It also produces an insanely strong poison. It works by completely destroying blood cells, and the slightest concentration of it can have disastrous effects on the body. The poison this jelly uses is 84% pure. The effect of the poison darkens the blood and destroys the pigmentation of the eyes. It also works as an amazing antibiotic, which can preserve the body for more than a month. The chemical reaction between the poison and water tenses up the muscles, and they are exclusive to the lake by call. They used to be a huge problem during the first half of the 20th century. Post-World War II, the government decided to use cyanide to kill off their populations. They poisoned the water supply, but it was covered up. He predicts their current population to be at the double digits. After this, I'm a bit taken aback. While Stajic was going off, Some guy tells him to shut up and fuck off. Steik leaves, but I'm really interested if he's got more to share. Part 5 After a week, I kind of forgot about the whole ordeal. Then, I spotted Steik taking notes while on my patrol. I approached him and asked what's up. Dude almost jumped out of his skin when I did so. I asked, is everything okay? He told me, yeah, with a shaky voice. Then, I asked him about the dude that kicked him out the other day. Tells me that it's nothing. 
So I ask if he can tell me more about that jellyfish. He apologizes and tells me he has to leave. I think to myself, how can a fucking hobo be busy? I start following him around and try to get him to talk. Steik just gives me the silent treatment. Keep following him for 30 minutes. Have to stop, cause job. After work, decide to go ask around about Steik. Nobody really knows much about him. He's always just been a part of life. No one really knows when, where, or how he got here. He's just always been here. Decide to ask the dude from the cafe about Steik. You shouldn't hang around with that guy, Anon. He's probably unhinged. Asked why he kicked him out. The guy smells like shit, Anon. True. So, in my travels, I found out only one thing. The guy fucking loves chess. Damn good, too. Sometimes, he challenges the other old folk. Next day, buy a chessboard and wait in the park in the after hours. Bait worked perfectly. Steig comes out of the bushes, beer can in hand, and asks for a game. Try to get him to chat. Fucker is really focused on the game, though. I'm shit and get beat in like three moves. He comes back for a rematch a few days later. Came up with the idea to give him something stronger. Russian standard. Works like a charm. Part 6. He talks about how bad the pollution in the Baikal is, and so on. Ask him how does he know so much. Oh, I was a biologist. Elaborate. Did research on the lake for almost 30 years. What happened then? Quit. Why? Didn't have a choice. How come? He looks at me. Hey, Anon, you want to see something cool? Uh... Come on, I'll show you something that'll blow you away. Agree. Don't want to get raped in some crack den, so get knife just in case. You know, Anon, you're a good kid. I'm in my 30s. Who cares? You're still young. That's why you have to see what I have. Okay. He gets to his makeshift home. Inside is a fucking VCR and two tapes. They're labeled blah 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 1988, 1 and 2. What is this? Cool, eh? You kids probably never seen it before. Ask him if he's got a TV from the period. No. For fuck's sakes, I have to get an adapter. No local stores have one, so I have to ship it. Fucker cost a leg and an arm. After four days, it's finally here. When I get to Styx shack, he's not happy. Tells me that I used him. We get into a heated argument. Eventually, he breaks. For God's sake, fine. If you want to watch them so bad, then let's go already. Told him that he's not going to get near my apartment without a shower. Eventually, he convinced me to let him use mine. After him, the shower, no joke became a fucking gas chamber. So, we finally hook up the VCR. It's insane how much care he put into maintaining it. We boot up the first tape. It's two hours long. Around a third of it is just inside of a sub, with nothing happening. Part 7. While this is happening, I ask Stayek to explain how and why he has these. Here's what he's told. Turns out, Stayek was an important researcher during the Soviet era. The reason for this mission happening is because while making topographical scans, the Soviet Union discovered that the lake is actually deeper than previously thought. The scans showed that past the 1600 meter bottom, the lake continues. This is because stronger sonar can penetrate the false bottom. What is the false bottom? He explained it as a layer of a dense, viscous underwater brine. Past this false bottom, the lake continues another 1,200 meters. It is located at the center of the lake. The problem is that the Lake Baikal is a freshwater lake, and such a thing should be impossible. So the mission was supposed to retrieve samples, geological data, and maybe explain the oddity. The actual video finally begins, and three men enter the sub, one of which is our man, Steig. They descend, and the tape shows the usual shit you would find in the lake. Fish, seals, etc. The weird shit starts towards the end of the first tape. Passing 900 meters, our first oddity pops up. Every creature shown in the tape was given an in-depth explanation, 
by Steig. Part 8. First thing the camera catches is a huge fucking jellyfish. And I mean massive. This fucking thing's body was about as big as a bus. The tentacles were definitely longer than a blue whale. Pick is the closest to it by looks. Steig walks up to the TV and points at its body. Its body is actually a separate ecosystem in itself. While feeding, the jellyfish filters water so well that it actually creates a separate environment inside the creature. The concentration of water in the jellyfish differs from the outside by about 6 or 7 percent. This is enough of a difference to create a completely alien environment. Its size provides a safe home for many smaller creatures. The ecosystem is so advanced that there is a food chain inside. There is a plankton that can produce energy with a very limited amount of light, which is provided by the luminance of its host. They get eaten by a shrimp-like creature, which gets eaten by an apex predator. Then the predator's waste is used to feed the plankton, and so the cycle goes on. These creatures are not only exclusive to Baikal, but the jellyfish too. The men in the submarine don't seem all that surprised about it. So, I ask Stayek how long they've known about it. Ever since the 50s, they started washing up in mass after the extermination of the crawler jellyfish. Part 9. As they go deeper, the lake bed is covered by whale bones. The thing is, Baikal isn't home to any known whale species. One of the whale skeletons begins to move. Holy shit, it's the fucking ghost fish. I remember the few reports of a massive see-through fish swimming near the ice. Here's how Steig explained it. It turns out that the bones are reanimated by a single-celled organism. This organism begins to build a colony by mooching off the minerals in these whale bones. Eventually, they construct a membrane around the skeleton which vaguely resembles a whale. The inside of this colony is filled with an acidic, sugary solution which keeps the entire organism buoyant. It then travels in the lake, its new source of food being microorganisms that it digests using the solution. Though after a long time the solution will damage the whale's bones to the point where they cannot support the construct. The organism most likely dies here, because at this stage, it can't filter water without moving. As they descend deeper, weird things keep appearing. Crabs with legs the length of cars. A giant centipede-like creature. Huge eels. Tentacled creatures that connected in rings. What I think might have been trilobites and more that I couldn't even make out. Once they go down past 1600 meters, life becomes more scarce. Eventually, they reach the false bottom. It is a massive brine pool. There is zero life around it. One or two dead fish surface from the brine periodically. Steik said they took samples of the water above the brine. Said that the only life there were a few species of extremophile bacteria, but even they were struggling to survive. Okay, so this is the part I was debating to post. Looking at what happens next fucked with my mind so hard, I had to move away. So here's a content warning. I don't know if there really needs to be one, but here it is. Read or listen at your own risk. They penetrate into the brine layer. At this point, Steig stops the tape and tells me to stop watching. I ask why, but he ignores me and goes to take the tape away. I try to stop him, but he takes the tape, and only that tape, and runs off. For a week, I ask him to let me finish it. He constantly shoots me down. My curiosity got the better of me. I knew that Steig wasn't a vigilant guy, so when he went for one of his regular walks around the shore... I went to his shack and took the tape. So, last warning. Proceed at your own risk. They descend 300 meters below the brine. Their sonar picks up something massive. They approximated it to be almost two kilometers in length. Then, it comes on screen. This fucking serpent. 
Serpent isn't even a good way to describe its shape. It just being there fucked with sonar, the cameras, and the crew. The entire crew spent like 10 minutes just screaming and raving. Its eyes stared straight into the camera. And no matter where I was, its eyes followed me. While watching, I felt this weird sensation. It's like I knew that whatever I was looking at was fucking evil. Everything about it was wrong. In time, one of the crew managed to get a grip and sent the submarine upwards. After the tape ended, I could hear it. It was this feeling in the back of my head. It was beckoning towards the lake. Toward it. Fucker didn't even speak a word, and I knew what it wanted. I couldn't take it, and I went to talk to Stike. As soon as he saw me, he punched me in the jaw. Get caught a fucking retard. He takes the tape from me and snaps over his knee. This is why I didn't want you to watch these tapes. I begged him to tell me what's going on. After he calmed down, he sat down, and he asked me a question. Here's what he told me. Back in the Cold War, the Soviets were planning to use Lake Baikal for propaganda purposes, but their scientists could never figure out why exactly this kind of diversity was exclusive to the lake. And it's not like the Americans had something to hide. If they couldn't hide the nuke, then everything else was on the table. They cross-referenced every sea, ocean, lake, river, and puddle, and found that over 60% of Lake Baikal's life was not found anywhere else. Why is that? Steik believes that it's that thing that lures life to it. For whatever reason, it attracts life to itself. Though the better question is, why is that thing there in the first place? He says because it's supposed to be a prison. Think about it. Why has the Baikal not changed in over 25 million years? Why is there a kilometer deep layer of brine in a freshwater lake? Whether it's aliens, God, or some natural phenomenon, that brine is keeping it in and everything else out. After the mission went bust, Stag decided to quit and stole the only existing footage of that mission. He tried to get a job, but since then, he was blacklisted from getting one. So, he remained here. I don't know why he chose to keep that tape, but at least it's destroyed now. Eventually, I couldn't take it. That thing fucked with my vision, my senses, and even my speech. So, I was forced to move in with my sister in Chiabinsk. It seems like proximity to the lake is what affects me. I still get nightmares and shit from time to time, but I don't know if it's some psychological thing or that thing. By any chance, did the face resemble this pic? Holy shit. That is uncannily similar. Though the face should be longer, the mouth bigger, and there shouldn't be a nose. If you did this, and combined it with the picture, and got rid of all the fins and made the body smooth, you would get an almost perfect recreation. Years ago in Cub Scouts, middle of summer, our troop plans a week-long canoe trip. On the day of the trip, our leader gets called away for some family emergency and can't come. Our sub-leaders decide it would be best if we hire a local guide to help us. They find a local hunter who knows the river that we want to go down, and he obliges. First few days are fine, and he's really nice. One evening, we make it to an islet. The shore has rocks and branches strewn all over. Further up where the woods begin, there are odd branches almost arranged in what looks to be almost structured. Guide is a bit uneasy as he's never really seen something like this before. Spent evening setting up and making a fire and playing games. Just before sunset, from the woods, we hear a terrifying screech. Almost like a howling, but more guttural. Guide grabs his rifle and tells us to put out the fire. The sound is heard again, but this time much closer. Guide tells us to get the canoes ready just in case. He wanders into the woods and silence. We all stand there on the shore trying not to be too freaked out. 
Suddenly, there's another screech, and a gunshot is heard. The leaders guide us onto the canoe and stand in the water, ready to cast off. We hear another shot. Another screech this time, more sustained. Guide comes running out of the woods and onto our boat. He yells, We can't stay here. Go, go, go. We cast off and go into the water. By this time, it's dusk, and too dark to see if anything is on the shore. Paddle for another hour till we find a place, much further down the river. Nothing really happened later in the days following, but we were definitely spooked. This is northern Ontario, and I have some family there. Years later, when I went for a visit, I recanted this story to some people, and some weren't surprised. The guide in question, while well experienced, was only 27 at the time, and didn't know the woods as well as some of the older, more senior guys. And a lot of them have stories of run-ins with whatever these were. Being watched in cabins, rocks thrown from seemingly nowhere. Sometimes, dogs mutilated after chasing these things. A lot of indigenous people tend to agree that it's probably Sasquatch, and that it's true that they can be really territorial. Some people may laugh at this notion of an ape in the woods of Canada and elsewhere, but I'm telling you my experience, and the experience of plenty others, that there is something weird in those woods. I'm a proud father of two boys. Oldest one recently turned 14. It's time I should take him hunting. We've been going out shooting almost every weekend. I'm sure he's ready for his first deer. He's excited. Go to bed early, wake up early. Grab a couple cups of coffee, let the boy have a soda. Get our gear and out we go. Drive to a remote location I've scouted out before. Sunlight burning off the morning mist. God, I love it out there. Tell him to stay close and mind his steps. Gotta be somewhat quiet. After about a quarter mile hike into the woods, I hear something. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I stop and listen. The sound stops as well. Did you hear something, Dad? He's beaming, thinking there's a buck close by. Not sure. Sounded like something heavy. Stay close. My words made him worry a little. But we're still focused on getting him that deer. Continue on our hike, carefully surveying the surrounding. I hear it again. Crunch, crunch, crunch. It's matching our stride. Turn around quick enough to see someone dip behind a tree. I pull the rifle off my shoulder. Who's there? I'm assuming it might be another hunter, but I'm cautious. A man's head peeks out behind the tree and pulls back real quick. Just barely caught a glimpse of his scraggly hair. My boy responds. Who is it? Does someone else know about your favorite spot, Dad? He's still timid at his age. Probably. Might be a homeless man, though. There could be a camp around here with a few more of them. My boy is definitely calmer than I am. Not knowing how dangerous a man or a group of people can be when you're alone in the woods. I'm now more worried about my kid's safety than getting his first kill. We should head back. This made him upset, but he seemed to understand. Oh. Alright, I guess. He definitely had some attitude, though. Too much like his mom. We walked and looped back to the car to avoid any contact with a stranger. As we're nearing the road, I hear the crunching steps again. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Then, a loud thud. I give a quick peek over my shoulder, not stopping to look. There's the head of the man I saw, laying on the forest floor next to a tree. My heart sinks into my stomach. I rush my boy along quicker. Come on, we have to get back to the car right now. I grabbed him by the back of his neck, literally pushing him as fast as I can through the trees. Ow, you're hurting me. I was in full panic mode. I didn't mean to hurt or startle him, but I didn't want him to turn around either. We make it to car, and I quickly turn around. Rifle in my hand, my eyes are darting around the tree line. As if, at any moment, whatever killed that man and used his head like a puppet would jump out. I toss the keys to my boy. Unlock the car and start it. He's now visibly frightened at how I'm reacting. Car fires up, and I hop in as quickly as I humanly could. Put the car in reverse, and I hear my boy jump. Dad! Dad, look! It's the man! My eyes lift up to the tree line. There's that man's head peeking out behind a tree. 
an arm extends out from behind it. He's waving. It's not natural movement. It's flopping around like somebody's holding it. Nope the fuck out of there. Drive home doing 80 miles per hour the entire way. I'm sweating with fear. My boy sounds like he's having a panic attack. It's alright son, we're long gone now. His eyes are wide open, glued to the road. I felt horrible for him. We made it home and I phoned the police. Told them everything. They searched the area and found nothing. Just some trash left behind by campers. No matter what they tell me, no matter how many years have passed, I will never return to those woods again. All right, X. Let me give you a story about something freaky that happened in the woods on a farm about five years ago. I was a 17-year-old farm boy. Our place was about a mile from our nearest neighborhood and 10 miles from the nearest town. My parents had taken a trip with my aunt to Vegas for a week and left me to run the place with the dogs. There had always been some weird stuff going on around the farm. Animals going missing, animals turning up torn up, weird tracks, etc. Dad and Grandpa always told me it was coyotes, but after I had gotten a bit older and they told me that there had also been sightings of bobcats and mountain lions back in the area for the first time in over 50 years, but the DNR boys would never admit to it, even with trail cam footage of them. I had been taking nightly walks for a couple of years, but never further than the big lamplight would show. One night I start walking and go away from the farm in the light. It was a full moon and there was a fresh snow on the ground. Everything was clear for miles and you could see it like it was almost daylight. And something possessed my dumb self to go out there in the middle of winter by myself. My dogs would usually come with me on little walks like this, but they were nowhere to be found. I figured they were out hunting little rodents or something, so I left without them. I walked the path along our empty cornfields and down the path that led to our pasture. It was about a quarter of a mile downhill walk. Down in this pasture there was a canyon and a creek that runs through the whole thing, from our end of the property all the way to the next county. Inside of this there is a pretty sizable forest with huge old trees all the way down. It was one of those places that was perfect to grow up near. I spent a lot of time down there throughout my life and never really had anything out of the ordinary happen. I had my headphones in and was listening to some Hammerfall, just enjoying how cool everything was and how lit up everything seemed even past the tree line. I figured me being just over six foot tall and an overly cocky weightlifter I didn't have anything to worry about out there. So stupid me went down next to the creek bed in the middle of winter, alone and unarmed. Mistake number one. I followed the creek for quite a ways until I ended up at a part of the bed where the banks and walls of this little canyon were too angled to climb up and there weren't any paths out. I stopped for a little bit and watched the moon and stars, just admiring it all. Don't think I'll ever forget how pretty everything was. About that time, I ended up turning my music off just to take it all in. I guess it wasn't cold enough for the creek to freeze all the way and Every little sound out there in this place just echoed on top of the little sounds of the running water. The whole place just made every one of my senses feel exaggerated. I stood there for about a minute or two when I started to get this horrible feeling in the pit of my gut, like the most terrible thing in the world was going to happen at any second. I looked around a bit and didn't want to freak myself out over nothing, so I gave it a short time. That was mistake number two. I should have just walked out of there. And at this point, I started to hear something moving through the snow and brush on the other side of the creek. I'm pretty sure if it had been any other time or place, I wouldn't have noticed it. It was so quiet besides that little trickle of water. And I started to look around and spotted a little bit of brush moving a few yards from the side of the creek bed. The only sounds were those exaggeratedly amped up steps causing the thin coat of ice to crack and snap along the long grass near the shore. I won't lie. Every horror story and terrible thing I've ever heard was running through my head, and I ended up just being stuck there, unable to move away while this thing continued to creep out along the bank. I hadn't even seen it, and suddenly I just had the worst fear I'd ever had in my life to this day. 
Finally this thing came out, and by God I almost soiled myself. This big black dog looking thing came crawling out near the creek on all fours. It was so big I didn't know how in God's name it had moved so quietly. It kept walking along in the open before it stuck its muzzle down in the creek and started to drink. I just stood there, glued to the spot. The whole place seemed to get darker with every second. About this time I felt the cold for the first time that night while this chill ran down my spine. Stupid me shivered. Mistake number three. I had big copper buttons on my coats and a couple of them brushed against each other. It had to be such an insignificant sound, but down there, it seemed like it hit, hit a tin roof with a hammer. This thing perked its ears up and raised its head to look at me. God, its eyes. I've never seen anything that green before. We stared each other down for a few moments and then this thing growled. At this point, I finally snapped out of it and began to back away, trying to get back out of this boxed-in space and away from this thing. And this thing started to bare its teeth and growl more aggressively. And then I kid you not, it stood up on its hind legs a bit, raising its front paws up to its sides. Only they weren't paws. They were like hands. I thought it was going crazy or something, but I kept slowly backing off, every step getting a little closer to the path leading out of the canyon and creek. But even then, I still had a long way back to the house. This thing just kept watching me like it wanted me to just back away and leave for the first few steps. Then it started walking along the other side of the creek, matching my pace, just slowly stalking me as I was making fat dookies and breathing heavily, but somehow managed not to lose my head and run. I think if I had done that, I wouldn't have made it out. Finally, I made it to the open area. Just had to get up this little hill, then make it across the pasture. And then it was only a quarter of a mile up another hill to home. I didn't turn my back on this thing and continued to back my way out and up the hill. This thing didn't seem to want to cross over the creek from the position it was at, but it kept walking. About the time I made it to the top and was looking down at this dogman thing, it had made it to a more shallow spot down at the creek bed and began to cross. At this point, I knew I had to pick up the pace. I finally turned and began to quickly walk to the pasture gate as quickly as I could. I scrambled over the gates and looked back again. It was at the top on all fours again, still watching me with those eyes and teeth. All that was between me and this thing was a barbed wire fence, a panel gate, and 20 yards. That's when I heard the best sounds I've ever heard in my life. Loud padding coming across the field. All three of my dogs were coming full speed down the hill, going insane. I looked back and this thing turned and stalked back down in the smaller hill. I figured I was in the clear and took off like a freaking rocket. I ran a quarter of a mile in nearly four inches of snow and winter gear. I passed my dogs on the way up and they didn't stop or turn to meet me. They just bolted down the way after this thing. What felt like an hour of running up this hill, I made it back to my home and almost passed out on the floor. I locked the doors and ran to grab something to defend myself. I figured that my hunting knives weren't going to cut it, so I went to the gun safe. Only guns in the house are my great-granddad's old double-barrel 20-gauge, a 22, and an old pump-action Remington 30-06 with a box of 40-year-old ammo that had a horrible jamming problem. I grabbed the shotgun and loaded two shells before shoving a couple of fistfuls into my pockets. I just sat there in the kitchen with a death grip on this gun for hours before I finally heard my dogs barking outside the house. I looked out the window under the porch and saw all three of them without a scratch. I dropped down onto my butt and cried like a baby, not sure what to think. I didn't want to go out there again and I didn't until the next morning. I stumbled out the door with the gun and looked around. My boys came up panting with their tails wagging, and I loved on them and petted them until my body was numb from the cold. I made sure that they got some hot meat that night as a thank you. I've seen this thing a few more times than this, but this was the first time. The only people who know about this are a couple of my closest friends, and it's a heck of a story. I don't live on the farm anymore at the moment, but that thing turned 
what was my little retreat into a nightmare. Be me, eight years old. Grandpa took me and my older brother camping somewhere near Sedona, Arizona. Rented a cabin, sitting on the porch one night, listening to my grandpa tell us bullshit stories about killing Nazis. Later find out my grandpa spent the war in San Diego, working on ships for the Navy, and never saw combat. Suddenly, see some white shape moving around the tree line. I have bad eyesight and was supposed to be wearing glasses, but never did. Grandpa takes us inside. He grabs his rifle from the closet, tells us to lock the door and go to sleep. He goes outside. Peek out window, see Grandpa sitting on the porch with his rifle across his lap. Can't see anything by the trees. Lay in bed and try to sleep. About an hour later, peek outside. Grandpa's gone. Freak the fuck out. Wake up, brother. He's ten. Tell him. He says we should get, quote-unquote, weapons from the tool chest. I grab a hammer. He grabs a screwdriver. Hide under blankets, clasping our weapons. An hour passes. Hear something moving on porch. Work up courage to peek. See Grandpa sitting back where he was before. Go to sleep. Wake up in the morning. Grandpa tells us to never talk about what we saw. Be in the woods with six friends. Exploring the 300 acres of my friend's grandparents' property. There's a ravine and a cave system. Friend and I decide to check it out. Friend has FAO and I have my PTR. Get maybe 50 yards in the cave and start hearing shit. Like a weird moan slash growling. It's hard to describe. Quietly start shitting pants. Press on. Make it 25 more yards. Hear what sounds like heavy bare feet slapping on stone. We freeze. Something big is coming at us. Light fucking dies. Friend doesn't have one. Can make out a silhouette. A big one. Shitting pants even harder now. Heart pounding. Start shooting in the direction of it. Friend joins in. Stop shooting to assess the situation. Pained howl slash screaming. It starts coming closer at an even faster pace. Start scrambling out of cave. Firing and running. Get out of cave and jump on quad. Nope all the way back to camp. Tell everyone else. No one believed us. That night, we heard a loud screaming slash howl. Finally believe us. Everyone on high alert all night in sleep shifts. Friend wakes everyone up. Said he heard something in the trees. Something big. Everyone up the rest of the night. Howling screams throughout the night. Sometimes maybe 20 yards from camp. Next morning, Kay friend and I go up to his grandparents' house at the other end of the property. Tell his fud grandpa what happened. He doesn't say anything and just hands us a box. It's full of dynamite. He nods and we what hard. Ask what he wants us to do. Blow it the fuck up, you retards. Seriously? Nods again. We head back to camp. Tell friends the plan. No one likes it. But we gotta do it. Head to cave entrance. Shittily set up dynamite at all three of the entrances. Start hearing the moaning slash growling. Friend and I repeat the events of yesterday. Trying to get it close to the entrance. Had friend outside light the fuse five minutes after entering the cave. Ten minute fuse time. See it and immediately start shooting. And running from it. Stopping every 20 yards to shoot back at it. It's howling loud enough to hurt my ears through ear protection. Managed to get out of cave in time. Big fucking bang. Cave entrances collapse. Get hit in the back of the head with a flying rock. And knocked unconscious. Wake up 20 minutes later back at camp. Go to ER two hours away to get checked out. Just a slight concussion. Doctor asked what happened. Uh, I fell. Go back to campsite after I'm discharged. Spend the next few days in peace. Grandpa wouldn't tell us anything about it. He died last year and took it to his grave. My friend's grandmother disappeared 15 years ago in the woods up there. Be me, 17. Go on a backpacking trip over the summer through a school program. Me and like 10 other kids. In Mount Skokomish Wilderness with a ranger and an intern. Me and like 10 other kids in Mount Skokomish Wilderness. 
with a ranger and an intern. The ranger was a 60-year-old man, really quiet and kind of grouchy. The intern was some college girl pursuing a job like him. Hiking camp for about four days, not much happens. Occasionally catch the ranger checking out some of the girls at the camp. Don't think much of it. He only ever talks to the intern. About midway through the whole thing, we all smell terrible, but we're getting used to it. Late one night, really windy, I have my flashlight and go to take a dump in the woods. Go to latrine on my way back when I smell something fucking nasty. Like I said, we were used to the smell of B.O., and this definitely wasn't B.O. Start following the smell in the dark, tripping over logs and shit. Don't intend to go very far. Pass a tree and the ranger is just standing still beside me, like a statue. Says, pretty warm out, huh? Just sort of stand there. He goes walking back to the campsite and says the latrine is on the other direction. The smell is still fucking awful, so I pretend to walk over there, but once he's gone, I go back and follow the smell. It gets really bad. It smells like really sour shit and vomit. Follow it, gagging, until I come across a little clear patch of ground. The intern is totally naked, sitting in a pile of her own shit, vomit, and blood, crying, totally smeared in all of it. A few bloody, shitty sticks right beside her. She's just crying with her legs spread and sort of shaking. I ask if she's okay. She says yes. I ask if I can help. She says no. Walk back to camp fucking terrified and guilty. The ranger is in his tent, I guess, because I can't find him around camp. Go into my tent and turn out flashlight. Lie there for a while. Can't sleep. Hear big footsteps walking away from right near my tent. I was near some trees, so I guess he was standing outside of my tent for a while. Don't sleep at all. The next day, eventually find her filtering water. Ask if she's okay. She says she doesn't know what I'm talking about and to go help the others make dinner. The rest of the trip, I literally cannot get within 10 feet of her. She's just always not near me. She and the old ranger dude are really talkative. He's really friendly, compliments my outdoor skills a lot, and etc. Hike out eventually and go to a ranger station slash lodge for a night before driving out. Hike out eventually and go to a ranger station slash lodge for a night before driving out. There's an older woman ranger there. I tell her everything that happened and she seems very concerned and takes my phone number. That night, I go to shower, come back and find my room and all my belongings, totally raided. Say fucking nothing to anyone the whole drive back to boys. This was before Facebook. I've tried to look some of them up since, but only have ever had luck with the intern, who I eventually think I found on a USFS website by pure chance when I was researching something totally different. It only had the first name listed, but the face looked right. Be me, about nine or 10. Parents send me on team building camping trip for a week. Bullied, made to do the worst jobs. Everything sucks, out of control. Leave camp one night to get away from everyone. Go to the edge of a nearby lake. See someone walk across the shore. They go into the water. They go under. They do not come up. Run back to camp and hide because I saw a ghost. And I'm probably going to die like it's the ring or some shit. Soon after, whole camp is shut down. Everyone sent home. Local girl loaded backpack with rocks, walked into the lake, and drowned. My face went. I saw someone die. I was halfway through my senior year in high school when my parents decided to move to another state. They looked into ways that I could stay behind and finish school. We had an elderly neighbor who my parents had become close with, and they floated the idea of me staying at his house. He lived alone and had a second floor. They offered to pay him rent and I could help him with chores or whatever he needed while I was there. In return, I could stay and finish my senior year. He was happy to help since he lived alone and he needed help around the house. I was really glad I didn't have to move, so I agreed. And I moved in once my parents had moved. A month goes by and everything is fine. My friend who lived down the street picks me up and drops me off after school. One day, 
My friend drops me off and heads home. I walk down the driveway to the back door, and when I get close, I see a trail of blood on the concrete leading up to the door. And the door is cracked open, with dried, bloody handprints on the doorknob and smeared on the door. I start to feel adrenaline shooting through me and get real cold. I had no idea what to do. This was 1993, so this was before cell phones were a common thing. I walked in the house trying to figure out what had happened, and there was more blood on the floor leading up to the kitchen, where a towel was soaked in blood and draping over the sink. I turned and walked into the living room and saw the recliner he would sit in, and there was a big red splatter on the back, almost like he had been shot while sitting in his chair. I called out his name as loud as I could muster, and a few seconds later, I hear running water stop in the hallway bathroom. I hadn't identified the sound until it had stopped. I called out his name again, standing in the same place, starting to go into panic. No response. I realize that someone is there, and they're not responding. I completely panic and run out the back door. I sprint to my friend's house a few miles away and get there completely out of breath. I ring the doorbell and knock. No answer. So I go around the corner to where his room is. I see him through the window and bang on the window. And he turns around and sees me and is completely startled. He motions for me to go back to the door and he lets me in. I tell him what happened and I call my parents. My dad said he was going to call the police and to wait there. He would call me back. My dad calls back about 10 minutes later, said the police were on the way, and hang on. Just wait there while they investigate. Two hours go by. My dad called back and he is furious. Starts yelling at me about lying and what was wrong with me. Maybe I wasn't mature enough to be there without him. Tells me that I'm in a lot of trouble. He was going to figure out how to handle this and hangs up. I call him back and plead that I wasn't lying. He said the police went there. No blood. The neighbor had answered and said he had no idea what I was talking about. My friend said I could stay there, but all of my stuff was at the other house. I stayed there that night, called my dad again the next day, crying and telling him I wasn't lying, and I was too afraid to go back. He said I would have to move to their new house and finish school. My friend even spoke with my dad and tried to explain that I had shown up pale and shaking, and that I didn't seem to be lying. His parents let me stay there for a few weeks. I never picked up my clothes or laptop from the house, never returned his house key, or saw him again. I ended up finishing school living with different friends, and my parents always thought it was a cry for attention. I still have no idea what had happened there. So, I guess it's time to drop this one. Been saving it for a while. Mood is right, threat is spooky. Be my grandfather. World War II Gato class submarine crewman. Sub is out on patrol, east of Japan somewhere, hunting some smallish Japanese Coast Guard ships. Everyone is deathly silent, so as to not give away position to listening ships. Suddenly, everyone hears whispering in Japanese. Obviously, nobody could translate. He said it sounded like a young man's voice, but some other voices, like women and men, were whispering under the main voice in unison. Suddenly, the electricity goes out, absolutely dark. The whisper rises to a yell, then a scream. Screaming stops, electricity comes back on. Everyone's scared shitless. Then, everyone hears a long scraping all the way down the hall, from bow to stern, as if fingernails were trying to rip the metal hall apart. Keep in mind, they are probably 200 feet deep at the moment. A week passes. They have sunk two small merchant ships and are headed back to refuel and get more torps. He says they all hear quiet singing in Japanese. Then, something begins tapping on the hall to the beat of the singing. I showed him the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star song from Dead Space, and he says it was almost exactly like that, except in Japanese. Some of the crewmen faint. Granddad said he felt extremely nauseous at this point. One of the officers has a heart attack. He says he can't really explain the tension or fright in those moments, but he has never been more scared in his life. He was trapped in a metal box, hundreds of feet below the surface, 
tormented by Japanese water spirits. His words, not mine. Once they were out of Japanese waters, they surfaced for air and let the crew stretch out. On the hall at the base of the conning tower is a line of Japanese characters. Some crewmen copy it on paper and translate it. Translate it into black water, black ship, black souls, black hearse. Says there were four parallel scratches along the starboard side, bow to stern. This happened to me just over two weeks ago. Going to visit a friend who lives in the city. 20 mile drive, pretty comfy. Play Street Fighter and Tekken, fun times. Around 1 a.m. I decide to head home. Driving down this road with a shitload of pubs and bars on it. Normal friends everywhere. Squatting outside KFC and being retarded. Makes sense. Pubs shut around 1 a.m. over here. Carry on driving. Just about to hit the turnoff for home. The whole fucking road is barricaded off because of roadworks. Oh, fuck. I don't know the areas off the main road too well, much less when it's dark. Follow diversion, going through abandoned residential areas and pitch black country roads. Starting to feel a bit odd, as I have a bit of history of my eyes playing tricks on me this late on the road. Country roads dead as fuck at least. Finally find a familiar road. Decide to follow it to the nearest town and out towards home. Approaching aforementioned town, heart suddenly drops into my fucking scrotum. My headlights slowly bring into view the back of a woman dressed in white at the side of the road. Long hair facing away from the road, head pitched down a bit. Every nerve in my body screams, Ghost! for a split second, and I fucking floor it. Couple minutes pass by driving through the middle of town. Kind of laugh at myself for getting spooked because it clearly wasn't a ghost. Clothes look pretty modern, so it was probably just some bitch out after a few drinks. Wait a fucking minute. Check car's clock. 2 a.m. The pub's fucking shut an hour ago. Look around. The rest of the town is completely still. Furthermore, the road she was on wasn't exactly close to the town center. At least, not by foot. For another thing, the road wasn't even that close to residential areas on foot. Wasn't out with friends for post-pub drinks. The more I think about the situation, the more it begins to weird me out. At this point, finding out it was actually a ghost would probably make more sense to me. Anyone else have brief experiences? Like, sort of meeting a strange person on the street and passing them by? Because I've had a few. Told them here in the past before. First one that comes to mind. On my laptop, laying in front of it covered in a blanket with a pillow on my chin. Just browsing to try and pass the time before I pass out. Suddenly, smell a very clear scent of wood burning. Not like the candles my family usually burns. Like a breeze coming over a campfire clear. Worried something is on fire that shouldn't be. Flop over my side and look into the darkness around me. A couch is in front of me. Behind it is a staircase. See a big, clear shadow figure rush at mock fuck down the stairs. Vanishes at the bottom with the wood burning smell. Stare into darkness a while. Roll back over on my stomach and go back to browsing. Second story that comes to mind. In the same room as the above story. Again, browsing in the same way as then. Get a feeling someone is looking at me. I am paranoid about people peeking over my shoulders, so I know this feeling. Feel it by the stairs. Figure it's the cat or little shit dog. Grab the crap wrist flashlight that I have by me and shine it up at the stairs to ease my mind. Clear orange-red eyes are staring at me. Larger than either of the ill critters I was expecting. Like human eyes with eye shine. In the edge of the light. I can make out the outline of what looks like a girl lying on her stomach watching me with that medium sort of bowl cut haircut girls used to get sometimes. Stare for a good five seconds, eyes locked with the thing. Turn the light off, roll over, and ignore the feeling until it goes away. Third story that comes to mind. Going to bathroom late at night. Closest bathroom is past a short hallway under those stairs. Flick lights on. 
close door and catch myself in the door frame for no reason. Smiling. Looking fine, reflection. What the fuck is that? See what looks like a pale face and hand peeking and looking at me down the hall. Anus loosens in fear as the door closes behind me in the moment I spot that damn thing. Stand there and decide to do my business, quickly scurrying back out of the hallway when I'm done. Tell myself it's the ducks my dad had mounted on the wall opposite of the hall, and I just saw it wrong. Look at them in the morning. They're too far away to be seen in the dark. Nowhere near as white and pale as the thing I saw. Fuck. The way I saw it, the thing had to either crawl on the wall or hang by the railing to peek and turn its head into the hall like I saw. Don't look in the mirror for a few days after that. Close the door as quick as I can. Fourth experience that comes to mind. Walking down the stairs one night. No lights on, as I have good night vision due to being a night owl. Start to reach the halfway point of the stairs. Then, in the flash of a passing car's headlights driving past the house, coming through the door's little window, I see a clear figure of shadow. A little girl in a dress, leaning on the railing, with that medium bowl haircut. Jump back up a step, recoiling. Shadow girl is gone. Heart starts beating again. Quickly walk the rest of the way down the stairs. Fifth story. At high school, waiting for bro to pick me up. It's raining, I don't mind. Bored as shit and away from everyone else as I'm an antisocial autist. Begin to wander between these portable classrooms, kind of like trailers. Why? Well, my legs are getting restless and I have nothing else to do. Walk into the quote-unquote alleyway between trailer classes, just enjoying the rain. A very clear, feminine, and British-accented voice rings in my ear, like someone leaning in to talk to it. In a teasing tone, it says, I can see you there, you know? Glance around. See no girl. Nor anyone else. Closest person is around 20 or so feet out of the alleyway. Retreat from the alley as quick as my chubby legs can go. Had some weird dreams at that school, too, while I napped through lunch. Next story. Now, to start this one off. I used to be scared of the dark. I was an imaginative kid, so I saw a lot of things in the dark that wasn't there. Bro shared a room with me, so I felt safe and hid under my covers if I saw anything. Just random monsters. Kid stuff. Only saw one more than once. A sort of goblin thing. An old, withered, almost mummified man, with scars and a huge-ass smile, crawling on the walls like a spider, watching me. Scared the shit out of me. Forget it. Assume it was just another nightly terror I jumped up and leave it at that. Until me and my bro start talking about supernatural stuff one day. He tells me, when we were kids, he heard heavy, raspy breathing one night. I had asthma as a kid, so he got worried and looked over at me. And from this cork board above my bed, a goblin-like head emerged, withered and dried, covered in scars, aged and with a big smile. Breathing heavily, it looked down at me as I slept. Bro and all of his love for me did exactly what I would do, and rolled over. I never told anyone about the crawling man, never thought about it for years, and Bro just gave me a near exact description of the fuck shit bricks and tell him. He's surprised about it too. I've also seen a UFO with most of my family one time, and I saw something in the woods that me and my pops think was a Bigfoot. Things always go missing in my childhood home, and my brother and mother used to hear me and my younger sisters crying out for help while we were at school. Things have quieted down in recent years. Still don't like looking up at the stairs when I'm around that house at night though. This is a genuine story. Everything that happened, I promise, is real, and has been giving me nightmares and bad luck ever since. Go hiking last year with friends and brothers. Some park on the border of Indiana and Kentucky, called Clifty Falls. Very unfit, but love nature, so went anyway. Have a genuinely good time, but three hours into hike, start to slow down and get separated. Climbing up steep path, can't breathe well. Decide to sit and catch my breath. Group is maybe seven minutes ahead of me, alone at JPEG. Enjoying view at first, but suddenly, everything gets quiet. 
like too quiet, like when an animal is hunting prey. Shit, 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 shit. All of a sudden, I feel weird, like I'm in a dream. Rhythmic vibrations and ground, almost like drumming. Not dehydrated, still have water. Can't be in my head. Start speed walking up the steep path and attempt to catch up with group. Ground still vibrating like drum. Stop. Nearly have heart attack. What the fuck is that, Doc Giff? See incredibly tall figure with antlers dancing in the trees. Dance is almost ceremonial-like, unlike anything I've seen. Had to be at least ten feet tall. Long, slender black body. Big hands. Tiny eyes. It's just fucking dancing, looking at me. Captivated, but also terrified. Start walking off the path towards it, but feel sudden tap on my shoulder. It's my brother. Rest of group not far behind. Everyone is pissed. What the fuck? Dancing antler fucker is gone. So is drumming. Everyone accuses me of going ahead of the group. Swear it was the other way around. Don't mention what the fuck I just saw. Because they won't take me seriously. Ever since that day, I've had bad luck. Lost job. Got corona. Got in fight with boyfriend. And had to get gallbladder removed. My rabbit is afraid of me. Still hear drumming at night. And scratching in the attic. Sketch to pick for y'all. Old Dutch family story literally goes back to the middle in the 19th century. My ancestors came from a small village. One of the farmers had this weird boy. The boy would walk weird, flap his hands, kill small animals, sometimes touch girls' breasts. After getting a few beatings and warnings, the boy was kept on his father's farm not even being allowed to enter the church. One day, the boy enters the church, sobbing and confused, asking to talk to the priest. The priest and several of the local men approach the boy because he is not welcome in the church. He begs the priest to allow him to stay in the church. The priest asks him why. The boy, crying and being hysterical, says he accidentally summoned the devil and that the devil will drown him. The men of the village are hesitant and want to put the boy in a mental asylum outside the city. The boy agrees, but begs them to allow him to sleep in the church this night, because the devil will try and drown him. The priest agrees, and a carpenter goes to the city to get someone from the asylum. The boy calms down, gets a small bed, and the priest promises he will be sleeping nearby, and that he can call him any time he wants to. Three times the boy wakes up the priest because he sees the devil waiting outside the church. Three times, the priest and the boy pray together and read from the Bible. At the end of the evening, it starts to rain and small puddles form. It is almost daybreak. The priest is up already to check on the boy. The boy looks outside and says, I did it! I won from the devil! Happy and confident, the boy says he's going to look at the sunrise. The priest goes inside to get something to eat for himself and the boy. When he walks outside to give the boy some bread and cheese, he finds his dead body, drowned in one of the puddles that formed last night. Silver City, Idaho. It's just a ghost town now, but it used to be a booming gold mining town. The arriving white settlers couldn't figure out why the Indian tribes avoided hunting and fishing in certain areas. Oh, well, probably just dumb Indian superstitions. Well, the town keeps growing. More people arrive. They begin to notice strange noises coming from the mountains at night. Like singing, or sometimes like children crying. Then, weird lights near the top of the mountains where nobody lives. Settlers go to investigate. As they approach the top, the lights inexplicably disappear. No evidence of campfires, but tiny footprints in the snow and in the muddy areas. A few times, they go up to investigate the mountains, but always, the lights disappear. White settlers begin to learn about the Shoshone legends. There's something unnatural in those mountains. Something that mimics human speech. 
Indians describe these creatures as short but powerful men, about two feet in height, and strong enough to carry an elk on their backs. These little men didn't just occupy the mountain. They liked to come down to hunt. They looked for children. They'd lure them off into the woods and eat them before anyone even noticed the children were gone. The Shoshone and Bannock tribes said they lost many children this way. Like I said, nowadays it's just an abandoned town. But you can still go visit, and people do. Especially to see the beautiful but strangely formed rocks in the mountains that resemble human faces. Pick related. I grew up on a good-sized farm in rural North Carolina. Had like 40 acres of land, mostly forest, and a couple big fields. The surrounding properties were pretty much the same, so basically just miles and miles of woods and fields in all directions. The area I was in was well known for being Native American territory. There was even a small Native American museum nearby. Not uncommon to find arrowheads and other artifacts. So, I lived here through most of my childhood, age 4 to like 16. I'm 26 now. I always felt like I was being watched. In my house, I couldn't walk room to room. I always ran full speed and looked behind me because I felt like I was being followed. Had a number of odd events go down while I lived there. I would regularly see random people walking into and out of the woods, which again was miles and miles of nothing. I'd explored all of our property and a bit of the surrounding area, so I don't know where these random people were going to or coming from. It was pretty bizarre. So here's one story. Note that in this story, I wasn't aware of all the Native American shit and knew nothing of poltergeists. Also, I have a near photographic memory, which is why I remember obscure details. Be me, age 10 or so, have several quads and rode them pretty much daily. Would often ride around with my Pelican shooting at random shit for fun and exploring. This was before everyone had cell phones, by the way. We had a small deer plot at the bottom of this steep hill and a shooting lane leading to it. I regularly would park at the top of this hill and watch the wildlife, occasionally shooting at birds or whatever, but rarely hit anything. There was a big half-buried rock I would park my quad on to keep from rolling down the hill. Be doing the above activity one afternoon, broad daylight, parked on the rock, watching the birds and rabbits and squirrels through the scope on my pelican. Shit was cash. Suddenly, everything goes dead silent, like the kind of silent where all you hear is the blood pumping through your ears. Feel every single hair on my body stand on end. What the fuck that wave? This has never happened before. The animals I'd been watching were frozen. Suddenly, hear slow, heavy breathing coming from right behind me, and what sounds like a momentary, deep, quiet growl. Freeze. Literally felt electricity in the air. Like when you go down those plastic slides in McDonald's. Overcome with pure dread and felt tears welling up. Slowly, turn around expecting to see a mountain lion or something, thinking I'm only moments away from death. Could still hear the breathing right the fuck in front of me, four feet away. There's nothing there. Absolutely fucking nothing. Friend, what a JPEG? Every cell in my body was saying to run the fuck away. But I was afraid if I moved, I'd be attacked. In that moment, I suddenly heard my mom calling my name way off in the distance. Finally grow some balls and start the quad, and take the fuck off full speed, throwing my pelican on the ground. Remember the gun landing barrel first, and thinking my dad was going to be pissed if he found out, because he told me never to let dirt get in the barrel. Fuck it, I'm about to die anyways. Absolutely fly top speed back to the house and asked my mom what she wanted. She hadn't called my name. Absolutely mind fucked. Took weeks before I went out again. For years, I never told anyone about this. I'm sort of autistic, so I just never really understood what it was that happened. Not until years later, when a friend was talking to me about hauntings, did I suddenly remember all the odd shit I experienced as a kid. And it finally clicked that maybe it was a poltergeist or something. When I think about it now, 
it freaks me out even more than it did then. Got a story from my childhood. A lot of spooky stories from when I was a kid turned out to have logical answers. Neighbors jumping my fence, sleep paralysis, and etc. But this one doesn't so much. Be me, approximately 10 years ago, age 9. Recently moved to this weird house on a hill. Because it was built like shit, rain from high air on the hill would run through the house, driving the humidity so high that mushrooms would grow in the grout between the tiles. Creepy fucking statue in the middle of the front yard. Got into Doctor Who like two years earlier and just hit puberty. So, I developed anxiety which in turn developed a massive phobia of statues. Fuck weeping angels, bro. For real. Anyway, so, one morning, I noticed the statue has rotated slightly towards the house. Mom dismisses it as just puberty-induced paranoia, saying she was the same way at my age. It keeps gradually rotating more and more, and I'm the only one who notices this, despite pointing it out and progressively becoming more of an anxious wreck about it. More weird shit starts happening. Next door neighbor randomly makes us some food, get insane bad vibes off of her, and refuse to eat the food. This is unusual since, as a kid, I was extremely polite and trusting, to the point of being quite gullible, nearly ate shifty sweets from a creepy old man, kinda polite and gullible. Everyone but me gets sick. What the fuck? Paranoia worsens, having breakdowns every night. Begin praying to specifically live until I'm 93. Parents think I'm just fucktarded. We go for a walk through the nearby parklands, further down the hill. Heaps of broken stone statues lying around. Nobody seems to fucking notice. Cannot shit pants any harder at this point. Generally terrified of all statues until I moved out a few months later. Time goes by. Assume my parents were right. Fast forward to last year, 17 or 18. Been helping my grandpa who lives near old house. Drive by just out of curiosity. The statue isn't there anymore. Resume shooting pants. What the fuck, bros? What the fuck? Be me, asleep, having dream. Weird dream. The sky is brown. I'm in the back of a car and everything is somewhat dark. Apocalyptic almost type of setting. Look to my right in the back of the car. There's a doll maybe three feet tall. Reach towards doll, pluck out the giant crimson anime eyes, and place them over my own. Instantly wake up. Hear deep voice talking in my ear. Talfum. Okay. Freaked out, but forget. Still hear Talfum in my head. Google out of curiosity. It means to baptize in German. Shit pants. Anyway, not too spooky, but it made me get baptized. I don't know why Mr. Demon told me to get baptized. Seems counterproductive. Keep in mind, this will use both my own memories and second-hand accounts from my parents who remember this incident. Be about six years old. Just began sleeping in my own room since we were able to move into a house that allowed for us to have our own room. Excited because I felt like I was finally a big boy who can quote-unquote live on his own. First night, feel hot. Like, very hot. Live in Texas, so heat was not a rare issue, but this felt unbearable. Almost to the point of not being able to breathe. Just go to the living room to sleep and forget about it. Next night, the heat returns. But this time, feels less warm and more mean. My six-year-old mind didn't know what malice was, so that was the best way I could describe it. Made me want to leave my room, but I couldn't. Something made me so scared that it got me frozen. Tried yelling for my dad, but almost like those dreams where you yell and nothing comes out. Same thing here, but I knew I wasn't dreaming. Now here is where my memory gets fuzzy, so I'm going to go off what my parents remember. Next day, I go to my dad and tell him about the past two nights. He chalks it up to me being scared all alone in the dark. He decides that day to put a nightlight in my room, and hopefully that helps. Comes into my room that night like he usually does, and this time, 
He reads me a bedtime story, all in hopes to calm me down. He leaves, and seemingly that's the end of it. Fast forward to about 2 a.m. or so. The absolute worst blood-curdling scream he has ever heard comes from my room. So loud it actually wakes up the neighbors. My dad is not a fast man, but that day, you swear he had super speed the way he was able to get to my room so fast. Our rooms were on opposite sides of the house. Dad basically breaks the door off of its hinges and sees me on the floor crying and cowering for my life in a corner of the room. My dad goes on to explain how as soon as he went in, he felt this pure aura of just anger and malice. Dad picks me up and bolts out of that room. Sleep with them for the next two nights. My dad doesn't talk about the room for those days, not wanting to scare me. Tells me that after that, he talked to my mom about it. My mom, being religious and an avid believer in the paranormal, tells my dad it has to be some sort of spirit haunting the room. My dad, still skeptical, decides to say fuck it and sleep in the room himself, just to make sure he didn't just imagine it since he was still groggy and half awake when he came into my room that night. Later that night, he tucks me in with my mother and goes to sleep in my room. Next day, we find him sleeping in the living room. Mom asks Dad what happened. He begins to go on this huge tirade about how the room made him feel nauseous and almost depressed. He said that the heat itself was bad, but that at around 2 a.m. he felt almost suicidal, to the point of thinking to just turn on the car's gas and let it be. My father is not a depressive, nor has he ever had a history of such. Tells my mom that something is definitely fucked up about that room. My sister, she was about 17, hears my dad say this and, as most teenagers do, tend to not believe him, so she says she'll sleep in the room, to much of my mother's dismay. Later that night, my sister goes into my room. About 2 a.m., same as last night, and same as two nights before. She bolts out of my room. And I don't mean run. I mean she almost leaped out of my room with how fast she tried to leave. My mother tells me that she even caught my sister trying to leave the house entirely in a mess of sweat and tears. Later that night, after my sister calms down, my parents ask her what exactly happened. She goes on to explain that she had been touched by something, and not just a normal grazing feel or strained sensation. She means grabbed and groped. She explains that while the room itself became scorching hot, the touches felt like they were setting her on fire burning her. She said that the pain may have been one thing, but the sheer feeling of anguish and despair she felt while it happened was on an entirely different level. She explained it as the feeling you get when someone you love dies, and you have to see their body in a casket. Of course, to my mother and father, they knew what that felt like, losing a parent and grandparent respectively. My mom finally tells us she wants to sleep in that room. Dad tells her not to, and just call a priest or something. Mom says she wants to confirm it herself. Part of me thinks she just wanted to have a piece of the paranormal pie. That night, we all go to bed, and my mom goes in my room. Same verse as the first, second, and third. 2 a.m., and shit hits the fan. This time, we hear crashing and screaming. Dad once again runs into the room tells me to stay in their bed until he comes back. Can hear sister running to my room as well. Can hear talking, but no real words can be made out. Later that day, my mom explains what happened. Mom tells my dad she felt the exact same malice and anger that he and my sister did. Only this time, she could feel direction. She could tell where it was. She continued to explain that she just knew where I was sitting or standing or whatever. At first, she left it be since it wasn't really trying to harm her. But then she told my dad something, and later to me, which to this day has never left our minds. She begins to tell my dad that not only was it there, but it spoke to her. Not the same quiet whisper my sister got, but full audible speech. She says the spirit began talking about my father first, saying things like, He only chose you because you were the easiest. 
He only chose you because he needed a rebound. Only reason he stayed was the kid. For context, I am my father's only child. My sisters were from a different marriage. She then began saying the spirit talked about me. How he'll end up being buried by you. He'll never amount to anything because you'll never let him. And this went on for maybe 30 minutes until she just lost it. My sister felt fear. My dad felt depression. I felt malice. My mother felt pure, unfiltered anger. My mom isn't someone known for her temper, but when she is mad, she's terrifying. This was one of those moments. Mom finally told my dad to call a priest to bless the house and exercise any bad juju. Call a family friend who was also the priest at our local church. Priest comes in and immediately asks, Can you show me your son's room? My mother and my father never told him about the room. When asked why he wanted to start there, the priest just said, I think that's where I'm needed the most. My mom allows him in and leads him into my room. Priest stops, almost frozen. Tells my parents that there is something evil, something cruel in here. And as he said that, he turns to the corner of the room. Same place my mother told my dad where she felt it. Priest points and says, There. That is where it lives. It's no spirit. It's a demon. I don't know what brought it here nor why it resides in this exact area, but something about this land attracts it. Priest, as he says this, begins to set crosses and candles around the room, grabbing his holy water. Begins to pray and spread the holy water. As he's doing that, the whole room goes hot. Hotter than anyone has ever felt it. To the point where we were all drenched in sweat as this happened. Priest is praying and spraying at this point. Looked like a movie almost. The whole time it felt like something was struggling, clinging to the room. And then, after 30 minutes, it stopped. No more heaviness. Temperature went the same as the rest of the house. Everything felt normal. Priest then says that it decided to go. It knew that it couldn't stay. Fast forward about two years, and my father and priest friend decided to discuss what exactly happened. Priest begins to explain that for some reason, the demon felt an abnormal amount of attraction to that one area, that one bit of the house that was full of malice and anger. Says he researched the house, and for what he knows, no one was ever killed there, or Indian burial ground or any of that crap. Just something there fed its evil nature. Tells my dad that it's not unheard of for a demon to just choose a random house, and especially a random room. But when it does happen, it happens for a reason. To this day, neither the priest nor my parents know why. Now I'm 23 and to this day, I still think about that room. I still sleep in it sometimes when I visit my folks, but nothing ever feels off. If you see it, it's just a normal everyday middle class room. I have had some paranormal experiences here and there since then, some bigger and more unexplainable than others. But nothing ever tops this one. Nothing ever gets close to this one. It has always stuck in my mind. It is possibly why I still believe in the paranormal at all. Just the amount of evidence I witnessed firsthand those two weeks or so was enough to tell me this isn't all superstition and voodoo. I still wonder sometimes what it was that attracted that thing to my room. Not my parents, not my sisters, nowhere in the house but my room. Maybe demons are just more attracted by toddlers since they are more innocent and easier to corrupt. I'm not a theologian so I can't say for sure. All I know is that in some sick way, I hope I can encounter something like that again. Thanks for reading. Live with friend on a basement for about five years now. Both college dropouts, smoking weed, playing guitar, not really spiritual. His mom, who was a Christian for the longest time, would visit from time to time. One day, she's over. Does a weird prayer with both of us. Weird mumbling, blah, blah, blah. Friend walks out of the room. Stare at him, horrified. He stares at the end of a dark hallway for three minutes. 
What's wrong? Anon? Do you see how he looks at me? Do you see his eyes, Anon? He always stares at me. Look at the hallway and see the shadow of a man about eight feet tall. It disappears. Oh god, oh fuck, that JPEG. Both dazed and shitting our pants. Go to bed. Wake up to the shadow trying to fight me. I wrestle it for what felt like an entire hour. Friend's mom walks in. She starts praying. What are you doing, dumb bitch? See bright light on the roof. Absorb the shadow. My face went. Wait. You didn't include a picture. How do we know what your face is when? Mid to late 1980s. Eastern Europe. Dad is really into hiking. Has his favorite trail with old, very old, abandoned shacks that mountain people used to live in. Dad met some people in a bar in the closest town to the trail. Ends up going on the trail with some guy and two girls. They get to the shack, have a bit of wine, but don't get too drunk though. My dad gets along with the guy and they talk literature, philosophy, art, etc. Girls go to sleep, bored. As dad said, the conversation he had with the guy was very deep, and when they got into philosophy and soon religion, the conversation had a weird fever dream flow. Except for the wine they drank two plus hours ago, they're fully sober. Suddenly, my dad feels absolutely fucking horrible, just pure evil in the air, despair and misery. The guy looks like he also felt it. The girls wake up. They don't say a single word. Both my dad and the guy start crying. It passes. Girls are confused. Both my dad and the guy have no idea what happened. And they never met again. Fast forward a couple of years. Dad goes there with a girlfriend. They go into the same shack where he was with the two girls and the guy. The hole in the corner of the room for a bonfire is filled with rocks. Decides not to bother. Goes to a different one. Has a weird feeling anyway. They spend two nights there. Morning after second night. Dad is just sitting with the girl and smoking cigarettes and talking. Suddenly, he hears a loud noise. The shack, the one they were supposed to be staying, just fucking collapsed out of nowhere. I've actually been there twice. Went there once with my dad when I was a kid, and everything was cool, nothing happened. I fell asleep early. The second time, I was with my girlfriend, and I just felt very uncomfortable the whole time. That was a year ago. This happened in Sawyer County, Wisconsin. Area is quite rural. Brother and I would spend a lot of time outdoors, exploring. Being young boys, we would race from one spot to the next. He was older than me, and he always won. One day, we're racing to the base of this little hill. He beats me as usual, and I decide to walk the rest of the way. I can see my bro ascending the hill. Foot slips in a huge puddle of water, and I almost fall. When I regain my balance, I look up, and brother is gone. The whole world looks dark, like when it's about to storm. I call out my brother's name. No response. Feeling nervous about the hill, I take a step backwards, right into the same fucking puddle. Fall on my back, right into the water. Splash that gif. When I get back up, the whole world is normal again, bright and sunny. I hear my brother's voice. He's on the hill, laughing at me. Nothing else happened, sorry if it's kind of lame, but it's the weirdest thing I've experienced. Mate of mine likes to go sailing off the coast, spending an afternoon on the water. Here's a splash beside the boat and looks over the side. Sees a woman's face, clear as day through the water. A pale redhead, her eyes are even sparkling in the bright sunlight strikingly beautiful. She's mouthing something, like she's trying to talk. Her face recedes into the darkness of the water, like something slowly pulls her down. Friend is shocked, and decides to head back to shore. See some activity back where the other boats are. A small crowd of people bustling about. A woman drowned. My mate recognizes her as the woman in the water. Overcome with a deep sorrow, he leaves the crowd and rushes into his boat. He cries for a long time. 
He said the sadness he felt was unreal. It was like losing a loved one. But after a certain point, he just felt normal again and wondered why the fuck he'd gotten so emotional. See lights on a structure from where I live for years. Always wonder what they are. Drive out to them when I finally get car. It's just a TV transmitting station thing. Park up there before I head back. Live in the city and always forget how clearly you can see the stars when you're in the countryside. Totally clear night too, just windy as fuck. Look up at stars. There's this really strange star that you can see even in the city. It flashes red, then white, then blue all of the time. Science teacher told us it was a satellite. Show it to a friend once, and he says it's definitely not a satellite, because it's too small and satellites move much faster. Anyway, I start looking for it. Can't see it. Too many stars. See shooting star, but it's moving at a steady pace, and stays the same luminosity. Watch it traveling. Notice another coming from the east. They're going to hit each other. Stop a little distance apart and merge. One of them starts heading north. The other starts heading west. And then a third one has appeared from where they met that travels southeast. No idea what they were, but it was still pretty cool to see. If I lived out there, I would just set a telescope up and watch for interesting sky memes. Be me. Be 16. There is a whole abandoned village not so far. Go there to explore with a friend. Let's call him Jeff for the sake of anonymity. Wooded area. Only a dirt road leads to the place. It's a mess. Tall grass, waist height, everywhere. On roads, gardens, damn, even in some houses. Arrive and start looking around. Old peasant houses, a few bigger households, a church, etc. Regular village stuff. Exploring for a good hour. Jeff starts to get jumpy. What's wrong, buddy? Scared, huh? What? No. No. I just... I think I saw something move around. Write it off as the magic of the place. Go into a house that wasn't completely destroyed. Get a sudden feel that I'm being watched. A feeling that something is behind me. And can't see it because it moves away as a turn. Uneasy feeling intensifies to the point when my eyes start to water up. Not good. Time to leave. As we go back to the place we entered the village, we see mannequins in some windows. Probably just didn't realize them on the way in. Jeff screams. I'm not shitting. Two mannequins were standing on the road in front of us. On the road, we entered the place. There is no way those were there before. We both lose it and storm through the forest till we get home. Never return there. Does anyone remember that video of the family in Tallahassee who recorded this sound coming out of the sky? I actually live in that same area. And I heard it too. Live alone in a small trailer. I'm at my table reading a book and eating dinner when I hear what sounds like a distant roar of a jet engine. We'd had some really bad storms, so I figured it was probably more thunder. Sound keeps getting louder. It's definitely getting closer. Run to the door and look out the sky. Think maybe a plane was going down. Fuck load of trees, so I can't see much. The noise is almost deafening now. It's like there's a fucking jet engine right on top of my house. The sound is literally making my head throb. The only thing I've ever felt that was even close to this is that feeling you get when you manually force yourself to relax your entire body. It's like I'm fighting to stay conscious. Drop like a sack of potatoes in the doorway. I can't move. It's like the sound is pinning me to the ground. I throw up. This goes on for what feels like eons. The sound swells in intensity and changes over time. By the end, it sounded much more like some piece of huge industrial machinery as opposed to an engine. Super bright flash of light out of nowhere. Sound instantly stops. I called 911 and they told me a lot of people had reported the same thing and that they're not sure what's going on. Also, when I went into my backyard the next day, Squirrel is lying at the base of a big tree. 
figure it must have been stunned by the sound and fell and broke its neck. Go up to get a better look. Nope.x. Whatever killed that squirrel, it wasn't a fall. Its eyes were bulging almost completely out of its skull. Looks like it suffered some kind of massive brain hemorrhage. I remember the way my head thrummed when the sound was on top of my trailer. Consider myself lucky. 2007. Grew up in Arizona desert. People don't realize how fucking weird shit gets out there. Friends and I would camp out there and guaranteed we would hear at least a few weird things or see some shit. Don't want to say we got used to it, but we weren't not used to it at the same time. Have a ton of stories, but this one fits the thread theme. Anyway, sometime in early high school, we decide to go out and camp during the long weekend. Parents are all used to it, don't really care. Pack up and hike out into friend's property, which is massive. Get to our usual camping spot and notice it's fucking trashed. Not like litter, but the shit itself looks like a tornado went through it. Figure maybe it was a big dust devil. There's weird scorch marks in the dirt. Pieces of rock almost look melted together. We figure it must have been big fireworks. There's kind of a weird smell in the air, but it's easily ignored. We decide to stay. Rebuild a fire pit. Everything is fine until the sun goes down. Then we start hearing shit. Sounds like really raspy mumbling. None of us have heard anything like it before. So, we're all kind of on alert. Sound is getting closer. Seems to be moving in a circle around camp. None of us are armed, but one of us has a hunting knife. Doesn't really make us feel safer, though. Way too dark to hike back. We're basically stuck out here. Over the course of about an hour, the sound fades and gets louder randomly. The more we listen to it, the more we start thinking it's not really chanting. It's more like that weird humming sound power lines make. Starts to smell like hot sand. Friend with the knife is convinced we're gonna get fucking abducted by aliens or something. Starts freaking out and throwing flaming pieces of wood out into the dark. We're telling him he's an idiot and it's probably just some weird animal. Then, one of the pieces hits something about 50 yards away. Get a brief glimpse of something rust-colored and almost the texture of steel wool. Had that same kind of loopy ribbon look, if that makes sense. Whatever it is, is definitely not a human or animal. We all start chucking pieces of flaming stuff at it. It doesn't seem to care. Eventually, there's enough debris that we can get a better look at it. It was like a squarish stick figure. Kind of like those Cocopelli things, but without the hair. It's made of this shifting, rusted, wire-looking material. It's letting out that weird humming sound. The ground it touches starts to burn and scorch. Circles the camp a few times like it wants to come closer, but doesn't want to get close to the light. We're all peeing ourselves, thinking we're about to die. Suddenly, it lets out this really loud metallic shriek and fucking flies backward like it's rocket-powered. Everyone flips shit. We leave the gear and sprint all the way back to the car. Peel out. Come back for our stuff like a week later. Most of it is burnt. Never camp there again. Apparently as a child, I told my parents I saw some weird-ass shit. My dad told me when I was like three or four. I told him that, Do you remember when we were waiting for mommy to come home from them? And the son went over the roof of our house to bring her back. He did a double take and asked what I said. I replied, Yeah, when the son went over our house and brought mommy back. It's sort of surreal because I don't remember anything, even me saying that. To this day, he swears UFOs were involved with our family early on in some way. Because as a kid, he remembers some weird shit happening. Some sort of craft going over him while he and his friends were playing outside, living in a woods, and playing outside at night. Lights coming down from the craft and chasing them all around. This was the size of Zeppelin and floating silently. To this day, he gets a bit emotional about it, and truly believes aliens used humans as experiments. 
I accidentally killed a person who committed suicide by running out in front of my car. Hasn't gone to court yet. Today, my legal team got CCT footage from a subpoena showing the guy was laying down in a ditch next to the road, waiting for a car to pass, which should be enough to clear my name. What paranormal implications will this have on me? Ghost. Be me. See ghost. This is the best one I've read so far. <laughs> the absolute worst blood cuddling... Cuddling. It says cuddling. <laughs> Sixth story. Sixth story. Sixth... <laughs> Jesus. Sixth... 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 Sixth story. Sixth... 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 Sto Sixth story. Why can I not say this? Had some weird dreams at that school, too. Oh, jeez, I can't even read that sentence right. Okay. All right. Sixth, sixth story. Okay. All right. Sixth. Oh, my God. Sixth. <laughs> I'm losing my fucking mind. Sixth story. <sighs> ah. Had some weird dreams at that school, too, while I napped through lunch. Sixth story. Oh, fuck this. Sixth story. It's it's just six story. Next story. No, it's next story. Oh. <laughs> Not sure if this was a TV broadcast or like a form of sleep paralysis, but I've never forgotten it. Be me, nine years old. Summer 1999. Still afraid to sleep at night in the dark, so I used a TV as a nightlight. Used Fox News because it was the most boring shit ever. And the light didn't flicker as much. Fall asleep per usual. Snore. Hear something in my sleep which causes me to wake up. Is he asleep? I don't know. Rub my eyes as I look at the TV. Both news hosts are staring back at me. Both hunched over like they are carefully studying me. Friend what dot X. A few seconds later, they break eye contact. The man clears his throat and the woman shuffles some papers. Well, uh, let's go back to the situation in Africa, as Nelson Mandela... I was very freaked out and just kept staring at the screen. Shit never happened again after that. Be really late at night. Fell asleep watching some bizarre local channel sometime in the 90s. Wake up to this loud sound that happens when a TV goes off air, as pictured. Then, after a while, the screen changes. It's now a forklift just lifting trash and dumping it into a garbage dump. The TV has gone silent. Then, staticky letters appear, listing only first and last names. Then, a low warbling and sad, almost crying voice says that these are the people that will die tomorrow. Goodbye. Back to static, and then weather forecast. Been spooked of sleeping with a TV on ever since. How I met the Reaper, not. I was seven or eight and playing with some friends. Right behind our apartment blocks was a spacey playground that was surrounded with mixed brushes, trees, a small pond, and a path to the cornfield. We were forbidden to go to the cornfield because that was already out of earshot from any house. Little buggers we were, we gave a shit on rules and went apeshit in the field. One day, we came across what is called crop circles today, but wasn't a thing back then. Neatly done circular shapes trampled into the corn. Nothing else but corn in all directions. It was a sunny day, fucking hot. Nothing to hear but wind and insects. Suddenly, we stumbled upon what must have been the center of the crop circles. A black robed figure stood there showing us its back. It was handling a scythe, sharpening it. I was not familiar with the cliché reaper at the time, so I was wondering what a monk, or whatever it was, did in this cornfield. No monastery for hundreds of miles. That guy must have heard us and bolted around. Just blackness where the face should have been. Black gloves and boots. In that damn heat. He raised the scythe and began walking in our direction without a word. We bolted, but I tripped in the corn. He moved into my direction. 
before I was within his reach. I was up again and run around him. He was a little slow and could not keep up. Kicked him in his butt. That was unexpected. Guy stumbles to his knees and drops the scythe. I make a run for it and meet up with my friends later on. I told my parents and they gave me a serious spanking. Also, I had never to tell again of the guy with the scythe. All my friends were also told to keep shut about the guy. The parents were all upset and angry, but nobody told us why. No internet back then, so we never figured out what really was the point about that at all. A year later, a neighbor kid vanished in summer, last seen entering the cornfield. Here's a short one for you. Be me. Be Bosnian. Live about 100 kilometers from place of mass killing. Get drunk one night. Love Urbex, Dora the Explorer, that JPEG. Go there with a buddy of mine. Dark and gloomy day. Welcome to the Zone Stalker, that JPEG. Walk around for like an hour. Start hearing faint whispers and children laughing. Being idiots, we only want to explore more. Get to an old school. Fucking wall is destroyed. Can see inside. Stare. Then start to leave. Friend grabs my shoulder. Did you just see that? The fuck? Claims to have seen shadows. Solid shadows. Start walking to the forest nearby. Hear woman cry. Please don't take him! Turns out, mass grave was found in that forest. Shit ourselves. It's getting dark. Start walking through the forest. We both don't know why. We both feel extremely sad. Start hearing people yell. The accent. Serbs. Hear gunshots. We start running. We are right now having flashback to event that happened before we were born. What the fuck is going on? Turn around. Absolutely nothing there. Start walking, but still keep looking behind us. Fall into a fucking ditch. Friend asks if I'm alright. Say yeah, I just hit my knee on a rock. Look down. Hmm, that's a pretty strange white rock. Oh god, that JPEG. It was a fucking open grave. Climb out as fast as humanly possible. I run like a friend on crack who just robbed a bank. Finally hit a road. We take a rest and head to town. I decide to leave an anonymous tip to the authorities to find the grave. They find it. A week later, have a weird dream. I'm at a Muslim funeral, an old woman crying, and a strange young man standing at the coffin. The man says, Thanks for helping my mother. It feels great to have helped someone find peace. Okay, first time I've told anyone about this other than my town cops. But here goes. Be me, two years ago. Live alone. 3 a.m. Upstairs in computer room, browsing hentai or whatever. Hear windows smash open downstairs. Take off headphones and sit up. Not a second after the smash. I hear it. Sounds like heavy, very fast footsteps bounding through the house. Went straight from the window across my living room in like three seconds. Hear it running up the stairs inhumanly fast. I quickly get up and lock the door. Not a second later, it's right outside the door, and the knob is getting ripped around like crazy. Knob stops twisting. Door creaks and pushes in a bit from weight pressing on it. Pressure comes off door, and everything goes dead silent. I just stand there looking at the door, still kind of shocked. Hear the steps run just as fast back downstairs, through house. Hear a little more glass break as whatever it was leaves through the broken window. Whole thing happened in like 25 to 30 seconds. It's like it knew exactly where I was in the house and was trying to get to me as fast as it could. Stand there listening to my heartbeat pounding in my ears for half a minute. Then, call the cops. They show up like 10 minutes later and I explain what happened. They investigate it as a home invasion, but nothing comes of it. Not too worried now though, cause I'm ready if it ever comes back. Installed security system, strong locks on doors and windows, and bought a shotgun. Anytime I'm in a room, I lock the door and have my gun with me. I don't know what the fuck was in my house that night, but I'm just thankful I was awake 
and sharp enough to lock my door in time. Don't want to think about if I was asleep, or if I got to the door a second later. Alone with dog and house on outskirts of town. Rather small house, despite it being two stories. Surrounded by trees on all but one side. One night, be on computer upstairs. Hear a strange, very low humming noise. Turn off everything in room that's making sound. Sound is coming from outside. Open window. Sound is coming from woods. As I listen, it gets louder. See nothing. Starting to get creeped. Dog getting nervous and whining. Fuck this. Close slash lock window. Close shades, lock door. Get bat. Noise is so loud. Windows rattling. Sounds like a jet engine hovering over my house. Suddenly, everything's silent. Be still. Very faint sound of multiple footsteps outside. Footsteps fade in the direction of my backyard. Think I hear back door open. Heart racing, clutching bat, sweating bullets. Dog is a puss and is just hiding under bed without a peep. Hear muffled footsteps throughout the first floor. Now, there's some coming up the stairs. Oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, oh fuck. Something's just outside the door. Right before fight or flight kicks in, dog barrels out from under bed and charges the door. His growl is like nothing I've heard before. Deep and guttural. Dog continues to growl like a demon for about a minute before turning to me and lifting his ears. Be still. Hear silence. To be safe, I wait about an hour in silence. Dog is just panting and wagging his tail. Deem it safe to go out. Open door. First thing that hits me is a terrible stench, like rancid formaldehyde. Dog runs downstairs and sniffs about. I check all rooms with my bat. Nothing but that lingering smell. Go downstairs. Nothing out of place in living room. Go to kitchen. Fridge door slightly open, slash a few cabinet doors open. After determining all is safe and nothing is stolen, I lock every door and window, retreating back to my room where I stay awake through the night with my dog and bat. Nothing like that has happened again. I occasionally get a whiff of that terrible smell outside my house, but never inside, thank God. B12 gets into a correctional summer camp by mistake because best friend's mom is ESL. 1,200 kids. I'm one of five white kids. Friend and I get assigned to a Cherokee camp. Cherokee camp is pretty in the woods and my cabin is even further in the woods, about 25 meters from a large creek. Cabins are your basic 15 by 15 six foot wall with four feet of openness into the roof. Bunk beds. Bottom bunk is mashed up against the wall Top bunk is exactly parallel with the open window. Get a top bunk assigned. Camp generally pretty cool. I was, slash am, a bit weird, so everyone thought I was a voodoo doctor. Late one night, laying in bunk. New moon. Hear what I thought was raccoons fighting by creek. The fight manages to make its way right under my window. Screams and snarls rattle my existence. One creature slams into the side of the cabin and runs off howling. Hear growling and labored breathing. Then, hear claws scratching and pulling through the window. Hide in sleeping bag. Creature climbs into bunk and sits on my legs. Can't breathe. I'm so terrified. Entire camp is dead quiet. Why won't anyone help me? Creature is impossibly heavy. Couldn't move if I wanted to. It sits and licks itself for what feels like forever. Suddenly, hear a truck tear into camp. Bright spotlights blaze into my cabin. Creature lets out some horrible scream, like something I've never heard before. It bolts out the window, so hard and fast it rips my sleeping bag and scratches my left shin. Piss myself. Truck tears off into the woods after it. Next morning, find hollowed out raccoon by the creek. All other campers visibly frightened the next morning. They all thought I was dead. We all ask counselors what the fuck happened. Never get a straight answer. 32 now. Still have a scar on my shin from 
whatever scratched me. This was way in Northern California. I live in central Indiana. Gets boring around here, nothing but corn, baste beans, and old people. Even Indy gets pretty boring. One of my favorite things to do used to be late night walks. On one late summer night in 2015, I had an encounter that I can't explain properly. Be walking by the cornfields, flashlight in one hand, the other in my pocket. Never carry a firearm because not much crime happens out there. I've walked down this road plenty of times, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happened before. Suddenly, a huge flash across the sky, like someone left off a flare gun or something. Probably some rednecks with their fireworks. Stop dead in my tracks when I realize the ball of light lingers in the sky too long. Realize that I never heard a shot fire, and that this light is too bright to be a flare. Also, why would it be coming out of a cornfield at this hour? My heart rate increases. Something just isn't right. The air starts getting colder. Sounds of crickets and cicadas go silent. Check my phone. It's 2.07 a.m. Try to unlock it in case of emergency, but it shuts off without even going to the powering down screen. Nearly shit myself. Battery was at 80%. Fuck this shit, that gif. I turn around and start speed walking home. Feel this immense pressure from behind. Like I'm being followed, but don't turn around to look. Really regretting not taking my piece with me. Light in the sky starts flickering out like an old light bulb. It's dark again. Great. Turn my flashlight on again and start into a light jog. Fifteen feet ahead, the corn starts to shake. A figure steps out of the corn and raises a rifle at me. I nearly run into it, bare on my face before I halt. I scream, but feel relieved when I realize who the man is. I won't say his name for privacy, but I'll just call him Farmer John. He's an old friend of my father's, fought in Nam together. He lowers the rifle and asks me what the hell I was doing out there at four in the morning. I look at him, confused. I tell him, it's two, and I'm just out for a walk. Now, he looks concerned. Feel a warm trickle down my lips. When I touch it, I look at my fingers and freak out. My nose is fucking bleeding. Anon, are you alright? Farmer John asks, stepping closer to me. Stumble back a little, then collapse. I wake up in John's house. It's 1 p.m. Wife is there, hysterical. John tells me I passed out last night. Asks me again why I was out there. I tell him I was taking a walk like I usually do. Tell him late night walks clear my head. He asks me what I was babbling about in my sleep. Something about the long men with big eyes and icy fingers. At this point, I'm fucking terrified. I tell him I don't know what he's talking about. Explain that I saw a strange light in the sky at around 2 a.m., then turned around to head home because I wasn't feeling right. And that's when I bumped into him. John asks if I'm sure about the time. I say yes because I checked my phone before it shut off. John swears to me that he found me stumbling around the side of his plot at 4.30 a.m. I ask my wife, who's crying, to hand me my phone. It doesn't turn on. I check the battery. The damn thing melted into the back of the phone. Literally, what the fuck? Thank John for helping me and go home with my wife. She asks me what really happened. Tell her the same thing I told John. She thinks I'm crazy. Almost ruins our marriage because she thinks I got into some illegal shit. I used to bet on sports. Had my fair share of troubles in the past over that. If my own wife doesn't believe me, I'm sure no one else would. Sometimes, I get these sharp headaches that make my face tremble, but not often. I don't do late night walks anymore. Only reason I share this now is that I've almost gone mad not having a place to share this story to. Hopefully, people here will believe me. I got a story. Been meaning to post this one for a while. This is back around 2006, early summer. 
I was just your typical 17-year-old kid. Parents moved around a lot back in those days, but we always ended up living beside large forests, woods, or prairie places. Done plenty of exploring, with and without friends. Tons of stories, but there's always one which makes you look back on with no definite answer in sight, no matter which way you look at it. But this is how it went down. Played a lot of vidya and watched a lot of TV. Taps was big in these days. People respected them then, so you can see I was really taken by the whole let's go ghost hunting trend. Near my house, there's this big urban forest, kind of like New York Park, split into three parts. Forest one, two, and three. Through the years, I had a couple strange, unexplained events happen to me in them. Phantom smells like lavender and roses simply faded away as quick as they came. At night, in Forest 2, which had a concrete foundation where probably a house once stood, me and a few friends would see brief bright flashes of light just erupt over our heads, with nothing over there for miles, too close down for planes. It actually lit up the ground around us, like if it were a hovering camera flash. Of course, now that I look back on it, it might have been a hunter's camera gadget strapped to a tree or something. One's guess. Then there was Forest 3, which had a cemetery in it. Caught a ton of EVPs there, chilling ones. Most notable one. I asked, Is there a heaven? A hell? Why don't you call for God? And a young woman replied to me in a sad tone, There is no God. So... There was some freaky stuff going on there. One day, I woke up early in the morning, 4.30 a.m. between 5. I recently bought this cheap $70 digital camera from Walmart and was extremely bored with it. So I figured an early walk in the forest should provide me with some unique pictures. Which they did if you want to see them. Probably not, but they're all from this day. And we'll post some. So I set out doing the same thing I've done probably a hundred times by now. I'm Jay walking down the streets and after a couple blocks, hit the forest entrance and dive in. And I dive in deep into her. I spend the next 15 minutes just heading to some known places I know would give me some good snapshots. So I take a quickie snap here and another quickie snap there, thinking to myself, this is gold, son. All the while forgetting, the whole entire wood is empty, silent, desolate as I had ever seen it before. I usually run into one or two people by now, either jogging or walking their mutts, but nothing. It's a good day, I say to myself. Let's carry on. So I head to this area called the safe zone. It's simply called that on the account that it's wide, expansive with a little sand dune, and a tall tree smack down in the middle of it. So if you're under that tree, you can pretty much see all paths that string together forest one. I'm there, so I decide let's bam it to the lake. I pick a path from the safe zone and head for it. It is at this time, I sense an eerie feeling in the air, like I'm being watched. I ignored it because at that age, I wasn't mature enough to that point where everyone learns to either trust your gut, your feelings, or an internal ringing alarm bell, or whatever. I stayed calm and carried on. I hit the lake. I'm tired from walking like 45 minutes of miles. Sun was out but casting gray skies with a sudden in and out drizzle between instances. I perk myself against the ledge underneath the cover of some trees and with a low battery on my camera, just decide to hang out while staring blankly out at this lake that, be my recollection, wasn't swamped by heavy fog or mist not five minutes ago. First time I seen the place like this, I tell myself. Then, my eyes caught it from the distance. I'm frozen. I see a person draped in this loose sheet what looked to be a black tarp, just simply spinning, spinning and spinning around in circles in a pond bush of dogtails. His or her arms opened widely as if praising something repeatedly. I'm simply there being as quiet as I can be, not moving an inch, barely releasing a breath observing this mad person. This goes on for about 25 seconds until the spin comes to an abrupt stop. I stare wide-eyed with thoughts racing in my mind. What the fuck is this? Should I... Should I? I'm thinking to myself. You got a camera. Don't be one of those idiots who don't capture the shit they so desperately brag about years from now on. Low battery. Bar is practically invisible. Cheap-ass Walmart brand. Don't die on me. 
I reach for it and look up, and I find him looking in my direction. I tell you, I saw no face. It was white or gray, whatever, like a doll. Was it a mask? I don't know, but I was terrified that I was discovered, pinpointed out from my cover. It was far from me, but it still managed to see me in like four seconds. So, I stare slackjaw, slowly lifting up my camera. In that moment, he, or it, lifts one white arm out of its tarp and points at me, just pointing at me from a distance, as if doing some ritual jest. Then his arm drops slowly down. You know that scene from Shaun of the Dead, where Shaun pushes a zombie chick onto the steel pole and she gets up, while Ed rotates the film reel on his camera? That's what I did. I lifted my camera up, and snap. Another one. Snap. Battery officially dead. Then I got up, slowly backed away, and I ran all the way back to the safe zone, and out a dozen trails and paths, crisscrossing to my exit. That was a crazy-ass day, I must say. Picture one. And second. Be me, around 10 to 15 years old. Have German Shepherd. She sometimes tries to sleep in bed with me, but I usually wouldn't let her, because the bed always ends up covered in dirt slash sand and hair. Let dog out late at night. She's out there for a couple hours. This is normal for her. She's probably out in the woods or the cornfields or something. Eventually, decide to call her back in. Yell for a while, but she doesn't come. She's done this before too, but she's always back in the morning. She's not back in the morning. Eventually, find the dog's body in the ditch. Neck broken. Must have gotten hit by a car. Later that night, I feel something touching at the end of my bed. Look up. It's the dog. She wants to come up. Tell her no and lay head back down. Wait a minute. The dog is dead at JPEG. Look again. She's gone. Now every time I think about that night, I wish I would have let the dog get in the bed. Just one more time. Hey, X. I don't really know what the procedure is on this board, but I just had a fucking scary experience happen to me and my mates. I'm from K, by the way. If you guys don't know, there is a long-time tradition in northern Michigan called polar bearing. It is pretty much just camping out in a dugout snow cave or tent in the middle of winter. Me and my friends went up to Gaylord to hike slash camp in the forest. We all are major shitheads and brought our AR-15s, various handguns, and my one buddy's Saiga he had just brought. Our plan was to hike to the campsite and then go shooting varmints later in the day. We got to the trailhead and got our shit ready for a hike. There was no one else on the sign-up sheet for staying the night, so we were all pretty happy. We hiked in for a few miles until we found the campsite. The place was a fucking wreck. Shit and trash thrown everywhere. We were pissed at the previous hikers for leaving such a mess. Boy Scouts leave, not trace shit. After we had finished cleaning the campsite, we split into groups to go find some small game. I went with my buddy, Dakota. He had the meme gun 2000 to try and track down some small critters. This might be the time to tell you that I had a 22 on me for red squirrels. They are some tasty buggers. We start walking through the woods until my body finds some prints in the snow and mud. There are a bunch of coyote tracks, but I thought they looked a bit weird as the paw was too big and the spaces separating them were a bit off. Dakota didn't care that much about specifics and all he cared about was bagging a few coyotes. Later that evening, it was getting dark and I wanted to go back to camp. We did not have NVGs or any of that fancy shit, so the chances of getting something was minuscule. I had been getting bad vibes all day because of all the black squirrels I saw. They are major bad luck, and if you kill them, you supposedly get cursed. I digress. My buddy Dakota wants to stay out longer, and he and I bicker until we hear a familiar yipping. Coyotes. Dakota gets his stupid fucking shotgun up and shoots the slug where the yipping was coming from. I scream at him to stop because we hadn't even seen the little buggers yet, 
let alone had the time to aim at one. I turn on the spotlight I had brought, aka giant ass HID flashlight, and start surveying the forest. I see a coyote in the edge of the opposite tree line, but it's a bit odd. For one, it didn't bolt when it hears a shotgun, and it was on its hind legs. The thing was standing up, and on closer inspection, was way larger than a coyote. My friend shot at it, but it ran just as he fired. It fucking ran, like on two legs. We were super freaked out at this point, and booked it to the camp. As we ran, we heard it howling, and almost pissed ourselves. We made it back to camp, and told the rest of our friends what we saw, and that we needed to book it out of there. They laughed at us, and told us that we had too much to drink. We kept on trying to get them to leave, but all they did was laugh at us. Until my friend Kyle saw it. It was at the edge of the campfire light, just watching us. Kyle was having none of it, and shot the fucker with his Glock. Wrong move that just seemed to piss it off, and it started screeching and ran out of sight. All of us scared out of our minds by now. We don't even pack, we just grab our rifles and start heading for the trailhead. We haul ass, but whatever that thing was, it was fast. We heard it coming from behind us. I was taking up the rear and swiveled just as the thing was five feet from me. I unloaded my entire mag into the thing, and it dropped. I had already sawed myself at this point and started running as fast as I could with the rest of my friends. We heard more of the howling the rest of the way, but never saw another one of those things. We made it to the car and once I got cell signal, I called 911 and told them what happened. The operator just thought I was drunk. So, my buddies go to the nearest ranger station and tell them what had happened. They say some shit like, oh, we just ran into starving coyotes. That was no coyote. They let us stay until dawn and then take us back to our camp in a Kubota. On the way, we find my spent brass and a shit ton of blood. They say I must have hit one, no shit, and the others dragged its body away to eat. Our camp is a total loss, shit thrown everywhere. Rangers help us clean up and still insist it was coyotes. Just got back at six and have no idea what to think about this. Woke up in the middle of the night on the other side of my room, out of bed as a child. The light was off in the hallway that I always kept on, so I step out, flick it on, and go back to bed wondering what happened. Later that night, I wake up even further from my bed, in the middle of the hallway that had the light switch. The lights were off again. I stand up and hear a creepy sing-song voice. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. It was coming from downstairs, the stairs being at the opposite end of the hallway from my room. I slowly went to the stairs and peeked down into the pitch black darkness. Then it spoke again, only finishing the song. Turn on the lights so you can see me. Noped out of there and ran to my bed and waited a while. I could clear as motherfucking day hear my front door open and shut, along with what sounded like two pairs of footsteps, probably in shoes or boots. I eventually waited for the noise downstairs to quit, and sprinted down the hall again past the stairs and into my parents' room. My dad went downstairs and came back up, saying it was nothing, and they put me back into my bed. Spent the rest of the night awake and waiting for them to come back. I swear to this day, I think someone was attempting to abduct me. I'm from Bangladesh, and although the major cities have developed infrastructure, some of the more isolated villages are pretty much like the Dark Ages. There's no electricity, no powerful lights, or any of that stuff. They are surrounded by dense, thick forests, and the villagers have stories of witches and jinn that live in the trees, and sometimes come into the villagers' huts and possess them. When I still lived in Bangladesh, my mom worked as a representative for poor villages. Her job was to basically go to villages around the country, provide them with aid and food, and establish rapport with the people in charge. She would sometimes take me and my sister along with her. This happened when I was about 9 or 10, and is something that has stayed with me to this day. We went to a particularly isolated village. 
the closest town with electricity and any sort of law enforcement, was at least two hours away, by car. Right when we got there, something was off. Apparently, one of the villagers' sons was acting very strangely. They had him locked up in a barn, and people were gathering like it was a circus show. My mom forbade me to go there, but while she was busy working, I snuck over. What I saw chilled me to the bone. The kid was about my age, naked, foaming at the mouth, and covered in oozing sores. A man threw a live chicken into the barn, and the kid grabbed it by its neck and bit its head off. One of the men told me that the kid was possessed by a trail, a witch spirit with the face of a woman that can only be recognized by its backward placed feet. They are twisted 180 degrees and face the back of its body. Being a city boy, I just laughed it off. Later that day, I met a boy and a girl from the village, and we began kicking around a soccer ball I had brought. Then I went home. That night, when everyone was asleep, I woke up suddenly. I looked out the window to the barn where the boy was kept, only a few yards away. I saw the door slowly open, and something came out. It was a huge, towering figure, at least ten feet tall, its face covered by black, scraggly hair. It was wearing a stained white robe and walked with a strange limp. In the full light of the moon, as it got closer, I could see its feet. They were backwards. My heart started pounding. I wanted to run to my mom in the next room, but my body was frozen in fright. I watched as the thing got closer and closer until it was only a few feet from my window. I looked at its face, and my blood went cold. It was the face of the little girl I had been playing soccer with earlier that day. At that point, I don't know what happened. All I remember is blacking out and waking up the next day. There was a huge uproar because, apparently, the villager's possessed boy was found dead in the barn. I couldn't find the little girl anywhere. I asked around, but no one could even remember knowing a girl with the description I gave them. I tracked down the other boy I'd been playing soccer with, and he didn't know either. He said that he only remembered just the two of us playing that day. Bears are bros, but cougars seriously creep the shit out of me. A few months ago, drive a shitty U.S. Forest Service road to a remote trailhead in the northern Cascades to go snowshoeing in the mountains. Alone, of course. Nobody has been in this area in months. Perfect. This will be a great overnight outing. Foggy, cloudy, and dark. A fuck ton of snow everywhere. Too spooky for you, but just perfect for an outing. Get out of your truck, kneel down next to the driver's side door to tie your boots. Hear something fall slash jump from a tree behind you, and hear a weird sound. Kind of like the grunt that a cat or dog makes when it jumps down from something. Look back and see snow falling from a tree, and a large branch bouncing like a spring. Oh well, probably a marten or something, despite it obviously being something much larger. Put on your snowshoes and start walking up the snow-covered mountain road toward the trailhead. After about 500 feet, you realize that you forgot something in the truck. Turn around and start walking back. Notice large cougar tracks next to your footprints. It has followed you all the way from your truck. Looks like it turned 90 degrees and went back to the woods when I heard you turn around. Keep walking back to the truck. Make noise and try to look big. See that the cougar's track lead back to the road from the woods. Finally get back to the driver's side door of your truck. Remember that the keys are in the bottom of your backpack. Notice that the cougar tracks lead back toward the tree where all this started from. Realize that it's still watching you as you frantically try to find the keys. Notice that there are actually two sets of tracks. A large adult and a kitten teaching her young how to hunt. My face went. This is a true story from a friend who served in the army not too many years ago. During a training rotation, his unit was sent to Washington State for an exercise. Trained for recon, this soldier and his unit of six were sent out into a thick forest one night to scout a simulated enemy position. 
as the six men worked their way through the forest. They began to feel a sense of dread building. Soon, the hairs began to stand on the backs of their necks, and their hands trembled uncontrollably. It was at this point that they felt something stalking them through the forest. When the unit stopped to listen, they would hear the sound of something large moving through the brush, suddenly come to a halt and go still. When they moved out, they would hear the sounds of movement begin again as something large kept pace with them. The soldiers tried to shake their shadow to no avail. They had no ammunition, so they dare not set a trap for the hidden stalker. And while they increasingly reached their wit's end, they could clearly see the branches being pushed as something spied on them from as little as 20 feet away. Soon enough, the group abandoned their mission and beat an immediate retreat to their base camp, the stalker following behind closely until it faded away close to home. The six men went to their commander and told their story. What scared the men the most was the sudden fear in the officer's face. The next night, the unit was sent out again to complete their mission, but this time, each man had been issued live rounds for the weapons. And yes, this is a true story. Alright X, I'm going to tell you the story of the Shambling Man. This happened last summer, but I've put off telling the story because I was always too lazy to actually type it up. I want to hear some opinions on this thing because I still have no idea what the fuck to think. No real idea as to whether it's even dangerous. Nothing. A little background knowledge. I changed schools after my freshman year in high school, but I still spend a lot of time with my friends from my first high school. I'm in my first year of college now, and I still talk to these guys almost daily. They live about 30 minutes away from my parents' house, which is in a Minnesotan suburb about 20 minutes outside of the Twin Cities. Fairly populous. The town my friends live in is about 50 minutes away, and is a mix of suburbs and farmland. Much smaller population. Be me. June of last summer. Heading home from hanging out with friends from high school. Decided to take the back roads instead of the freeway. Back roads from friend's house to mine are pretty scenic. Most like cutting through fields and prairies with the occasional wooded section. Also passes a lot of farms. About 10 minutes down the road after passing a few farms is this dinky little sub-thousand population town, complete with a dirt road and everything. Rolling up towards an intersection there when I see something massive in the road, this big, pale humanoid figure is basically army crawling across the road in front of my car. Looks up at me. This thing looks like it has the frame of an anorexic NBA player with skin that sagged like it had recently had a major liposuction procedure that took it from 300 pounds to 120. Start braking when another car comes over the hill towards me. Has those bright ass white headlights. Very clearly has the brights on. Instinctively look up at it for a second to make sure I'm not going to hit it. And then look back down at the thing in the road. It's fucking gone. The scariest thing about the creature wasn't its appearance, but the way it moved. Its arms moved like a metal thing on the outside of steam engines that drives the wheels. Pick related. That was the first sighting. I convinced myself for a while that it was just a trick of the light with some fog or whatever. That was before the second encounter. Two months pass, now mid-August. By this point, the creature had sort of become a thing of legend among our friend group. Friends came up with the name The Shambling Man, even though it was kind of just crawling, not shambling. Regardless, I had to admit the name was kind of catchy. The name ended up sticking we sometimes refer to it as Chandler the Shambler, or just Chandler for short. Anyway, I end up going to the Mall of America for the day to hang out with friend and his girlfriend. His girlfriend lives with him and his family for reasons that it wouldn't be polite to go into. Decide midway through the trip to spend the night at aforementioned friend's house. We drive to the mall separately because it was sort of a last minute plan. Drive to my house to grab clothes and stuff. Drive to friend's house along the same back roads as before. As I pass the place where I first saw the Shambler, this horrible feeling overtakes me. Eyes actually tear up a bit, feel kind of sick to my stomach. None of this is compared to the feeling of utter dread that hit me like a fucking bat though. Nearly hyperventilate before I'm able to get a grip. Normally, I'm a pretty composed person. I don't get scared very easily, 
and at this point, I had driven on the road for like 20 times since the encounter. Basically, this wasn't some ordinary fear that you get when you do something scary. This wasn't some fucking roller coaster style stomach sickness. This was out of nowhere. This was survival instinct fear. And I was terrified. Finally, the feeling passes. Keep driving down the road, trying not to go flying into the ditch as I wipe tears out of my eyes. I'm a little confused and very surprised. I never break down like this. About five minutes away from my friend's house, look back and forth between my driver's side window and the windshield. Watch the trees and brush slowly move by to calm my nerves a bit. That's when I see it. The fucking shambling man is standing next to a tree on the side of the road. Just standing there, staring directly at me. At least I think it is. I can't really see its eyes, but its head is pointed right at me. My heart drops, and I speed up so I can get to friend's house. His sister lets me in. Friend and his girlfriend haven't gotten there yet. Bring my stuff to the basement. Call friend. Where are you? They're out hitting pokey stops at a park nearby. Sort of just shake my head as he's talking and interrupt. I saw it again. He's confused. I saw the shambling man again. Brief pause. I'll be right there. He gets back, grabs two combat knives for him and myself. Let's go fucking find this thing. Exploring the area is a whole nother story, but we didn't actually find the thing. I had my friend stand in the exact spot I saw the creature in, though. From what I could tell, the thing was several inches taller than my friend. My friend is six foot seven. While we didn't find the shambler, we did find this weird ghetto shelter lean-in and a really eerie foggy clearing that we thought was a pond at first, before we noticed a mound in the middle with a single, solitary tree on top. The most notable thing that happened was at the end, though. Befriend and myself, walking along a horse trail parallel to the road with a 10 or 15 foot buffer of brush and trees between the two. Friend's girlfriend is waiting in the car across the street in the entrance of a dog park with a set of simple instructions. Keep the doors locked and keep the car running. If you see us running, let us in and get us the fuck out. Call if you see anything. So, we make our way down this horse trail and we see the car at the end of the path. There's the car. I hope his girlfriend is doing all right. Keep walking. Suddenly. Terror. Stop walking. Friend turns around. What are you doing? That's not our car. What do you mean? His girlfriend is waiting with the car running, remember? Dude, we parked on the other side of the road. We had to cross it to get here. Oh, fuck. See a guy walk through the light from the car to the side closest to us. Can barely hear him talking to someone else. They haven't seen us yet. Whisper to friend. I'm going to count to four. When I get to four, book it to the middle of the brush where we came in and dug down. One. The men get closer. Two. I can hear their voices still, but they've begun to talk more quietly. Three. Pause. Heart is fucking hammering. Four. We sprint into the brush and drop. We breathe quietly for what feels like 20 minutes, but was probably more like 20 seconds. Finally, I lift my head a bit to look around. I point towards the road. Friend nods. We sprint across the street to his car like a fucking bear is hot on our heels. Peel out of the dog park. Other car pulls onto the road and starts following us. We get to a stoplight, and I turn around. Car is gone. What the fuck? Make it back safely. I was hunting with my grandfather for my 19th birthday about a year ago, and we both watched a deer slam its head into a rock until its antlers and skull were shattered. Once its brains were everywhere, it tried to lick them up and looked like it couldn't even use its jaw or tongue right. So it just stood upright like a fucking human and just walked into the river and died. We left immediately and my granddad was fucking terrified. 
I haven't been near the woods since, and he moved to Florida with my grandmother for, quote-unquote, safety reasons. Southwest Florida. Live in tourist beach town. Decide to one day go east out of where I live and into the wetlands. Girlfriend at that time comes with me. Take my dad's jeep and pack a tent, sleeping bag, fishing rods, food and supplies since I was thinking of camping out that night. Drive to Fekahatchee, which is like 40 minutes from home, but it's pretty secluded and huge. Everything is fine. Pass a ranger cabin and many trails that lead out into the swamps and fields. Get a couple miles in where we find a clearing with two trails coming out of it. Decide to park and unpack there. Notice three dried up raccoon corpses in the entrance of one of the trails. Skin is still on them, except for the head, where it's completely bone white. Decide to kick them off into the water so my girlfriend doesn't freak. Moment I kick them and they land in the water, I hear a yelping sound coming from deep within the trail. Look back at girlfriend, and she didn't seem to notice. It was pretty fucking loud though. Decide to go check it out since I'm not camping close to some crazy animal. Get my revolver and machete. Girlfriend decides to tag along since she doesn't want to be left alone. She keeps asking why I decided to go into the trail for about like two miles of walking. Get to what seems like a dead end, but I can smell smoke and see metal shining in the sun behind the plants. Cut him down and pass through. Get to another clearing. Circular with metal pieces of what looks like a car, outlining the edge of the clearing. Big metal stake in the middle of the clearing. Girlfriend starts to freak out. Tell her to get behind me. Suddenly, hear the same yelping noise, but super fucking loud this time. What looks like a human covered in trash bags on all fours slides out from directly in front of us, heading towards the middle of the clearing. Start running back to the jeep. Have about two miles of trail to go through. Can hear a fuckload of rustling behind us as we run through the trail. Look back for a second and see two of the same trash monsters, or whatever the fuck, booking it towards us on all fours. Yell at my girlfriend to run as fast as she can. Take that moment to turn quickly and fire a shot blindly behind me. My vision turns dark, like I suddenly put on sunglasses. Still looking behind me and I can barely turn my head. The trash bag demons aren't on the trail. Still can't move. Another like five seconds pass and my vision returns to normal. So I turn and start running after my girlfriend. No more rustling. Just the sound of us running and breathing hard. Finally get to the jeep. Quickly pack all the shit back on and have my revolver at the ready. Girlfriend screams and points to the front of the jeep. There's a fucking severed dog head stuck on the front. What the fuck? Kick it the fuck off and jump in the truck. Peel the fuck out of there. Girlfriend is freaking out. Finally get to the main road to go back home. Try to calm my girlfriend down. Give her some water. Between sips, she keeps repeating the same shit over and over again. Get closer, since I can barely hear her. They had the faces of my parents. At that point, I'm about to shit myself. Her parents have been dead for like five years. Go back home and lock myself in for like two days, since I'm still feeling uneasy especially at night. Nothing else happened after that. Me and her never talked about it after that day, and we broke up two years later due to other shit. Fuck going back there, though. Seriously. At my friend's house having dinner. They don't smoke. Have to go outside to smoke. Enjoying the cool summer air. Feel a creeping tingle on my neck. Look at large bush, covered fence nothing. Something in my mind tells me, look, for God's sake, look at it. I suddenly see a pale face in the bush. I'm a bit creeped out, but I just think it's just my mind playing tricks on me. It's like a plastic bag, and I'm just having a teleological response, etc. Walk slowly over to the bush to prove to myself that it was nothing. I walked maybe 30 feet and it was still 40 away from me. 
when suddenly, my bravado evaporated in an instant. I saw a fully developed human-like face, very long with wide dark oval eyes, a thin mouth, and porcelain colored skin. There was just something wrong about it. The face was at least three feet from brow to chin. It was leaning out of a bush. I could certainly see a narrow neck connecting to the head. Those eyes. The face looked dead, but those eyes looked into my soul. I don't even know what I did next. I think I just bolted back to the house. Walked my buddy's Alsatians the next morning, because, well, I wasn't going out alone. I found nothing. Not even footprints. I just suppressed what I saw, but that encounter has shattered my illusions. If it was a prank, it was a Hollywood-grade puppet. And I don't drink, and I have no mental problems. That night is like a thorn in my mind. This happened last year, after my birthday. I turned 27 on November last year. Family decides to take... I had no say, it was a forced decision. Me to the beach two days after my birthday. All my family loves the sea. I'm the only one that doesn't. My mother, two sisters, and three brothers came. They have a shitty motorboat docked on the shore that my brother rented. I get basically dragged onto it. Mother stays on the sand with my youngest brother and sister. My brother then starts it up and drives off into nowhere. I get seasick very easily, so I'm feeling horrible on that boat. And there's nothing I can do about it because no one gives a shit. Fall into a nauseous sleep. Wake up. Underwater. First thought is that my siblings threw me off to mess with me. Swim up the surface. I was really deep underwater somehow. Can't see or hear the boat anywhere. Dread begins to fill me when I realize I'm in the middle of the ocean with no idea of where the shore is. Panic for a bit. Extremely scared of the ocean for reasons many would understand. After a while, I accept my fate and wait for death to reach me. Float face up. Can't remember how long I was floating along. I just know it was a long while. Get the nauseous feeling of seasickness. Don't remember when I was placed back on the boat. It's late at night when I realize what's going on. I'm laying on my back. My sister is crying. One of my brothers is checking vitals or something. I don't fucking know. And my brother is driving the boat with a stern look. Turns out, they had forgotten all about me for nine fucking hours. Panicked when they realized I was gone and found me face up on the water with a lifeless look in my eyes. It still scares me to think what would have happened if I hadn't been found. My birthday is coming up soon. My face when there has been talk about quote-unquote making it up to me by doing the same thing. Make it up to you by finishing the job. Posted this a few weeks ago in a green text thread. Have a colleague. Become pretty good friends recently. Feel connected to her in a way I don't with others. Said something to her. I can't remember what it was. She was a bit spooked because I said exactly what she was thinking or planning to do. I laughed it off and she seemed a mix of intrigued and weirded out. Anyway, yesterday, she's out on an office errand. Get a thought that says that she needs something on her PC and wants me to send it to her. Two minutes later, my phone rings and I know exactly who it is and what she'll say. This has happened twice again since I made the post. Anon says she's my soulmate. Be me. Be around five or six. On the back seats of my dad's car with my uncle. We were going out the restaurant for dinner. About 7 p.m., already dark. I was watching outside the window. Suddenly, the high beams light up something on the edge of the road. Stuck on the grass, there was a very bright red face. Almost triangular. With stylized facial features, pitch black eyes, 
and a white mouth. See Pig, not a good artist. I immediately looked away and asked Dad if he saw that. Yes. I asked what was that. My father and my uncle answer almost in unison. It's the red face. They were very serious. I ended up being silent the whole trip because I was shitting myself. Not really creepy, but weird. Here's a little backstory. When I was in university, I was roommates with this guy that had Asperger's. He was a really nice guy, but socially inept and very solitary. I'm an Aussie, and he was a Chinese exchange student. Always kept to himself and was very clean in particular, which is great because I'm more of a quiet introvert myself. He was 22 and just finishing up a bachelor's of anatomy and cell biology. Roommate goes to class, and I have the day off. Notice he didn't lock the door to his room. Never been in there before. I know it's a breach of privacy and totally not cool, but curiosity gets the best of me. Know he has two terrariums with hermit crabs and a lizard. I've only seen them when he cleans them. Walk in. All kinds of weird shit all over the room. Take a peek at the terrariums. There's a third. Small heated glass container holding something that looks like a big white barnacle with a single black eye and tiny appendages. Binders of notes on his desk. Quickly peek over them. Tons of pictures of other barnacle-looking creatures. Some in tanks and some cut open. Last one in binder is Howard. Picture of the one in the tank. Lists of ingredients and receipts for medical research supplies store inside. About ten different ingredients was apparently put into it. What caught my interest was the dollar amounts. Six hundred dollars or something from mesenchymal stem cells is the only one I remember. Apparently, he put a concoction inside of a live unfertilized platypus egg along with his own sperm and grew this thing. Take a picture of it. It moves when the flash goes off. Don't mention it for weeks, and soon my roommate has graduated and is moving on to a research job back in China. Mention Howard to him. He gets angry about me entering his room without permission. Says he had types of coral he was growing for the terrariums. Makes me delete the picture, or he'll be keeping the last two months of rent. Apologize. Never hear from him again. Anyway, it was on my mind for a while, and I did some research, and it became clear he was making a really sophisticated homunculus. I was able to find different pictures and even videos of ones on the internet, but none as complex looking as the one I saw that day. Honestly, it was so big and sprawled out looking. I thought it was some kind of petri dish mold that he created, but I thought the eye was really odd. I summed up the movement to my eyes playing a trick on me, or me dumping something. I wish I knew more about it. I wonder if he still grung them, and if Howard is still alive. Visit grandfather in hospital. Night by the time we leave. Sitting in car with family. I notice an illuminated doorway in an old building, with a man in a suit making all kinds of gestures, using his hands as if he's using a steering wheel. Falling over. Strange hand signals. Shaven head. Wearing an old kind of suit. Eyes blacked out by shadow. Stare fixedly at it. Back of my mind tells me it's rude to stare, but I stare anyway. Brother asks what I'm looking at. I nod towards the door. Talk about the strange man. But, Anon, nobody's there. I am 100% I saw someone in that doorway behaving strangely. And nothing like that has happened since. Be me, 20-something wage slave, and a bus going home after a long day of work. Some random guy standing next to me, ordinary looking skinny dude. He strikes up a conversation, typical small talk bullshit. I'm not particularly interested in chit chat, so I just nod and give the occasional short answer. He suddenly starts dropping little snippets of information about my personal life into his sentences. 
Some of it is stuff I've never told anyone about, not even my closest family members. I'm sweating like crazy, thinking the dude is probably some deranged stalker who, like, wants to gut me and wear my skin as a diving suit or some such horror movie bullshit. Pretend I'm not at all creeped out and continue to go along with the conversation. Bus reaches my stop. I tell mystery guy that it was nice talking to him and quickly get off the bus. Run home, lock the door as tight as possible, close the blinds, grab my gun from the safe and keep it at arm's length for the entire evening. Nothing happens, but I do feel uneasy for a few days. Several years later, I still have no clue who the guy was and how the fuck he knew all of those things. This short story is from my mother who heard it from her friend. And it's not scary, like who was phone, perhaps unnerving, but it is more heartwarming-ish. Be mom's friend, be in mid-twenties. Go attend a posthumous wedding when visiting Korea. Sure, why not that JPEG? Wedding held in a monk's temple. Monk has done all of the decorations and prepares the wedding. Uses two dolls. One is that of a woman. The other is that of a man. They are placed facing towards the altar in the middle of the temple next to each other, like bride and groom. Monk explains that the spirits of two virgin ghosts, which, yes, that is a thing in Korea, and they are apparently quite aggressive, will possess the dolls as their connection to the land of the living. Mom's friend is amused, but is respectful. The wedding is complete, and the monk ushers everyone and himself out of the temple to leave the newlyweds alone. Leave the two dolls overnight. The monk returns the next day. Discover the dolls have been moved. The dolls were found facing each other. It is romantic, yet eerie. Anyone else have slightly strange experiences as a young child, and only when you got older you look back on them and realized they were impossible. Three to four years old. We're poor and live in a shitty apartment. My parents slept on a mattress on the floor. One day, playing and jumping on the mattress. Jump off the mattress and onto the floor, but somehow, managed to end up flipped completely upside down out of nowhere. Balanced perfectly on the center of my head, with nothing close to lean on, and not using my hands to support either. Defying laws of physics, but too young to realize. As a kid, just think, Haha, I have a flat head, and I'm balanced on it. Think back on it later on in my life, and realize it's completely fucking impossible. Parents don't remember it at all. Four to five years old. Wake up in the middle of the night. Mom is not home. Walk in the living room. Dad is standing there, in the middle of the room, fully naked. Standing in a T-pose, like a 3D computer model. He's completely motionless, like a statue, not even blinking. Too young to care all that much or question it. Go back to bed. Decades later, I think about it again and realize how fucking weird it was. Dad passed away, so now I can't even ask him. I got one. Be me, total fucking redneck. Driving around a logging road to find some place to camp. Pull up by a little creek. Follow said creek. Pitch tent in nice little clear area. Disclaimer. This is not a clearing. It still has a tree canopy. The trees are just farther apart. Got my redneck buddy with me. Hell yeah. Drinking beers, roasting weenies. I'm about one beer away from being drunk. When it happens, see some fucker spider walking exorcist style between trees. Both of us book it and leave the tent. Thing gives chase for about 700 meters. We are also lucky that we didn't start a fire. Be me, 10 years ago. Still in med school. Have kinky girlfriend. Keep having more intense odd sex. Reaches pinnacle of the bazaar. Says she wants to be fucked to death. Or fuck a corpse. Idea forms. I quote-unquote borrow a defibrillator, adrenaline, and other resuscitative tools from work. 
Get home. Hardcore sex for around an hour until about the climax. Pull out. Ties her down. Use defibrillator. Her heart stops. Convulsions. Unresponsive. Quickly finish fucking her dead body within three minutes. Begin reviving process immediately after to avoid brain death. Gasps awake. Panics. Cries. Calms down. Says she loved it. Do this every other month till she committed suicide a year later due to unrelated mental health problems. Finally, the feeling passes. Finally. <clears throat> Finally, the feeling passes. Finally, the feeling passes. Why do I say finally like that? Finally, finally, finally the feeling passes. 